Dr. Wernher von Braun Project Mars, a technical telefiery chariot, born on buoyant pinions, sweeps near me now. I soon shall ready be to pierce the ether's high, unknown dominions, to reach new spheres of pure activity. This godlike rapture, this supreme existence, do I, but now worm, deserve to track? Yes, resolute to reach some brighter distance, on earth's fair sun I turn my back. Yes, let me dare those gates to fling asunder, which every man would fain go slinking by. T is time, through deeds this word of truth to thunder that with the height of God's man's dignity may vie, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, Faust. Publisher's introduction Mankind's love affair with the planet Mars is certainly not new. It has long been recognized that Mars is the planet in our solar system most capable of supporting life. Until the 1970s, the existence of life on Mars remained an open question. We know today that there are no civilizations on Mars, but in 1949, when this story was written, the possibility had not yet been ruled out. In this story by Wernher von Braun, Mars has an underground civilization which is more or less on par with our own. And it is a peaceful civilization, neither bent on conquest nor paranoid about being attacked. In this story of man's first human mission to Mars, ten spaceships make the journey. Upwards of 1,000 flights into Earth's orbit are required to build, supply, and fuel these ten ships, and it is an international, cooperative project. In short, the undertaking is on a scale that would never happen in the real world. We tend to stick our toes in the water first, before diving in. Dot, but neither of these issues takes anything away from the story. In fact, they add to its larger than life adventure quality. All other aspects of the story are very realistic. The characters think and feel like real people, the science and rocket technology are accurate and are consistent with what is being used today the mission timeline exactly matches reality, and so on. The mission plan does not include staying to colonize or setting up a Martian base, which, again, is realistic for a first mission, Von Braun went to great lengths preparing the plot for this story. The calculations and technical drawings that he developed for a Mars mission, and on which he then based this story, are included in the 65-page appendix of this book. The writing style of Project Mars is typical of an adventure story written in the 1940s. The translation from German to English and the publisher's editing have both retained the original styling, faithfully reproducing what von Braun created. What we have here is a genuine adventure story, created without the aid of special effects or sophisticated electronics. In contrast with much of what is written today, this story is highlighted by love and adventure, instead of sex and violence. This is quite simply a story of ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Where Project Mars differs from most fiction of the mid 20th century is in its multiple main characters. Typical science fiction of that era involved one main character, perhaps with a sidekick, who beats the odds, saves the world and gets the girl, pretty much all by himself. In von Braun's story there are many characters who make essential contributions, and the story will center for a time on each of them. This may be a throwback to von Braun's stated fascination with the works of Kurt Laswitz, the father of German science fiction, whose book on two planets featured a host of characters, all contributing to the plot but with individual roles. This is also consistent with how the real world works, many people working together to accomplish what must be done, each affecting and being affected by the others. It's no accident that contemporary fiction predominantly relies on this multiple protagonist style. You will find no ravaging monsters, terrorists or killing machines in this story, there is danger without a dark side, and challenge without threat, just like the real world. However, it does differ from a real space mission in that there are no interfering politicians, lobby groups, trade unions, etc., repeatedly redefining the mission's goals, driving the cost up and the schedule out. As much as Project Mars is entertainment, it can also be seen as a proposal, for international cooperation in a human mission to Mars.
Von Braun clearly believed this was possible. This story takes place in the 1980s, and went to great lengths to prove as much, both in his professional life and in his writing. When this story was written, in 1949, a manned mission to Mars was considered fantasy by the man in the street, but today very few people would deny it was possible. The reasons that we haven't done it are economic, not technical. There are minor social matters in the story that might be different from what would happen if this mission were flown today, such as the all male crew, but they don't detract in any way from either the story or the idea of a manned mission to Mars. There are no miracle technologies or leaps of faith required to make this story believable, just a willingness to be entertained. In this never before printed science fiction novel, Wernher von Braun combines technical fact with a human storyline in the way that only a true dreamer can realize. Authors preface There are few dreams of the future which have woven so fascinating a web around human fantasy as flight through space. Since the first, Epoch making experiments of the great American pioneer of rocketry, Robert Goddard, since the days when Hermann Oberth, the German, and the Russian Konstantin Eduardovich Ziolkowski published their startling writings on rocket propulsion, a veritable spate of literature has overwhelmed the public. This has covered the entire field ranging from serious, scientific dissertations to comic strips. This literature is so voluminous as to render it difficult for even an engineer to sift the actual interplanetary premises of rocketry from idle conjecture, for in many minds there is a strong tendency to identify rocketry with space travel. In the meantime, rocketry has become a recognized part of the science of armament and this tends to darken the glass through which one peers into its future. Much development has taken place since the first crude experiments of the pathfinding pioneers, and much of this has been hidden from the public view for reasons of military security. The object of this book is to assist the eye of the public to penetrate the thicket of confusion in which the future of rocket power now lies hidden. The following pages present a sketch of interplanetary travel as visualized by one who for more than two decades has tumbled along the thorny path leading to the development of large rockets. The author has had his full share of bitter disappointments, nor does he underestimate the height and ruggedness of the barriers to be conquered before the first manned rocket shall be projected into illimitable space. Despite our justified preoccupation with the problems of today, we must not neglect those of the morrow. It is the vision of tomorrow which breeds the power of action. Thousands of scientists and engineers are laboring constantly to perfect our knowledge of rocketry and rocket propulsion, and millions of dollars are spent yearly to advance such research. What the results will be is beyond the public ken, but they will surely exert a vital influence upon the future of the entire Earth and well beyond its present confines. Tens of thousands of young lads live there in a lives in dreams of a rocket powered world. They envisage themselves circumnavigating the Earth in spaceships, landing on the Moon, and conversing on terms of familiarity with the inhabitants of Mars. The ease with which their comic strip heroes perform such feats leaves them no doubt that the actual reality lies not far away. The author strongly feels that not only these boys but the public in general is entitled to know just how far and in what direction the science of rocketry now points and what the practical possibilities may be. I have used an unpretentious tale as a frame in which to paint the picture. The idea has been there with to beguile the tedium which might be caused by the relative dryness of disquisitions concerning each problem in detail. The sum of these problems represents the barrier which as yet stands between us and our voyages into space. Nonetheless, all the mathematical data in the text are, without exception, the results of careful computations or tested scientific observations. This likewise applies to the assumptions as to the physical nature of the planet Mars, except for its canals and inhabitants. The subject of the latter is as controversial today as it was thirty years ago. Errors may possibly have crept into my preparatory work for this book, it is my dearest hope that they may be but few. To him or her who may discover them will go my heartiest thanks for every improvement will but serve to delineate more clearly our projected outline of future space travel. Truthfully, to project such an outline is the task of this book. 
my scientifically inclined readers will find in the appendix a certain amount of source material as well as the basic computations. Putting the project in simple, narrative form permits me to outline the scientific, financial, and organizational efforts which will be necessary before space travel can actually be brought into being. Few rocket enthusiasts have any idea of the inevitable scope of these efforts, nor are they mentioned in either scientific dissertations or in fiction. The spaceship will, I am confident, never emerge full fledged from the mind of any solitary inventor who has constructed it with the help of a faithful assistant in his backyard. Only by the joint effort of thousands of engineers and scientists in a wide variety of fields can it become a reality. The list of these fields is almost all inclusive, extending as it does from astronomy through medicine, safety, radio, mathematics, chemistry, physics, aviation, metallurgy, production engineering, and a host of others. To back up the technical development, there will be required far sighted industrialists, open minded military men, and daring financiers. Part of the object of this book is to stimulate interest in space travel throughout these and even wider circles. For many readers will discover that their professions or trades have hitherto unsuspected applications to it. Not a few such readers will find themselves filling in details at which I have here not more that hinted. Space travel's prime objective in the minds of its serious protagonists is to benefit mankind by extending his sphere of activity. It is with some regret that such protagonists find that wherever large rockets are tested today, it is done with military objectives. But rocketry, like aviation and atomic energy, has enormous military significance aside from its more noble and constructive task. The stage setting for my narrative, therefore, is an Earth united after a final global conflict, in which are portrayed some of the terrifying aspects of future military rocketry. These aspects are inevitable concomitants of the finer phase, and I hope that they will not give offense. The military potentialities of the rocket are open to any technically minded nation prepared to shoulder the burden of development. There's no mystery about it, it involves mainly a scaling up of existing designs. As far back as 1912 it was possible to accurately compute the requirements as to size, fuel and horsepower for transatlantic aircraft. It was many years. However, before the development work to put them into service could be completed. It is therefore my desire that the reader should not remain ignorant of the tremendous impact on military science of the field of rocketry. My most earnest help is that the world may be spared another conflict, but if such a conflict should be inevitable, as appears at times, I want the homeland of my free choice, America, to hold the weapon of rocketry against her adversaries whoever they may be. Zero, with the utmost care I have avoided delving into the realms of fantasy in describing physical conditions or phenomena encountered on the trip to Mars, nor have any assumptions based solely upon vague theories been used. No miracle chest from which the presiding genius produces at will death rays or cosmic energy will be found aboard my spaceships. This is in contrast to so many science fiction stories which rely for their plausibility upon mysterious knowledge springing from the brains of some intellectual superman. My ships are propelled by compounds well known to the chemical fraternity. They are constructed of familiar materials. Even their equipment is built up around presently familiar methods and procedures. In other words, they are but a projection, an extrapolation a natural development of a still youthful but solidly established technology. For like reasons, my spaceships are not atomic powered on their trip to Mars. In the face of the considerable quantities of propellants required for space travel when using chemical fuels, it has become a custom for many quasi scientific writers to promise future atomic fuels which can do the trick better. The nature of these mysterious fuels is tacitly bypassed or conveniently cloaked by vague hints at military security. The controlling of nuclear energies is but a recent achievement in physics and technology. It may still conceal a number of future surprises and I have no desire nor intention of decrying the eventual application of this source of power to navigation of interstellar space. When referring to technological advances, the word impossible must be used, if at all, with utmost caution. 
But I should like to state here that, within the framework of our present knowledge, atomic rocket fuels belong in the realm of wishful thinking.0, the second part of our story lands us on the reddish surface of our neighbor Mars, thus completing the technical mission. From this point on, the solid, scientific platform upon which we have stood sinks beneath our feet and we tread upon the fairy bridge of fantasy, via which, and via which alone, the author has visited Mars. In his reluctant attempt to portray the conditions which faced the crews of the spaceships, he was reminded that the fine Italian hand of Dante apparently did not tremble when penning a most detailed description of the inferno and yet Dante probably had not nearly as much infernal scientific data upon which to base his descriptions as the author has Martian data. Dot encouraged by this classical precedent, the author swallowed his scruples and passed the point of no return. And so he has portrayed the Martians as age-weary from super-civilization, thus affording him the opportunity to speculate contemplatively about the future of our own youthful, technology-ridden culture. For certain of our readers who may have gagged on the mass of technical detail upon which they fed during the long voyage through space, this part of the story may offer opportunities for ruminative philosophical reflection, Wernhav on Braun, Fort Bliss, Texas, 1950A.D. 1980 Never before had men felt real confidence that peace was permanent. The fear that a diplomatic cold war might metamorphose into a hot fight, with death and destruction to soldiers and civilians alike, was gone. The final catastrophic conflict was over. The Great Eastern Bloc, after five of the most frightful years in the history of the world, had finally succumbed to the last despairing blows of the almost exhausted Western powers. The Great Asiatic Mass had become a group of smaller states slowly digging out from under the ruins of the war. But they, too, were represented in the Congress of the World, which was in session in the great domed building overlooking Long Island Sound from the hills above Greenwich, Connecticut. They too voted I or nay on the laws which were to assure the welfare and safety of all the peoples of Earth. At last the ancient prejudices and selfish insistences upon national sovereignty were no more. A brief ten years had seen the flames of war engulf anew the hopes for peace of uncounted millions, but now no votes could frustrate the decisions of the freely selected representatives of all the people of the earth. The president and his cabinet faithfully carried out whatever was enacted into law by the Congress of the United States of Earth. And each man knew in his heart that the government of the United States of Earth no longer lacked the military power to enforce those laws. Fatal indeed had this lack been to the United Nations. The parachute police of the United States of Earth could handle any minor trouble which might boil up in any latitude or longitude. Almost within minutes from the outbreak, parachute police would be on the spot to awe into civilized obedience the unruly burghers of the most remote village or hamlet. Trained to a tick and composed of elements drawn from every land and clime, they had at one time been the best soldiers in the world. In the event of more serious and organized trouble, the United States of Earth could reduce to rubble any community which refused to obey the verdict of the Congress. Enormous submarine cruisers could fire long range rockets thousands of miles inland if the appearance overhead of hundreds of destruction laden bombers should have failed in its effect. And above it all, invisible yet omnipresent Lunetta. The man-made moon, circled silently far above the stratosphere. Lunetta's acid test had taken place in the final world war. During the dread winter of 1974-75, the motorized forces of the Western Allies had ground to a solid stop in the vastness of the Asian steppes. The chilling cold had numbed the blood and the courage of the most intrepid soldiers. Air attacks on the industrial centers of Siberia had almost eased by reason of the incredible accuracy and effectiveness of the adverse anti-aircraft rockets. But these rockets could not reach Lunetta in her dizzying heights, and the courageous crew of 440 men and women who manned her directed their atom bombs by remote control at the enemy's manufacturing plants to such good effect that the scales of victory could only incline towards the Allies. And so Lunetta had become the goddess of a new, strong peace, 
which was to deliver mankind from the morass of the foregoing century. But she was also the symbol of the final victory of man over space. She it was who was to point out the paths of the universe to the peoples of the earth. History recorded the dawn of 1980. Listen, Holt, said Spencer pulling the picture away from him, we've had our best men working on this and on a lot of other recent pictures which that new reflector on Lunetta gave us. And they're getting more and more convinced that the old hypothesis, that there's life on Mars, is true. And not only life, but intelligent life. Of course we haven't the faintest idea of what the Martians look like. Probably they're not human like you and me, but from what they've achieved, it seems they're not inferior to us in either intelligence or energy. Just look, he continued, here's a bluish-green area so symmetrical in shape that we've got to take it as a cultivated patch of vegetation, planted in the middle of a desert otherwise as dry as a bone. Look at this dark green strip rimming the polar snow cap. That's a ring of vegetation, and it always appears just below the polar regions in springtime, when the snow begins to melt. And see these bluish green streaks, running in straight lines from the areas where the snow is melting, down to the temperate zones near the equator. Those are the Martian canals we've all heard so much about, aren't they? Right you are. But now it seems that they're not canals as we think of canals. Our astronomers have figured out that the Martian canals must be an irrigation system to drive the melted snow at the poles into the desert areas. So what you're looking at isn't open water, it's the vegetation growing along the banks of the waterways. But right at this point there seems to be some snow, remarked Holt peering at the photo. Sure enough. But you'll note that the canal leading through it suddenly disappears, and then emerges again on the other side. At that point the snow remains unmelted, and its color remains the exact same shade, as does the yellowish red desert surrounding it. Here, at this other point, the canals radiate from a circular disk, like the rays of a star. Oh, you'll find those all over the place. Look at M. Here, and here, and here. Doesn't take much imagination to figure that they could be centers of civilization, as easy as not. Spencer's voice was solemn. Look, Holt, he said, we've got other intelligent people out there in space, and not so very far away. Not too far, at any rate. The astronomical bunch showed these photos to the president in Greenwich the other day. And, of course, somebody got to talking about going for a look-see. So the president ordered a study made to find out whether the space forces could do the thing from a technical standpoint. So they've come to us to do the figuring of the preliminaries. If that figuring comes out positive, we'll get the job of building the ships and the equipment. What I want you for is the job of military advisor on our planning staff. But, but me no buts, Holt. Confidentially, you're the choice of the space forces for leader of the expedition if it comes off. Holt rose and stared silently out the window at the vast plant. His confusion at the thought was apparent. Spencer walked up behind him and laid a hand gently on his shoulder. As a retired officer, Holt, you're, of course, under no obligation to take the job. But I know you'll do it, after working with you all these years. There was assurance and yet pleading in Spencer's voice as he continued. You've had a long time in the air and outside of it. Among all our people there are only a few who, like you, are equipped technically to take charge of such a job, and who at the same time have the necessary qualities of leadership. Above all, you possess balance without sacrificing a certain amount of zip. We're going to need both of those qualities in a large way. Holt scratched his head reflectively. How about a couple of days to think it over? He answered. What you've cooked up is no half-hour hop to San Francisco, you know. He stood silently, his eyes still riveted on the vast buildings outside the window. Finally he turned to Spencer with a wry smile. You know perfectly well that a job like that intrigues me no end. But I'd rather not make up my mind until my wife and I have talked it over. I retired from active service two years ago because we didn't see each other practically at all, for the five years the war lasted, 
nor for two years after that. She might think it rather unfair of me to go off on a wild Mars chase. Spencer answered, your wife knew when she married you that you were also married to the sky, as men were married to the sea in bygone years. She knows that she'll have to put up with privations and long absences as long as you're any real good to her or to the world. Well, said Holt, I want to get General Braden's angle on the military and organization side of this thing before I jump, too. This is Tuesday, I'll let you know before Saturday noon. Right, I'll expect to hear from you Saturday. They walked together to the door and there was a meaning in their hand clasp as they parted. Zero, with his car headed back towards Laguna Beach and Emerald Bay, Holt drove as in a dream. Passing the tall oil derricks of Huntington Beach, he pulled over to the side of the road where it runs close to the Pacific's sandy shore. Putting the ignition key in his pocket, he wandered off into the sand dunes and towards the ocean. For the moment, he needed solitude. Thoughtfully, he picked up a couple of seashells and gazed at them for a space. With his eyes seaward, he let them fall from his listless fingers. So it was Mars, at last. He'd been in rocketry and space travel long enough to know that there'd be at least a year of concentrated planning and calculating. Then rocket ships would have to be designed built, tested and improved. That, of course, was Spencer's specialty, he'd do it all right. But this was no fortnight's trip, like the lunar expedition, this was big, really big. He'd gone along on the lunar trip as a young, unattached captain. And he'd had a magnificent commanding officer, a splendid fellow named Fitzgerald, this voyage to Mars was something entirely different, and his astronomical knowledge, like that of all good spacemen, was sharp enough to tell him that the trip would require a time about halfway between six months as we reckon them and six months as the Martians reckoned them. Quickly he did the sum in his head. One half of an Earth year is about 183 days. Add one half of a Mars year, 343 days and you get 526 days. Half of that is 263. Why, a one-way trip would be 263 days. They'd spend 526 days in outer space, just traveling. A lot more than a year. But then, too, they'd have to wait on Mars for the home planet to get into the right position before they could start back. That would call for yet another year at least. What a year that would be. It was the real objective of the whole expedition. During that time they would be finding out the nature of the inhabitants, and the circumstances and conditions in which they lived. There could be no doubt about it, he would spend not less than three years in outer space or upon a strange planet before he'd set foot upon Earth once more. It was his job to figure out, as well as he could, what conditions on Mars would be and make all possible preparations to meet them. And the same for their return to Earth. Upon his success in so doing would depend the success or failure of the whole expedition. Of course Spencer's reference to the probability of intelligent life on Mars hadn't been particularly startling. General ideas along that line had been rather common for decades. As a matter of fact, they dated from the time when Mars first focused in the objectives of improved telescopes. Such assumptions were but more strongly supported by the new photographs taken from the observatory on Lunetta. Holt sank down on a convenient sand dune. As his eyes sought the horizon above the gentle Pacific rollers of the balmy spring evening, exciting thoughts churned within his brain. The adventurer in him reawakened. This was no tame trip to a domesticated little satellite like the moon. Once those trips were started, it was almost like driving to Death Valley, you can get an accurate map at any filling station. The astronomers had laid out every cranny and crater. He'd known all exactly what to expect in the matter of atmosphere, temperature and such like. All the plans could be made with exact knowledge of what would be met. Since there wasn't any atmosphere, suitable pressure suits, with built-in breathing equipment, were provided. The footing would be hot during the 14 days of isolation which constitute a lunar day, and cold during the ensuing lunar night. 
so they worked up suitable heat retainers and temperature controls. It had been a matter of physics, technology, design, fabrication and testing in chambers where lunar conditions were reproduced. It had been a grand technical experiment. The dangers had lain in technical shortcomings or hiatuses in planning, hold new, for some minor slips of that nature had made him suffer physical agonies. But this Mars business. What did we really know about the actual physical conditions there? His first step would be to pick the brains of the astronomers and get out every last bit of information to be found in them. The initial move would be a trip to Lunetta. That he would work out a detailed program of mensuration with the astronomers stationed there. This would provide many of the data required for organizing the expedition. Among others, they would need temperatures, density of the Martian atmosphere, its constituents, and so on. What is the nature of the surface of Mars? Do wines exist there? What will be the best procedure for landing? And what spot will be the most suitable? There were other questions, in what form does life exist? The creatures must have intelligence and be thoroughly organized if they can set up such elaborate irrigation systems. And there must be a general Martian government, indicated by the way that the irrigation system covers the entire planet in such astounding symmetry, from one pole to the other. Holt wondered whether the inhabitants would be belligerent. After all, Mars was rather an elderly planet, he thought and perhaps they've gotten over their period of wars in the thousands of centuries by which their planet is older than ours. Maybe they're even unfamiliar with armaments, because they've no more use for them. But maybe their superior rage and experience has put them in possession of atomic energy and perhaps something even more advanced, with which we're still unfamiliar? Will they receive an expedition from the Earth with kindness or not? Holt's mind world trying to imagine the variety of eventualities which might greet him on Mars. Not in the wildest flights of imagination could he convince himself that he had covered even a part of them. It seemed reasonable to prepare for the worst. It might be foolhardy to explore the distant, unknown planet with a couple of companions waving only olive branches. There'd have to be a sort of commander detachment equipped with the latest in weapons. In that way, there'd be at least a chance of covering a retreat. But it would be far more important to effect an amicable approach, and to be able to get into communication with the inhabitants, assuming that the latter were also so inclined. Holt's mind went back to his school days. He wondered how Hernando Cortez felt when he and his little band of followers found themselves on the coast of Mexico and face to face with the vast empire of the Aztecs. Cortez had tackled a huge section of humanity which spoke an unknown tongue, adored strange gods, and had curious and cruel customs springing from an ancient culture. Could this be more foolhardy than Cortez's invasion? Well, time would tell. Holt ceased musing and he leapt to his feet. In his soul, he knew that he was already dedicated to Mars. He would be the Columbus of space, the Admiral of the universe the Cortez of Mars. Hastily he regained his car and headed for Emerald Bay.0, Catherine Holt was cooking dinner when her husband's car rolled into the little garage near the kitchen window. She saw him pull down the overhead door with an absent-minded gesture and walk into the living room, as in a dream, sit down in his favorite chair, and begin to drum his fingers on the leather chair arm. After several minutes, he rose and came into the kitchen, putting his arm around her and kissing her, as was his wont after any absence. When they sat down to the table, she noticed that he put a pinch of salt into his coffee before reaching over to the sugar bowl. The conversation was desultory, but he did discuss for some time how old man Spencer still had the same energy as ever. Humorously, he laid it to the odiferousness of the Spencer cheroots. Gary, said Catherine, come on, tell me what's up. Oh said he, no hurry. Let's go out on the terrace and watch the sunset. I'll get your coat. Putting her white sports coat around her shoulders, he gave her a gentle shove through the French doors onto the field stone terrace. Holt's glance went up into the darkening skies where the stars shone over the wide Pacific. He put his arm around her. Gee, this is a nice place, he said, with you. It is for me too. 
darling, so long as you're here. Do you think you could stand it for a while without me, if I were doing something really important? Something that would do the whole world a lot of good? Oh, I might as well tell you. See that red star up there? It's Mars, and they've decided they want me to take out the first trip, Flight 1. Some new photos made from Lunetta make it pretty sure that it's inhabited, and the president of the Earth wants us to go and see if the people up there could possibly want to start a war. There was a sobbing undertone in Catherine Holt's voice as she answered. Just like you men. You'll never get over being children. You get this old Earth reasonably well regulated, you finally establish peace on Earth, and it begins to look as though there were no more enemies and no more wars. And just as we're getting settled in a place we both like and can afford, off you go, hunting for more trouble in space. But darling, he returned, this isn't a simple, childish matter at all. Just suppose for a moment that these Mars people should suddenly drop down and take possession of Lunetta. Surely you realize that that might be fatal for all of us, since Lunetta can atom bomb any spot on Earth. All they'd have to do to dominate the whole Earth would be to control Lunetta. And from what we can find out from their operations on their own planet, they should be just as capable of coming to us as we are of going to them. Well, said she, if they're as dangerous as all that, why haven't they come here long ago? Perhaps they have been here. Ten thousand or one hundred thousand years isn't so very long, when you figure it cosmically. How far back do you think our history goes? With growing enthusiasm, Holt began to explain the significance of the Martian canals, the areas of vegetation, the seasonal variations and the conditions affecting living matter. These had probably forced the Martians to adopt extreme technical measures in order to survive at all upon a planet so old and so deprived of moisture. One could hardly tell, said he whether the intelligent beings on Mars might not be gazing with envy upon the Earth, where conditions affecting life would appear so much more easy. There was no reason in the universe why such a condition might not have been pictured for them by their advanced astronomers. Why, they might even now be considering a general exodus towards Earth, and the results of anything like that upon humanity might well be incalculable. Catherine Holt could hardly take in her husband's fantastic peroration. Despite his wanderings in and out of the atmosphere, she'd always kept her feet on the ground, forming a quiet and practical balance wheel which had steadied his sidereal gyrations. She loved him and the children and their home, and had always regarded with tolerant amusement the call of the wild blue yonder which so stirred the hearts of men. But her heart told her that no small part of the real love she felt for her husband was directly due to his devotion, infantile though it might seem to the romance of flight. Like the love for the sea of a sailor who has swallowed the anchor too young, she saw Gary's yearning for the outer spaces reawaken after a few short years of rest and quiet. Torn by the knowledge that he would be gone for a long time, on an adventure of high daring and distant danger, she knew that she neither could nor should hold him back. His heart would break, were he to follow the exploits of some other leader through the papers and the radio his body in his familiar armchair, but his soul winging through space. She'd be no true spaceman's wife were she to hinder him by so much as a thought. When she spoke, her voice had an aging quality in it. Gary, it's wonderful, she said. I'll be the proudest woman on earth. He felt her soft lips on his cheek and his arms instinctively went around her for a long time. He could not miss her brimming eyes as they separated. When do you expect to get started? She asked. That's still indefinite, so far as I'm concerned. We've got a lot of checking to do to see whether it's practical at all. That will decide whether the attempt will be made. And after the decision, the date will depend upon a lot of things. First of all, Spencer will have to build the ships, which will take all of two years. Then we have to choose the proper opposition between the planets and I'm entirely in the dark as to that. Don't worry, I'll be here for a long time yet, but I might be pretty busy and have to get around a lot. Her answer was what he had expected. Just let me know what you want me to do. Minus Zero, a tough-looking little man of 55, 
in a Space Forces General's uniform, sat in an elaborate office in the Bureau of Earth Security in Garden City, Long Island. Humphrey L. Braden had the chiseled features and hawk-like profile which naturally went with the ex-squadron leader of a supersonic jet bombing outfit in the United States Air Force. Now he was commanding general of the Space Forces, mainly because of the remarkable technical ability which had finally earned him a transfer to the planning staff of the Air Force. It was there that his dynamic driving power had urged slower minds onto the creation of the great, multi-stage rocket ships which had made the construction of Lunetta become an actual project. He it was who had visualized the military importance of a man-artificial satellite, circling the Earth like the Moon and requiring no power to do so. And it was he who had made it his life's task to overcome the objections of the doubters who had opposed the plan as visionary and impractical, and who had endeavored to frustrate it on that basis. Finally, he had established the space forces of the USA as go equal with the Air Force, Army and Navy. This happened when the last war proved that conventional bombing was no match for the Russian anti-aircraft rockets. Then the Jupiter-type spaceships were beginning to successfully circle the Earth and prove that the construction of an artificial satellite, such as he had been advocating, was not only possible, but imperative. As the father of the Space Force of the USA, he was appointed its supreme commander, and later, when the United States of the Earth became reality, he succeeded to the new post of commanding general of the Space Forces of the Earth reporting to the secretary for world security. Such was the man awaiting Gary Holt. When the latter entered, he was greeted like an old friend. They both sat down and Braden began the conversation. Spencer has let the cat out of the bag, or so I've heard, said the general. What do you think of it? Anything as big as that is mighty tempting, sir. But so far I've no very definite idea of how the whole thing will shape up and I'm most anxious to hear how you've got it figured in detail. Of course you would be, I can't blame you for that. So I might as well tell you that the planning part of the thing is still extremely sketchy. It's that part of it that's your pigeon. You're to carry on with the planning, and work it out in detail. Above all, I want you to balance the technical requirements against the materials and means that are available now. In other words, it's up to you to synchronize the whole business. But let me tell you our overall outline of the enterprise. Braden reached for a document on his desk and began to read from it. Objective and implementation of Operation Mars.1. Operation Mars contemplates an expedition to the planet Mars in order to determine whether the latter is inhabited by intelligent beings who might, now or at some later date carry out any hostile design upon the Earth or any outposts thereof. Said expedition is simultaneously, if possible, to carry out an extensive program of research with regard to conditions on the planet Mars.2. Operation Mars will be carried out by the Space Forces under the direct supervision of the Commanding General. The Commanding Officer of the expedition will be an officer of the Space Forces appointed by the Commanding General. At that point, Braden nodded at Holt, as much as to say, you read it. 3. Estimated personnel, 70. Approximately 25% to be commando troops in preparation for any armed resistance which might be met. The remaining 75% will consist of officers and technicians for the rocket ships, scientists, communicators and physicians, etc. 4. The expedition will be composed of ten space ships, of which seven will return to Earth, while three will be abandoned near Mars. Each of these three ships will be equipped with a landing boat to be used for landing upon the Martian surface and for taking off therefrom. The three ships will also serve as general cargo carriers for food and supplies, likewise for such supplementary equipment as special devices, committing boats, spare parts, repair equipment and so forth. 5. When the ten ships have reached the orbit of Mars and entered its gravitational field, any tendency to fall freely to the surface will be counteracted by a power maneuver. This will lead them into a satellite orbit. From this satellite orbit the surface of the planet will be carefully reconnoitred, photographed and studied 
preliminary to the selection of a suitable landing area and the planning of the movements of the landing party upon the surface. Should this observation give grounds to believe that a landing might be impossible or inadvisable, none will be attempted. In this case, the squadron will await a suitable opposition between Mars and the Earth for the return trip and then undertake it. 6. Departure and return paths of the expedition will be those of a satellite orbit around the Earth. This orbit will lie in the plane of the ecliptic and will complete a full turn around the Earth in two hours at an altitude of approximately 1,040 miles. This orbit is almost identical with that of Lunetta, except for the fact that it lies at an angle there 2.7. The Mars ships and the equipment pertaining thereto, including personnel, will be transported to the departure orbit by rocket ships of the Sirius class. The Mars ships and equipment will be transported disassembled. Assembly and loading will take place in the orbit of departure. The landing boats will be assembled on Earth and flown up to the departure orbit under their own power. Eight. A ferry service will be instituted whose main problem as to volume and mass will be to deliver the propellants for the Mars ships into the departure orbit. It is anticipated that the space forces will augment the number of Sinus class rocket ships at their disposal in view of this exigency. 9. The landing on Mars is to be carried out, if possible, with avoidance of any hostile contact with inhabitants of Mars. General Braden ceased reading for a moment, then he said, The you have it, hold. What's your opinion? General, it's a wonderful plan. The general went on. It can hardly be called a plan, Holt. You might call it an outline for a plan. When the details are gone into, there are probably many changes to be made, but it will serve as a general directive. May I ask a few questions, sir? said Holt. Shoot, Colonel, replied the general. Where is the money coming from? Of course that's still one of the most important problems. President Van den Bosch intends to ask the United Congress for a special appropriation if our preliminary studies seem to justify it. Our astronomical division is working hard on a special report, as complete as they can make it, and profusely illustrated with the latest and best photographs of the planet. That ought to give the President's request enough power for him to put it over. Is that material available, sir? said Holt. I'd like very much to see it if I may. Of course you may, said the general. Tell you what you do. Drop up to Lunette in the next day or so and interview the astronomers. Mars is in opposition right now and in the most favorable phase for observation. We've taken advantage of it for the photographs you've seen, and you can get a good look at your planet in the new reflecting telescope. General, I'm sure we'll need a very considerable quantity of new information about Mars in order to have adequate basic data to work up a satisfactory plan for this undertaking. Holt looked at the general quizzically. We surely shall, answered the latter, and there is a lot more which is not covered by data on Mars alone. There are many other phases of this job which call for extensive research along many lines. Professor Ashley, you know, He's head of the World Research Board, has promised us all the support and cooperation that the board can give. That means that every university and research center in the whole world is at our disposal. And, of course, quite a lot of the funds appropriated by the Congress will have to be spent for such research. General, what's your guess as to the total amount of money required? Our preliminary estimate is $2 billion. But whether it'll be enough's another question. How about personnel, General? Has anybody besides myself been selected to handle the planning and to go on the expedition? Here's the setup on that, Holt. United Spacecraft will build the spaceships and the landing boats. Spencer must have told you that, and I'm sure that you'll agree that he's the best man and his company is the best company for it. Spencer will also have to build the additional Sirius class ships for the ferry work. For the planning job, we're going to form a committee composed of Spencer and some of his staff, one of Professor Ashley's men, and you and me. This committee will determine just what's to be done and will also distribute the work appropriately. We've made no plans as to the personnel of the expedition itself. If you head it, 
it seems best to give you the widest latitude as to who goes with you. But, of course, Ashley ought to have the say when it comes to picking the various scientific specialists, particularly for the research work on Mars itself. The general smiled at Holt and continued, you know you'll be gone from the Earth for almost three years, don't you? That's a very long time, and you'll run into a lot of surprises and technical difficulties. Not only that, but you're going to have some pretty psychological problems on your hands. Think it over for a minute. You and your crews will see the Earth only as another heavenly body for almost three years. It will not appear as a solid, homey disk, with the familiar continental outlines standing out and reminding you of where you live. You see it that way from Lunetta, or from the Moon. When you pick your people, you'd better see to it that every man Jack understands that. You and they will have to know that everything that matters to you will seem to have shrunk to nothingness on the surface of a nasty little star in the dim distance. And you'd better be mighty careful about the bodily fitness and the psychological strength of every one of them. Ask yourself whether their initial enthusiasm will hold up after two and three years before you choose. I tell you, Holt, you're going to need men of steel for this job. And you, the leader, will have to be case hardened. The old soldier's words made a deep impression on Holt, and the fact that the grand old man of the space forces had found in him the qualities necessary for a task of such magnitude touched him profoundly. After a moment, he asked, what about the publicity, sir? Is there to be any? I presume that it's all top secret so far. Well, said the general, so far. We've kept the new research data on Mars and the photos under wraps to prevent too much of a stir. But when President Van den Bosch forwards his request for the appropriation to Congress, that will be dropped. We then propose to put on a campaign in all the newspapers of the world. The idea is to publish the pictures and to discuss them technically, likewise to go into the plans for the expedition. Our hope is that we shall be able to steer the public reaction which we expect will be enormous, into constructive and controllable channels. The general grinned almost sheepishly. Besides, he said, it's more than possible that the right kind of publicity will make the United Congress feel quite generous. Is it all right for me to approach some of the people I'd like to consider for the planning work, and maybe for the trip, before the thing is announced? Of course any such approach would be held confidential. I can't see where it would do any harm. You'll need a few men immediately, if we're to get on with this, anyway. And, of course, you'll discuss it only with thoroughly reliable people whom you can trust absolutely. It will be but a few weeks before the whole world will be standing on its head over their mere plans, anyway. I have a few people in mind already. General that would go to show that you'd decided to take the job before you even talked to me, wouldn't it? laughed the general. General, I believe you know perfectly well that I couldn't have refused a job like this. What's your wife got to say about it? She's taking it beautifully. Half the time she's in tears, but the other half, she laughs over us men who can't stay quietly at home. You tell Catherine that my hat's off to her answered the general as Holt opened the door to leave, and one more thing. Of course you'll go back to active duty in the space forces. Colonel Maligny, our present chief of staff, will take care of that detail. Talk it over with him. He's had all the necessary instructions. Your preliminary post of duty will be Long Beach, so that you may collaborate as closely as possible with Spencer. But first, Get away on your trip to Lunetta and have a good look at your new planet. Chapter 2 A flight to Lunetta The Lunetta Ferry Squadron's base was near Kailui on the island of Maui. To Gary and Catherine Holt it was almost a second home, for they had been based there for a long time during the past war, when he had been flight instructor of captains of space ships during the days of the old Jupiter-class vessels. So he naturally took Catherine along to the base. Of this she was very fond, not the least reason for this fondness being that they had honeymooned there. To this had been added the first few years of their married life, and she proposed to look up a lot of old friends. 
when Holt got back from Luneta, that probably be time for them to spend a day or so at Waikiki Beach, and that was a pleasant prospect. There was an excellent reason for the selection of Kilui as a base for the Luneta ferry service. First of all, any such base must of necessity lie close to the sea, for all spaceships were given their primary acceleration by enormous rocket booster stages. After exhausting their propellants, these booster stages fell back to Earth, and could land only upon water without suffering irremediable damage. Water also was essential for practical salvage operations. On Hawaii, climatic conditions were especially favorable. It was also essential that the base be located at a great distance from the west coast of America. This need was due to the fact that the relative movement of Luneta to the Earth was in the same direction as the latter's rotation, although at a marked angle to the plane of the equator. This meant that the boosters might drop as much as 1,000 miles east of the launching site. Logistically, all sorts of necessary supplies and equipment, such as rocket ships, parts, and particularly propellants, could be transported from the west coast by sea at low cost and with ease. Zero, Catherine and Gary Holt had seated themselves in the cafeteria of the flight control building at Kilui where they awaited the departure announcement of the space vessel in which the latter was scheduled to go to Luneta. The time of departure was 9.12 p.m. Departures were calculated, somewhat in the manner of ocean liners with respect to tidal conditions according to the seasonal date and the location of Lunetta in her orbit. Holt was back in uniform, having been recalled to active duty with the rank of colonel. The wings of his collar bore shiny rocket insignia, the specialty mark of the Space Forces. His appearance was somewhat weary, for he had slept but little during the last few days. He had spent the daytime in the public libraries of Los Angeles, gathering books and pamphlets on the subject of Mars and had sat up into the wee small hours reading them. Finally, he had prepared an enormous questionnaire for the astronomers in Lunetta, to ensure that he would not miss asking them any question which seemed to him important and primary with respect to Mars. He and his wife had little to say to one another. She could feel how his mind was churning around the many unknown factors in the new plan. She hated to see him disappear once more into the infinity that lay between the stars, whose dim light shone into her eyes through sleepless night after sleepless night. When he was away in space she could never so much as gaze through a window after nightfall without feeling a sort of humble horror of those distant stars. Gratingly, the public address system interrupted her thoughts, passengers for Lunetta very serious, all aboard, please. Holt, with overcoat, briefcase and kit bag, rose and she followed him. Together they walked down a long, subterranean passage, brightly lighted and panelled. It led to a heavy, blast-proof door beyond which lay the launching site. Here, centred in the gleaming rays of ten powerful searchlights, stood Sirius. Like a great black tower she loomed into the sky, a sky dark and lowering to Catherine, despite its serene stars. Of Sirius two hundred feet of height, the lower two-thirds was cylindrical and sixty-five feet thick. The cylinder was necked down to about thirty feet at this point, somewhat above which stood the third stage. It oddly resembled a stubby artillery shell and was the heart of the vessel which alone would rise to escape the grasp of gravity. All the great mass of the lower part was made up of two booster stages, whose sole purpose was to bring the third stage to a speed from which its own much smaller thrust could whirl it into outer space and into Lunetta's satellitic orbit. From its sides protruded two arrowhead shaped traking wing stubs housing the retractable airfoils for use upon return to the atmosphere. Near these stubs, a ring of portals shore dimly. Sinus vast bulk was supported vertically by four great stabilizing fins which provided flight stability on her passage up through the atmosphere. They rested upon a heavy iron annulus, itself standing upon four massive legs some distance above the ground. The raging torrent of fire which was to spout from the rocket nozzles would pass through the central aperture of this huge metal ring and would be equal in diameter to the full thickness of the ship. Just below the center of the aperture was the jet deflector, 
whose conical point would divide the great stream of fire emerging from the rocket nozzles in a vertically downward direction, and would fan it out horizontally. This would be necessary to protect the concrete underpinnings from the mighty blast of the fiery jet streams during the few seconds before the ship lifted high enough to reduce the terrific heat. Beside the ship stood an enormous tower-like gantry mounted upon a heavy trailer with many wheels. A small open door in the third stage was accessible via this structure. The tiny figure of a man could be seen standing in the open door. When Catherine and Gary reached the underground blast proof door, a group of some fifteen men were crowded around a gateway leading to it. Among them were officers, soldiers, and civilians, each with the necessary papers for passage to Lunetta. Holt joined them after a short and silent goodbye kiss. She saw him stride across the open space leading to the gantry, within which an elevator lifted him and his group of fellow passengers up towards the open door in the third stage. As he crossed the little walkway between the tower and the door, he waved to her, then he disappeared within. It was by no means Catherine's first spaceship launching from close up, but she could never master the awe that overcame her when she saw and heard, nay, felt through every fiber of her being the might of that infernal stream of fire which so lightly lifted the clumsy ships and hurled them into the distant heavens. As usual, she walked into the observation bunker from which the departure of loved ones could be observed in safety. Six hundred feet from the launching platform, the bunker afforded an ideal view of the proceedings through a dome of armored glass. A giant clock showed that it was 9.05 p.m. A luminous red spot on the face of the clock marked the time of 9.12 and a huge second hand jerked around the dial. Catherine could see the ship standing motionless, a dark, menacing column of blackness, despite the rays of the projectors focused upon it. Soon, a powerful tractor appeared out of the gloom and hooked on to the trailer bearing the elevator in which Gary and the others had mounted their lofty eerie. The coupling seemed to be a pretty involved business and the driver of the tractor signaled with his hand to the man who still stood in the open door. Finally the gantry moved ponderously off into the dark background and could be seen no more. The little door closed. Dot within the observation bunker were two men enclosed in a glass booth. Telephone receivers covered their ears and before their mouths were microphones. These men were now the only earth dwellers in communication with the pilot's cabin of the Sinus. Periodically, one of them pushed a switch button and the loudspeaker in the bunker rang out, Spaceship Sirius, X-2 minutes. At short intervals, the commands succeeded one another, shipside powers cut in. Cut in tracking stations. Spaceship Sirius, X-1 minute. Outside the bunker, a colored flare shot into the sky, whereupon all the searchlights died and a powerful siren wailed a warning note into the night. The loudspeaker roared again, set radio to send and receive. X minus 30 seconds. Ready, the Sirius. Pre launching time 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. A tongue of blue green flame licked out from the stern of the ship in wrapping the heavy iron table and the stabilizing fins. Then it spread out flat with a roaring rush. The bunker shivered as though in continuous thunder, and the flame issuing from the stern of the ship swelled to a column faster than lightning and more solid than steel. The whole ship and the surrounding landscape were lighted by its baleful glare. The flames spurted frantically across the ground, pouring from the jet deflector. Then the ship began to move slowly straight upwards, as pebbles flung by the mighty stream of fire rattled against the transparent observation dome of the bunker. The roar of the rocket exhaust increased almost beyond bearing as the discharge nozzles reached a height at which the observers could look directly into them. As the ship gained height, the din slackened until finally the great mass became invisible in the darkest sky its position alone betrayed by the comet-like jet exhaust which soon began to curve off gracefully to the north and east dot growing smaller and smaller to the eye, now roaring like a remote thunderstorm, it soon crossed the star-spangled heavens like a man-made meteor. Then, after a minute and a half, it went out, like a star hiding behind a cloud. No! There it was again! Like a migrating star, 
and with increasing speed, the flaming point swept across the sky, heading more and more towards the distant horizon. The loudspeaker snarled, first booster stage released ok all's well. It was the voice of the captain of the Sirius. Now the flare of the rocket exhaust was but a tiny point of light in the distant reaches of the sky. Not very high above the dim horizon line, it blinked once more and finally lost itself among the constellations just above the edge of the sea. Again the snarl came from the loudspeaker, but more softly this time, second booster stage released ok all's well. There was a minute of heavy silence, then, as though from another world, the loudspeaker whispered comfortingly, third stage cut off correctly. All's well. Trajectory data, please. The men in the glass booth sprang into action with their microphones and headpieces. From various electrical triangulation stations, which had followed the ascent by radar, they correlated the flight data of the invisible ship. Terminal velocity, 8260.3 meters per second, said the loudspeaker as though bored. Angle of elevation, 4 minutes of arcade altitude of combustion cut off. 101.98 kilometers. Plane of great circle inclined 66 degrees, 32 minutes, 2 seconds to plane of equator. Major semi axis, 7290 kilometers. Minor semi axis, 7,2338 2, kilometers. Timing error, 2.45 seconds. A short time passed. Then the ship answered in a whisper, Roger. Thanks. Have radio contact with Lunetta. Out. When Colonel Holt stepped through the little door into the airlock of the Sirius, the cylindrical passenger cabin of the Sirius was bathed in light. He placed his equipment in the luggage rack and strapped it down. Then he lay down on one of the air cushioned couches that were arranged circumferentially around the walls of the cabin. At the head of each couch was a small, round dead light giving a view outside. The roof of the cabin was equipped with a large clock having a second hand and showing a spot of red light at the scheduled moment of launching. Surrounding the clock face were four indirectly lighted instrument dials, one of which indicated acceleration, while the others gave altitude, speed, and horizontal distance made good. Luminous signs surrounded the instruments all of which were dark, save one. The latter warned passengers to strap baggage, fasten safety belts. A ladder ran up the cabin wall to a sliding hatch in the roof. This was the passage to the pilot's compartment. In the center of the deck was a circular manhole plate with a large hand wheel in its center. Through it one could reach the cargo space below which lay the propellant storage bay and the machinery spaces which were accessible in that way. The clock showed X-3 when the ship's mechanic closed and dogged down the oval hermetic door of the airlock, after shutting the outer door. Then he ascended the ladder and disappeared through the sliding hatch into the pilot's compartment. Holt looked through his little deadlight and was able dimly to discern the movement away from the ship of the great elevator gentry. Despite the blinding glare of the searchlights. When the searchlights were switched off at X-1, there was a simultaneous dimming of the interior illumination. A deathly stillness filled the cabin, disturbed only by the hum of the directional gyroscopes and the buzzing of the inverters. He could hear through the cabin ceiling the muffled voices of the crew giving the last preparatory commands. A luminous sign on the ceiling blazed up, caution, X-30 seconds. The 30 changed to 20 and to 10. Another sign bad heads on headrests. Holt reclined his head on the soft pillow and followed tensely the leaping ciphers. 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. The ship shivered slightly and Holt saw the neighboring buildings glow in the light of the ignition flame. Then, amid a diapason roaring, as though the grandfather of all hurricanes had seized the vessel, an unseen force pressed Holt and his companions deep into the yielding softness of their couches. For a moment the earth surrounding the ship seemed to be a sea of wild, concentric, horizontal flame. Then the sea shrank to a diminishing fiery disk and finally went black beneath the loom of the roaring column of fire spurting from the rocket exhaust.
Sirius had lifted off and was thundering into space. As the great vessel rose vertically, more and more lights in and around the station came into view. The brilliant lights of Honolulu blinked from across the water to dim and disappear in diffuse darkness. Below lay the night steeped Pacific and above beckoned the star studded ocean of space. Holt, lying full length upon his couch, groaned as the almost unbearable load of the acceleration descended upon him. His breath labored as the menacing hand of the accelerometer crept past 3.2 grams. The speed indicator and the altimeter hands hurried around their dials and the cabin was filled with the muffled growling of the rocket exhaust. Still the accelerometer needle climbed. 5 grams. 6 grams. 7 grams. Holt was pushed into the supporting cushions almost viciously. It was as though every organ in his body had turned to lead. The acceleration rose to 8 grams. Another luminous sign flared up on the ceiling. Caution. Dropping first stage. There was an instant of relief from the dreadful pressure and the menacing accelerometer hand dropped back to 1.3 grams. Then the deep booming set up once more and the accelerometer increased to 1.8 grams. It continued slowly to the higher figures again, renewing the torture with which acceleration besets the human frame. The burning time of the second stage was 124 seconds, during which the acceleration once more reached 8 grams. Caution. Dropping second stage. Shone at the passengers from the ceiling sign, then came a moment of respite. But the experience was repeated as soon as the acceleration diminished to 1.3 grams. With a howl. The third stage combustion exerted its push upon the now tiny core of the erstwhile enormous rocket. There was a clicking sound and the accelerometer climbed again to 1.5 grams. Gone was the second stage which had brought them to the speed at which they could carry on towards Lunetta with the power packaged in the tip of the rocket. Vibration increased, for their own, undetachable rocket plant was thundering and roaring a scant 15 feet below the floor of their cabin. It was the third and last stage of acceleration. It was 84 seconds since the second stage had been jettisoned. Caution. Cut off. Glared from the ceiling. The accelerometer began to descend from 2.5 grams, the almost mercifully low figure which this time was its maximum. The cruel pressure melted, slowly at first, and then it was gone. Holt closed his eyes for a moment. He had just come through that horrible second at the end of the acceleration ordeal, when the agony is over and the peculiar sensation of weightlessness begins. All people and all things in a rocket ship coasting through space are weightless, or seem to be, and this offers a feeling of release second to none. But the transition from the agonies of acceleration to the joys of weightlessness is ever accompanied by a dark moment of spiritual terror which besets everyone no matter how often they have been through it. He released his belt and found himself floating unsupported above his couch. Beyond the thick glass of his deadlight he could see the black sky with its stars projected in unnatural brilliance. Their earth familiar twinkle was gone. Soon the sliding hatch in the ceiling opened and an officer who might be the co-pilot emerged headfirst, pulling himself along with his hands and with one foot hooked around the ladder rail so as to remain parallel to the wall. Arriving at the bottom, he flicked himself into an upright position. Gentlemen, he said, those of you on your first trip to Lunetta may want to hear some details about our path of ascent, our present flight condition, and the maneuvers we shall undertake. Our vessel, Sinus, is the flagship of the Lunetta Ferry Squadron. We reach a maximum velocity of 8,260 meters per second in ascent, in a direction horizontal to the Earth's surface. This is attained in three consecutive but separate propulsion periods. During the first period, lasting 84 seconds, the vessel is given a velocity of 2,350 meters per second by the first booster stage. The rocket motor of the first stage develops a thrust of 12,800 metric tons. During the 84 seconds of operation it consumes some 4,800 tons of propellants. While the angle of ascent is vertical at the beginning, 
the gyro gear gradually tilts it until, at the moment when the propellants of the first booster are exhausted, the ship has an angle of elevation with respect to the plane of the horizon of slightly more than 20 degrees. At the end of the propulsion period of the first booster, the ship has attained an altitude of approximately 40 kilometers above the Earth's surface and has made good a horizontal distance of some 50 kilometers from the launching platform. Shortly before the exhaustion of the first booster propellants, acceleration is diminished by throttling their admission to the motor, and this diminished acceleration permits the second booster stage to break free of the almost exhausted first booster stage by its own power. The second booster exerts a thrust of 1,600 tons, and as soon as it begins this, the first booster drops off. The latter is then decelerated by a large, specially designed parachute and descends to Earth supported by it. The second booster stage works for 124 seconds and consumes about 700 tons of propellants during this time, at the end of which the ship has attained a velocity of 6,420 meters per second, has climbed to 64 kilometers above the Earth and has reached a horizontal distance of 534 kilometers from the launching site. The gyroscopic steering gear has continued to tilt the angle of the ship during the operation of the second stage, so that the angle of elevation of the flight path to the plane of the horizon is only 2.5 degrees at the end of its combustion period. After the second booster is exhausted, the power plant of the third and final stage effects its release from the second stage in the same manner that the second stage is released from the first booster. The second stage, like the first, is decelerated by a parachute and descends to Earth. The thrust of the third stage rocket motor is but 200 tons and this thrust lasts for 84 seconds. During this period, the ship is brought up to her maximum velocity of 8,260 meters per second, after consuming 58.8 tons of propellants. This only partially exhausts the tankage of 83 tons, leaving a very considerable supply of propellants still available after ascent has been completed. This reserve is required for the maneuver of adaptation, which I shall shortly describe, as also for the return trip to Earth. There is still left a very considerable margin of safety as to propellants. During the propulsion period of the third stage, the ship rises to an altitude of 102 kilometers and at combustion cutoff has covered a horizontal distance from the launching site of about 1135 kilometers. The angle of elevation of the flight path at combustion cutoff of the third stage is almost exactly zero. When referred to the plane of the horizon at the launching site, this angle is slightly negative, although with respect to the surface of the Earth directly below the rocket ship it is practically horizontal. This is due to the curvature of the Earth, which makes a spirit level, just below the momentary position of the ship, lie at an angle to a level at the launching site. When the third stage is moving horizontally at a rate of 8,260 meters per second, and is at an altitude of 102 kilometers above the ground, it is some 410 meters per second faster than the orbital velocity at that altitude. Were its speed exactly that of the orbital velocity, centrifugal force would balance its weight exactly and it would continue to orbit around the Earth at the altitude of 108 kilometers. But since the velocity imparted to the ship by the third stage is somewhat above the orbital velocity, Centrifugal force is greater than the attraction of gravity and the ship recedes from the Earth. Our initial speed of 8,260 meters per second was selected in order that we might proceed along an elliptical path, the apogee of which is at 1,730 kilometers from the Earth's surface. This is the altitude at which Lunetta circles the Earth at the orbital speed corresponding to that altitude namely 7,070 meters per second. We, however, lose a certain amount of our speed as a result of our climb to that altitude, so that our velocity will be but 6,610 meters per second at the time we intercept Lunetta's orbit. Thus we shall have to carry out a so-called adaptation maneuver in order to increase our velocity by the amount it lacks, to equal that of Lunetta. 
This is 460 meters per second. We fly unpropelled for a period of 50 minutes and 54 seconds after final combustion cut off. At the end of this period we shall arrive at a point of tangency with Lunetta's orbit. The adaptation maneuver will begin at the end of this period and will require us to run our rocket motor for about 15 seconds. Until then, you gentlemen may do as you wish. The time of our launching was carefully selected so that we shall be flying close alongside Lunetta at Lunetta's velocity when the adaptation maneuver is completed. After that, we shall proceed to make actual contact. Gentlemen, you will note that you and everything else in the vessel is at present weightless, but please do not assume that this is due to our having passed beyond the influence of the gravitational field of the Earth. for this is not so. The condition is better explained by the fact that you and the other masses comprising the ship together received the identical initial velocity. We are now traversing the gravitational field of the earth along a free trajectory. Every molecule of your bodies and all the parts of the ship obey the same laws of motion with respect to that trajectory. For that reason, no differential forces, which you might sense as gravity, are created between your bodies and the ship. The condition has been baptized weightlessness because we cannot perceive our own weight, nor that of anything else, although some linguistic purists question the accuracy of the word. We are, in point of fact, quite definitely under the influence of gravity, in that our trajectory is predetermined thereby. The reason why we cannot sense it lies in there being no opposing force nor solid ground beneath us preventing us from yielding to the pull of gravity. During the portion of the flight when the weightless condition prevails, you may unsnap your belts and move freely around the cabin. I shall have to ask the inexperienced among you to be quite careful about it, so that you may not injure yourselves by bumping against the walls. You must realize that the slightest push will send you floating in any direction until you strike something. Some people have even learned to swim the air. When the adaptation maneuver is announced by the luminous sign, please return to your couches and put on your safety belts. The co-pilot, after finishing his little speech, retired in the same mysterious manner through the sliding hatch from which he had emerged. Zero, Holt gazed drowsily through his porthole. He envisaged the long time during which he was going to be faced with naught but that sepia sky and it's clear and twinkling stars. No, I would ever see them thus so long as the owner stood deep at the bottom of the atmosphere. No earthbound view would ever encompass his vision of the Milky Way, that diamond necklace of the sidereal depths spanning the firmament. To him, Earth would appear much as Vega, that brilliant distant star that now stood forth against the black velvet background. His nearest and dearest would seem as remote as that, and for years. Katie his boys, his bungalow, his Pacific, his beloved California, his native land, all would shrink down to a tiny point of light. To a nasty little star, as Braden had put it. Fear overwhelmed him for a moment. Would he be able to maintain morale and discipline throughout the long, lonesome stretch, unbroken by day and night? The general had been right, his choice of companions must be restricted to men of steel and he knew that he'd have to case harden himself in order to do justice to them as their leader. Finally, he dozed off. He was awakened by voices in the cabin and noticed that it had become brighter. The other passengers were crowded around the portals across the cabin from his couch. Just inside the circle of couches lining the wall of the cabin was a balustrade of ropes supported by stanchions rising from the floor. His body horizontal, he hauled himself along this balustrade and peered out. At least one half of the visible sky was covered by an enormous, luminous scimitar. Why, that was a dawn creeping over the earth. It would not be long before Sirius would fly out of the penumbra of the earth and into the sunlight. The luminous scimitar became broader and broader, and soon the livid mantle of the solar corona flared up over the eastern curvature of the earth. Painfully, his eyes received the first direct rays from the blistering surface of the orb of day, which soon emerged from behind the shelter of the earth. Immediately below, their home planet was still wrapped in shadow, 
and the line marking the dawn crawled slowly towards the Sirius dot as he looked down, he seemed to descry a coastline, dim in the shadows just before sunup. Surely, then it was, clearly recognizable, the shoreline of the western provinces of Canada. Hold drew his binoculars from his briefcase and peered tensely at the scene. Broad and easily identified, Vancouver Island defended the mainland, far to his right. It was unmistakable, despite the lividness of the morning light. Soon Ever Basker Lake, crescent shaped amid the vast forests, slid slowly by and before long Hudson's Bay loomed up at the extreme right. Directly below them, full daylight enveloped the scene. It was easy to see that the ship had silently climbed higher and higher on its way to Lunetta's orbit, and it occurred to hold that, if there were still any who doubted that Columbus was right when he announced that the Earth was round, this trip would surely carry conviction. The basic fact of the Earth's rotundity was incontrovertible to even the most skeptical eye. The ship sped over Baffin's land and the eternal glaciers of Greenland crept into view. It must have been an unusually clear day in those latitudes, for Holt was amazed at the definition with which his binoculars revealed the usually fog-bound fjords of Greenland's west coast. The great circle course of the Sirius began to incline south at this point, and it was but half an hour after the rocket motor had been shut off that passengers on the opposite side of the cabin called out that they could distinguish Ireland. A few minutes later, the ship cut diagonally across the coast of Portugal. Lisbon, Gibraltar and its straits, Spanish, Morocco and the Atlas Mountains passed as though projected on a strip of film, and soon the sandy vastness of the Sahara Desert lay below. Just as they stood above the Cameroons and paralleled the southern Atlantic coast of Africa, the luminous warning sign recalled them to their couches, where they tightened their straps. Sinus had attained the thousand miles of altitude of Lunetta in a long ellipse of ascent. Now for the adaptation maneuver. Thrust was applied as the rocket motor screamed viciously, forcing the passengers painfully into their cushions. It lasted for 15 seconds, with the accelerometer rising to 2.8 and then to 5.3 grams. Then silence fell once more and the easy sensation of weightlessness was restored. Again the co-pilot's head appeared in the hatch. Gentlemen, our distance from Lunetu is now 800 yards. If you look to the left, you can see her clearly. Five minutes from now, we shall begin the contact action. Holt peered out and the other passengers drew themselves to other portholes on his side. The swam a lunetta. Of a glistening silver color, she seemed an enormous tire with spokes, suspended in space and slowly rotating about her central axis. Around the circumference of this gigantic inner tube were portholes like those of a ship. The spokes ended at the center in a cylindrical hub and were quite thin, like those of a Brobdignagian bicycle wheel, except for two much thicker ones that seemed to run straight through the hub from rim to rim. A large parabolic mirror was attached to one end of the hub and seemed not to rotate with the remainder of the huge fabric. In the focus of the mirror was a black ball. Two of the civilian passengers floated themselves across the middle of the cabin and peered out of the port next to Holtz. There's your inner tube, La Sine, Holt heard one of them say. I hope you'll enjoy your stay in it. It will seem like a second home to you before you're through. Holt glanced at the speaker from the corner of his eye. He was somewhat elderly, and had obviously neglected to have his grey hair cut. Intelligent grey-blue eyes twinkled behind rimless glasses. His companion's body seemed at least half a head longer than that of the speaker, although they hung at different angles beside the port. The companion's hair was bleached white and contrasted delightfully with the youthful curiosity with which he stared at the enormous wheel. It's certainly impressive, remarked the bleached giant, but I'll have to admit that I don't quite understand it. Can't you tell me something about it before we connect? I don't know quite as much about it as I'd like to, answered the man with the glasses, but perhaps the colonel here wouldn't mind helping us out a bit. Turning to Holt, he introduced himself. My name's Hansen, Canute Hansen, of the Pelimer Observatory, and this is Dr. Francis Lassini of MIT, who's visiting Lunetta for the first time. 
I'm sure you're an old spaceman who won't mind lecturing a couple of Earth lovers for a while. I'm Colonel Holt. It'll be a pleasure. Oh, you'll be the Holt who was with Fitzgerald on the moon. Of course, your picture was much in the papers at the time. You must feel at home in Lunetta. Well, I was on duty here for several months. How about a quick review of the most important things one should know about Lunetta? It would be so nice if I didn't have to bother the people here with foolish questions. Ok let's start with the orbit. Lunetta's orbit is almost exactly circular with respect to the Earth's center 8110 kilometers away. That is to say, Lunetta flies in a circle at an altitude of 1730 kilometers above the surface. Her velocity must be 7.07 km per second in order that her weight may exactly counterbalance the pull of gravity by its centrifugal force in the orbit. Right now, our ship is momentarily at the same speed and we therefore follow Lunetta in her orbit without any need for power. What is the angle of the orbital plane to the plane of the equator? Lassini asked. It's exactly 66.5 degrees and exactly vertical to the ecliptic. Why was that angle chosen? Wouldn't it have been more practical to lay the orbit in the plane of the equator or in that of the ecliptic? There would have been certain advantages if it had been done that way, said Holt, but a compromise had to be made. You see, Lunetta was established during the last war and was primarily an observation post and a bomb dropping station against Russia. That meant that her orbit must pass over some of the higher northern latitudes. Furthermore, to have the plane of the orbit perpendicular to that of the ecliptic affords the advantage that Lunetu is over daylighted ground during the longest possible time averaged over a year. The ground must be daylighted for effective observation or effective bomb dropping. That I do not understand, said Lassini curtly. If you will plot the angle of the Earth's polar axis in its orbit around the Sun, you'll see that the North Pole points most nearly towards the Sun on June 21st Street, while the South Pole does so on December 21st Street. This is the reason that Lunetta can make her girdle around the Earth on those two days exactly above the limits of dawn and dark. This means that the Sun never sets on the Earth directly below Lunetta. On the other hand, at the equinoxes Lunetta has night under her for one of the two hours which she requires to circle the earth, and day for the other. Of course, you realize that the equinoxes are the most unfavorable periods for the operations of Lunetta so far as tactical considerations are concerned, for active work can only go on half the time. But averaged over the year, Lunetta's orbital plane permits her to be over daylighted areas 75% of the time, that's easy to see. Holt pointed over at Lunetta, where a small circular door had opened in the bottom of the hub. A man in what seemed to be a diving suit stepped out into nothingness and seemed to float there. Suddenly, the distant figure began to move mysteriously towards the sinus as though propelled by some invisible force. A thin line leading back to the hub of Lunetta followed him. He's bringing us the securing line, said Holt. In ten minutes we'll have completed the contact operation. How does the fellow move himself? questioned Lassini. He's got a little reaction pistol in his hand. It's fed from a tank strapped to his back. Very simple, really. The tank holds hydrogen peroxide which is chemically dissociated in the pistol. This generates steam, which, spurting from the pistol, produces a couple of pounds of thrust. He can move himself in any direction by pointing the pistol just opposite from where he wants to go. Quite a business, quite a business, this pushing yourself around in space with pistols. But tell me, what is the diameter of this Lunetto anyway? It's exactly 200 feet, and it rotates once every 20 seconds on its axis. This rotation produces an acceleration at the rim equal to one third of the gravity on Earth namely 0.3 grams. The crew, who spend most of their time in the rim, therefore feel themselves pressed against the outer wall of the periphery with one third of the force to which they are accustomed to press against the earth at home. A spring balance would show that they weighed but one third of their normal weights. Three tenths g? asked Lassini in amazement. 
Why do they not increase the RPM and produce an acceleration fully equivalent to the 1.0 grams to which they are accustomed? That seems quite reasonable at first thought, said Holt. But there's an excellent reason for not going all the way with our synthetic gravity. In view of the relatively small diameter of Lunetta, her rotation tends to produce what are called Coriolis forces. If you are standing on the floor of the annular living space, which is, of course, where a nail would come through if you think of Lunetta as a tire being punctured, your head is pointed directly at the center of the hub. When you move peripherally in either direction your head must go more slowly than your feet to keep your body in line with the synthetic gravity. But since you are unaccustomed to such walking, because on earth you must wander many miles before there is an appreciable convergence of the gravitational pull, here, where it happens rapidly you tend to fall in the direction of your movement. It turned out that for this particular diameter, a centrifugal acceleration at the rim of 0.3 grams was about right. It seems to be well above what we call the comfort level in the space business and yet the Coriolis forces are not high enough to affect equilibrium. That's certainly interesting. But how did you get that enormous wheel up here at all? That wasn't so difficult. It consists, you know, of ten hollow sections of rubberized fabric. These were folded up small on earth and brought up here on vessels like the one we are in. What am I saying? It was the old Jupiter class that did the job. Then men in space suits like this fellow out there assembled the sections to form a closed ring. Finally it was blown up with compressed air, like an automobile tire. Why that's wonderful. And the hub? It's the same idea. The hub consists of a drum, likewise of rubberized fabric, inflated to the same pressure as the rim. What's the purpose of the spokes? Please notice that there's a black sphere on the upper end of the hub. That is a steam boiler. It is heated by the parabolic mirror beside it. The diameter of this mirror is 10.6 meters and it concentrates the solar rays on the generator, permitting steam to be constantly drawn off from it. This steam drives a turbo generator located within the central station, as the hub of Lunetu is called. Thus the whole structure is supplied with 35 kilowatts of electrical energy. You will notice that the mirror does not revolve with the wheel, instead, a photoelectric cell controls a mechanism which keeps it constantly directed at the sun day of course, this could not be done unless the rotation of the wheel was kept in the ecliptic dot however, you must not confuse the plane in which the wheel rotates with the plane of Lunetta's orbit around the earth for the latter is at right angles to the ecliptic, as I already told you. What's the connection between the mirror and the spokes of the wheel? Asked Lasini a bit confused. Ah, yes. Sorry I digressed from your last question. Those spokes are used as condensers for the exhaust steam of the turbine, and here we run into one of the more interesting anomalies. Despite the general belief that interstellar space is extremely frigid, it is very difficult indeed to achieve satisfactory cooling. There is, of course, no air, so we cannot resort to air cooling and are restricted entirely to radiation cooling. The turbine expands its steam down to 46 degrees centigrade, and we're obliged to cool our condenser with what little radiant heat is still given off at the temperature. Even for the miserable 35 kilowatts that the generator puts out, we have to have 1,790 square feet of cooling surface, and the spokes are the condenser tubes. Since their combined length equals 1,300 feet and their diameter is 5.3 inches, they provide exactly the amount of radiating surface necessary. But how does it happen that these tubes are not heated by radiation from the sun? That's quite simple, said Holt. They're always shaded by the rim because it rotates in the plane of the ecliptic. Lassini's curiosity was still unappeased, and he went on with his questioning. That is certainly cleverly thought out, but tell me, just how the water gets back into the boiler from the tubes? Simplest thing in, or out, of the world, said Holt. It condenses on the inner walls of the tubes and runs outwards towards the rim by the centrifugal force brought into play by the rotation of Lunetta around the hub. 
there's a collector ring connecting the outer ends of the condenser spokes. From this ring, an electric pump feeds the condensate back to the boiler through one of the spokes reserved for that purpose. That's really wonderful. And now, what are the two thick spokes? They're actually elevator shafts, if you can call a little car in which a man can ride but which goes neither up nor down, an elevator. As a matter of fact, when you're riding in one, you feel like you're going down when you're moving towards the rim. Lunetta's rotation around her hub produces, as I think I told you, the effect of gravity in the rim. Anyhow, the crew can move between the hub and the rim in these elevators. But look, we're making fast. The man in the space suit was now close to Sirius. At the end of the steel cable which he dragged behind him was a coupling device to be shackled to a fitting at the ship's nose. The man disappeared from the view of those at the portals and could be heard moving around and connecting the shackle. Then he appeared in front of the entrance door of the passenger cabin. Prior to this, the ship's mechanic had pulled himself down the ladder and was waiting near the door. He touched a switch button as the man in the space suit approached the outer door of the airlock, opening the latter. The man in the space suit drew himself in and the mechanic pressed another switch button after closing the outer door. There was a hissing sound which Holt described to Lusini as the airlock being pressurized. Then the inner door was opened and the stranger drew himself in. After removing his transparent helmet and greeting the passengers with a cheery hello, folks, he pulled himself along the ladder into the pilot's compartment. There was a slight jerk. That's the winch taking hold, said Holt. Lunetta has a little electric winch which is now winding in the cable the man just brought over and made fast on our nose. Slowly, Sirius began to turn and the great wheel which was Lunetta disappeared from view, coming into sight again a few moments later. Its enormous, rotating circumference drew closer and closer to the portholes. Then there was a mild jar, followed by a sound as of a skidding auto tire. Sirius began to turn about her central axis. When the mechanic opened the outer door without closing the inner one, there was no change of pressure, nor cracking in the ears of the passengers. That's the end and object of the contact maneuvers, said Holt. We can now see how Lunetta looks from the inside. Chapter 3 Interstellar stop off the central station of Lunetta was an elongated cylindrical space about 30 feet in diameter and 40 feet long and almost empty. Holt floated into its barrel-like interior through a door that opened in the mooring cone. At the apex of the mooring cone was a hand wheel that locked Sirius' nose against the hermetic seal. Between the point of the cone and the opposite end of the station was a meshed shield of wire behind which stood the turbo generator. Dot in the center of the space was a sign reading Welcome to Lunetta. Arriving personnel please report to room 21 without delay. There was a hand rope leading to the door of one of the elevator shafts and Holt, Hansen and Lusini held their luggage in their left hands as they pulled their bodies along this rope. Lusini was having quite a bit of trouble, unaccustomed as he was to the weightlessness. With his luggage in one hand, he failed to pull himself exactly parallel to the rope, so that when he let go of it to get another grip, he found himself floating away and bumping into the wall. He then attempted to seize it with his left hand, thus relinquishing his grasp on his luggage. Before he knew it, the suitcase had escaped and floated away. Lusini and his equipment were apparently hopelessly separated, despite the former's frantic wriggling, punctuated by mirth. Hold it. Here comes help laughed Holt, pushing his own luggage against the wall of the cylinder where it remained, held by centrifugal force. Then Holt launched himself across the center with a powerful thrust, gripping the floating Lusini as he passed dot together, they impinged lightly on the opposite wall, where Holt instructed Lusini to make a similar leap back and then to hold on. I'll get that obstreperous suitcase of yours. He said, laughing. They then entered the gauge. Now watch out, said Holt, grasping a pair of hand grips. As soon as we move, you'll feel a push into the corner. This is a combined effect of the increasing centrifugal acceleration floorwards and the sideways acceleration which brings us up to the peripheral speed of the ring. When the car stopped at what seemed the bottom, 
the old feeling of weight was restored, although it was definitely weaker than down on earth. They found that they could both stand and walk, but Holt was the only one of the three who didn't tend to leap lightly from the floor at each step when they first arrived. Holt immediately reported to Major General Riley, commanding Lunetta. I'm very happy to meet our Mars man, said the general. General Braden has radioed us to offer you every facility we have. What's your program? My most important mission is to visit the observatory and to ask various questions about Mars of Dr. Bergman and his assistants. After that, I'd like to discuss some of the astronomical measurement problems that are of vital importance to our planning work. Do you know that Professor Hansen from the Mount Pelimer Observatory is to arrive? Asked the General. Certainly, said Holt. We met on the way up and he's waiting in the outer office. Hansen is outstanding among the Mars specialists, said the general. He's probably the best in his field. Perhaps you don't know that he's the man who sparked the whole Mars expedition scheme, and he's here to go over the final details for his report to the president with the collaboration of our astronomers. You'd better have him sit in on your deliberations. And who's this Dr. Lassini? asked Holt. What's his line? He's MIT's top notch radio and radar man. Professor Rashley sent him up for indoctrination, and I understand that he's making some preliminary studies for the design of the radio gear for your expedition. Riley opened the door to the next compartment and invited Hansen and Lassini, who were waiting, to come in. Welcome to Lunetta, gentlemen, said he. May I introduce Colonel Holt? He's almost on his way to Mars. You, well, I declare! exclaimed the professor. But it's wonderful luck to find you here! Colonel, we've got so much to talk about that it had better wait until later. Gentlemen, I know that no food is served aboard the Sirius, so let's go into the mess room for breakfast! invited General Riley. Together they made their way along an apparently unending passage which curved upwards before them, although they had no sensation of climbing as they walked. This was the long corridor through which the various compartments of the rim of Lunetta communicated. It was interrupted every sixty feet or so by an airtight door of circular section. These doors permitted any sixty-foot section of the ten composing Lunetta's rim to be hermetically sealed in the event that one of them might spring an air leak. While they were breakfasting, Holt and Hansen decided that they would visit the observatory together. How far is it from Lunetta to the observatory? asked Lassini. It's about ten miles, said Riley. It precedes us in the same orbit. Why so far? Ten miles isn't very far in interstellar space answered Riley. We've found it the best practice to keep all the auxiliary stations of Lunetta pretty far apart for a variety of reasons. For one thing, the orbits are less liable to disturbance by reciprocal attraction, and it also tends to avoid collisions which might result from minor differences in the orbital data of the various auxiliary stations. Each station must be in possession of its own orbital data as the basis for a great variety of purposes. Here in the main station we require them, for example, in order to determine the arrival conditions for the ferries with absolute precision. Our military auxiliaries, which are located at very considerable distances, need their orbital data with extreme exactness for ballistic purposes. And the observatory needs them for astronomical measurement. Would there be any breach of military secrecy if you were to tell me how bombs are dropped from here to the Earth, General? asked Lassini. Of course there are one or two details that are top secret, answered Riley. But the basic principle is quite simple and there's no reason whatever why you shouldn't know it. There are two auxiliary stations flying in our orbit. One of them is 1,935 kilometers ahead and the other 1,935 kilometers astern of us. The one astern is the bomb bay and the one ahead is called the control station. When we bombed the Earth during the war, we really used rocket-powered missiles, which were fired from the bomb bay in the direction opposed to its rotation around the Earth. These missiles are gyro-controlled to maintain their set course during their short period of propulsion. Seen from the Earth, 
the rocket drive decreases the speed of the missile from the 7.07 km per second which it had originally to 6.59 km per second. This throws the missile into an elliptical path, the perigee of which is in the upper strata of the atmosphere after one half another circle around the Earth. The air drag gradually decelerates the missile, the tail of which is equipped with a special braking device. It then penetrates the lower atmospheric strata along a trajectory which is initially flat, but then grows steeper. Finally it falls onto the Earth dot in free flight, the missile requires 9 minutes less than the hour the bomb bay does to half circumnavigate the Earth, in order to reach the perigee of its semi-ellipse. This means that the bomb bay has lagged 26 degrees of arc behind the missile at the moment it enters the atmosphere. Even when it has entered on the decelerated trajectory, it still angularly precedes the Bombay to a small extent. This is because the missile strikes the atmosphere at a considerably higher velocity than that of the Bombay. Hence the control station is located some 3870 km ahead of the Bombay in the same orbit so that the missiles can be easily seen from the control station while they are falling through the atmosphere and may be guided to their targets by radio. The missiles are observed for this purpose with radar or powerful telescopes. It's not hard to understand that there can be no defense against that kind of attack, grunted La Sine. The only effective one would be an attack on the space stations proper. During construction, we mounted quick-firing guns on Lunetu and her auxiliary stations because we always feared attacks from Russian space ships. But we fortunately succeeded in destroying their factories before they could get such ships into action. It wasn't until the war was over that we realized that it had been a matter of nip and tuck. You mentioned telescopes a few moments ago, said La Sine, with which the fall of the bombs was observed. How much detail of the Earth's surface can be recognized through them from as high as 1000 miles? Our new 100-inch reflector has good enough definition to let us distinguish two objects on Earth as little as 40 centimeters apart, answered Riley. Why then, you can make out individual people! exclaimed Lusini in amazement. No question about it. When we began to make observations during the last war, the Navy doubted whether we should be able to distinguish warships. Not only could we distinguish them when weather and visibility were good, but we could make out their class and see the men on their weather decks. That's really incredible. What power do you use? We can magnify up to 1250 diameters. This brings the earth 1250 times as close as it appears to the naked eye, and we can see what goes on there as though we were 4000 feet up instead of 1000 miles. Why can't you step up your magnification? asked Lusini stubbornly. This brought Professor Hansen into the argument. Magnification is limited by the diameter of the telescope reflector, he said. As General Riley just explained, the reflector up here has a resolving power corresponding to a distance of 40 centimeters on Earth. If we were to increase the magnification beyond 1250 diameters, we'd magnify the diffraction patterns around the objects observed. That would simply blur the image without revealing any more detail. We'd have to double the diameter of the reflector in order to increase the resolving power from 40 cm to 20 cm. Then we'd have a telescope as bulky as that on Mount Palomar. We simply haven't the means to produce anything like that, nor to freight it up here. Lusini wanted to know what the effect the atmosphere might have on observations, and Hansen continued. We cannot, of course make any observations on zones covered by bad weather, but there's nothing like as much interference when the weather's good as is suffered by an earthbound astronomical telescope. This interference is quite serious. When you're looking into the heavens from the bottom of our sea of air, that air is both within and immediately before your optical system. Slight irregularities of ambient temperature cause refraction of the light rays very close to your optical system and tend to make the whole image flicker. But if you are looking earthwards from here, any disturbances in the air are far distant. They are practically negligible. Lusini sank into a brown study. After a while, he spoke up. 
when Professor Rashley gave me the first inkling of Operation Mars and asked me to comment on radio communication for the expedition across this wide, interstellar space, I'll have to admit that I thought the whole thing was just a crazy brainstorm. But since I've seen all this and heard the story, I'm getting awfully keen for it. Don't fool yourself, Doctor, it's on its way said Holt. After a glance at his watch, he touched Hansen's shoulder. It's about time we got started towards the observatory. How do you get there? Asked Lassini. Is it in a space suit and with a reaction pistol? No indeed, laughed the general. That's a thing of the past for trips as long as this. Time has brought luxuries. They'll go in one of the busy bees and take off from the rim direct. You don't even have to go back to the central station? Not a bit of it. The busy bee is a little spaceboat and it hangs in a bay on the rim, like a bomb. You get into it just as if you were entering any other compartment if Lunetta. The bee is pressurized by the same system as the hole. You simply close an inner and outer bulkhead door, the pilot pushes a button, and out of the bay you drop by centrifugal force. Once you're away from Lunetta's rim, he starts a little rocket motor and that gives you a push in whatever direction you want to go. So far, it's perfectly clear, marveled Lassini, but I'd like to know how the bee gets back into its nest in the rim. It's not so complicated. Perhaps you noticed that there's a rail running circumferentially around the rim. The bee has a snap hook which is pushed gently against the rail, engaging it in the hook. Since the rim of Lunetu is in rotation, the bee slides along the rail until one of the bays approaches. Shortly before the bay reaches the bee, a wedging action slows up the snap hook in its movement along the rail. This, of course, accelerates the bee in such a manner that its movement is integral with that of the rim at the moment it registers with the opening of the bay. This automatically closes an electric circuit which, by a suitable mechanism, pulls the bee into the bay. At the top of the bay is an automatic hermetic sealing device which connects the interior of the bee with that of Lunetu again. So, only two doors need be opened to get back into the rim of Lunetta. What an amazing gadget! mused Lassini. But, General, that sort of thing must eventually slow down Lunetta's rotation. Certainly it does. But just imagine how great the effect must be of such things as the landing of something as massive as the Sirius-L that not only affects our RPM and our planes of rotation, but it even does things to our orbit around the Earth, to some extent. How do you compensate for that? Asked Lassini. We have a couple of swiveling rocket motors on the periphery of Lunetu and a couple more at opposite ends of the control station. When our prescribed rate or plane of rotation varies beyond certain limits, or we get somewhat out of orbit, all we have to do is to start these motors for a short time and restore our rates. Tell me, said Lassini, does the gravitation of the moon affect Lunetta's orbit deleteriously? Yes indeed, it's a very considerable factor in the corrections we have to make. As you know, the moon and the sun produce marked phenomena even on earth by their gravitational effects, flood and ebb tides for example. They affect our orbit quite unpleasantly, particularly because the moon circles the earth in the plane of the ecliptic whereas our orbit is at right angles to that plane. It seems to me that these corrections must cost quite a lot of propellants, and you have to freight them up gallon for gallon. That's right, doctor. But it isn't so bad, practically. We just steal a bit of the propellants from the ferry ships. Ships like the Sirius always, or almost always, have a full eight tons more propellants in their tanks than they require for the return trip to Earth. They all carry it, just in case. Well, we simply tap off the excess and keep up our supply in that way. It's not a complicated procedure. We have permanent hose connections at the mooring cone in the control station. The storage tanks are right under the walkways in the rim of Lunetta. All we have to do is to connect up, open a valve, and the propellants flow into the tanks by centrifugal force. The same stuff is used to drive the busy bees. But I think, gentlemen, it's about time to get moving. How about my taking Dr. Lassini to our radio station? 
Later you can have a quiet talk with our meteorologists. They report weather back to Earth every two hours and can give you much data on interference by weather, night effects and magnetic storms on our radio communications. Colonel Holt and Professor Hansen might as well go right to the busy bee and take off for the observatory. Minus zero, the inside of the busy bee was fitted out almost like an automobile. The pilot sat in the left front seat behind a steering wheel but steering pedals like those of an aircraft replaced the familiar accelerator and clutch. The controls operated like those of an aircraft in that the bee could be controlled around its longitudinal axis by turning the wheel, while forward and backward movements of the wheel lowered or raised the nose. To the right or left it was directed by the pedals. These controls were connected to a swiveling rocket motor in the tail, except for those affected by the turning of the steering wheel. That movement displaced a pair of vanes located in the jet exhaust of the motor. The bee was also provided with another rocket motor in its nose, coupled to the same controls. Both motors were actuated by a single throttle from the center of the instrument panel. Pushing the handle of the throttle forward started the rear motor, while pulling it back from neutral gave thrust to the front one, after stopping the rear. Thus the bee could be accelerated ahead or retarded at will. Neither motor operated with the throttle in neutral. There were but two instruments on the panel. One showed acceleration and deceleration. The other was one of the so-called integrators that had for many years been part and parcel of rocketry. It indicated the relative velocity attained by the rocket drivers referred to some predetermined moment at which the integrator had been cut in. The outside of the busy bee suggested a cylindrical drum one side of which consisted of dark tinted glass. Bees were exclusively for operation in space, outside the atmosphere, and hence needed neither streamlining nor stabilizing fins, such as are required by terrestrial rockets. The method of pressurizing the interior was similar to that used in submarines. Holt and Hansen strapped themselves into the rear seats and the release allowed the bee to be flung out of its bay. The pilot pressed the throttle forward for a short period, after which the familiar weightlessness, which they had no longer felt while within the rim of Lunetta, re-established itself. They remained in their seats only by reason of their safety belts. Over the pilot's shoulder they could see a tiny, shimmering disk which floated in space a few miles ahead. See the observatory? Asked Holt. It's still about eight miles away according to my guess. We're making about 60 miles an hour with respect to Lunetta and we're approaching the observatory along an ellipsoidal path. If my guess is right, we ought to be there in about 8 minutes. As an astronomer, I ought to understand that, said Hansen, but there's a thing about these big trips that puzzles me. Our additional speed of 60 miles per hour above Lunetta's ought to increase our centrifugal force to keep the forces exactly balanced. On the other hand, the observatory precedes Lunetta exactly in her orbit. So it seems we might pass outside the observatory. It's a good question, answered Holt. Perhaps you didn't notice that we did not increase our speed exactly tangent to the Lunetta orbit, but slightly on a chord line dipped towards Earth. We'll reach the perigee midpoint of our coasting flight and intersect the Lunetta orbit near the observatory. I understand, said Hansen. But don't we have to compute our flight very accurately in advance so that we shall really hit the observatory and not go wandering off into space somewhere? I am always amazed when we get into these bees without any preparation whatever and push off into nothingness. It doesn't seem to be any different from getting into the car and driving to the market. Why, there isn't even any traffic problem. Professor, you must remember that this is really a very short trip. Space navigation isn't so very different from water navigation. For a transatlantic journey, it's a good idea to do a lot of calculation before you get underway, and to plot your course on the chart. But you don't go to all that trouble to row across a pond. Our lads up here have soaked up Kepler's laws pretty thoroughly, and these little ferry trips are duck soup to them. Hansen still wasn't satisfied. How about the 2000 km jaunt to the two military stations about which Riley spoke, even if they are in the same orbit? Is that kind of ferry trip just row across a pond, too? 
or is 2,000 kilometers considered quite a respectable ocean voyage? Oh, that's an ocean voyage all right, laughed Holt. Ferry trips to those stations call for an entirely different brand of navigation from that used on this little hop. A busy bean route from Lunetta to the control station ahead of Lunetta reduces its orbital velocity by about 140 meters per second. This puts it into an elliptical orbit, the perigee of which is only 1,266 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Of course, that's still high enough to keep it clear of the atmosphere's upper limits. When the bee enters upon the second branch of this ellipse, it is again heading for Lunetta's orbit, which it intercepts after a full revolution around the Earth. But this elliptical path is, when averaged, somewhat closer to the center of the Earth than the orbit of Lunetta and her auxiliaries, and according to Kepler's laws, the time the bee takes to circle the Earth is somewhat shorter than that taken by Lunetta and company. For a trip to the control station, the bee's ellipse is selected so as to require exactly 274 seconds less than the two hours that Lunetta requires for a complete encirclement. Thus the busy bee contacting Lunetta's orbit after a complete encirclement of the Earth, is at the exact point to intercept the control station, 1935 kilometers ahead of Lunetta. Then the bee must perform an adaptation maneuver, exactly like the one we experienced aboard the Sirius, in order to bring its velocity up by 140 meters per second, the amount required to equal the orbital velocity or the station. The principle used to reach the Bombay trailing the main station is identical. Only, in this case, a complete ellipse is used which, rather than approach the Earth, becomes more distant from it. This causes the time of encirclement of the Earth to become somewhat longer than that in Lunetta's orbit, so that the bee intercepts the trailing Bombay this time. As Holt finished his explanation. They could see the enormous sickle-like arc of the Earth ahead of them and to the left. Despite the fact that their bee was bathed in the brightest sunlight, the Earth below them was still wrapped in darkness. So brilliant was the illumination of what they might well have referred to as the crescent Earth that the eagle make out no contrasts where the light fell. Halt through a glance at his watch. We ought to be passing over Alaska in a moment, said he. Did you say Alaska? asked Hansen incredulously. Sure, Alaska. We ought to be right over the northeast Aleutians, headed for Anchorage, Alaska. Look, it's just 23.30, Hawaiian time. Two hours and fifteen minutes ago is just about when we started from Kilui. In the meantime, Lunetta's been around the world once, and a little more, but at the same time. The Earth's rotated to the eastward some 34 degrees. Hansen looked puzzled. I may be an astronomer, said he, but you'll have to go a little deeper into that one. Here's the way it is, the Earth rotates once every 24 hours, 360 degrees, that's 30 degrees for every bi-hourly encirclement by Lunetta. Lunetta makes 12 encirclements every 24 hours. If these were projected onto the Earth, they would make a spiral tracing across the Earth's whole surface between the Arctic and Antarctic circles. That's the joker in the military omnipresence of Lunetta. Lunetta will not be right over Kilui until some twelve hours after her last transit, and then she won't be moving on a northeasterly course as she was when we took off, but on a southeasterly one. Due to that, I cannot land back in Kilui until about 12 hours after leaving there. But speaking of Alaska, it's mostly heavily clouded over in this region. The sharp illumination you see on the Earth is only the reflection from the upper surfaces of the clouds. And did you notice that we were flying for almost an hour through the umbra of the Earth when we were breakfasting with Riley? Now the sun's ahead of us once more, so we'll have daylight for the next hour. The busy bee had approached within about a half mile of the observatory, and what had seemed to be a glittering little disc was now a silver sphere with a number of circular portholes. As they drew closer, there was another detail that heretofore had remained invisible against the sepia, star-spangled sky. This was a cylindrical object, apparently of latticework construction. It floated free in space 
connected to the sphere only by a cable. So that's the 100 inch reflector, said Holt. When I was stationed in Lunetta we had a dinky, little 60 incher out here. It was a pretty primitive gadget for some of the work. This is really a wonderful instrument, said Hansen. Optically it's far more efficient than the old 60 incher and it's got a lot of other improvements. You'll notice that the scope is wholly detached from the observatory proper. We made this arrangement to avoid any shocks to the reflector from people moving in the observatory. With the integrally mounted 60 inch job, we had to keep the whole crew absolutely quiet and even shut off the blower during an observation. If we didn't, the image would flicker. Where's the seat for the observer in this case? asked Holt. When an observation is being made, he's in a small cylindrical chamber that moves from the observatory to the scope. It has room for two observers and the necessary photographic and spectroscopic equipment. It has a small rocket plant like a bee. The chamber slips into guides attached to the scope so that the eyepiece, which is integral with one of the walls, registers properly and accurately with the optical axis. The observer simply replaces the eyepiece with a camera for photographic work. Having the scope and the observatory separate seems to me tremendously involved, remarked Holt. Look, Colonel, answered Hansen. On Earth we are forced to keep our telescope foundations entirely separate from many other buildings or structures to avoid the transmission of vibrations. We have no heavy foundations here in space and our scope would vibrate fearfully if we didn't isolate it from any possible movement of the observatory. As you know, stellar observatories on the Earth require complicated suspension systems for their telescopes, and these suspensions are made to follow the apparent movements of the heavens by clockwork or electric drives. No such mechanisms are needed up here in space. When the observer seated in his tank has secured a ladder to the telescope frame, he can turn the whole business in any desired direction by means of three electrically driven flywheels, and keep it pointed steadily at its object in the same way. The principle's simple enough. You know Newton's law that to every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. So, if we start a wheel attached to a free-floating object in space turning clockwise, it exerts a rotating moment of equal power and makes the object rotate counterclockwise. If the wheel is much smaller than the object to which it is attached, it will, of course have to turn quite a number of times before the object proper makes one full turn in the opposite direction. Nevertheless, you can turn a body of considerable dimensions, when free floating in space, with a relatively small, high speed, electrically driven flywheel or disc. That is, if no very rapid rotation of the body itself is required. Our telescope here is equipped with three such inertia discs whose axes are at right angles to one another. This permits it to be turned arbitrarily to any angle in space and to be maintained there. We use the same principle in our spaceships, said Holt, to bring them to the proper heading for their various maneuvers. But look, we are making fast. The pilot of the busy bee had cut in his decelerating motor and skillfully aimed his craft at the opening in a cylindrical shaft that protruded from the great, round ball in a radial direction. The bee slipped into a set of three guide rails which diverged somewhat at their outer ends. There was a slight clicking sound and the light was blocked off from the great windows. The bee came to a stop with a slight jarring deceleration.0, the pilot rose and opened the circular door just above their heads. This was followed by the opening of a second door just above it in which the face of a blonde youth appeared. Well, Bergman, I'm glad to see you! exclaimed Hansen. Good morning, Professor. It's good to see you up here with us again. We've a lot of new stuff for you. And you must be Colonel Holt, aren't you? Right. Glad to know you. Since weightless conditions prevailed in the non-rotating sphere of the observatory, they drew themselves hand over hand along a rod which was axially located in the spherical chamber. It led to a room with circular walls which represented the middle floor of the observatory. This room was filled with all sorts of measurement gear and electrical switchboards, 
and gave the appearance of being a laboratory for electrical experiments. At one side of it, there was an oblong table with a few low chairs near it. Dr. Bergman introduced two of his youthful co workers, and then they drew themselves down onto the chairs and donned the belts which were necessary to hold them. The dot on the table before them lay various documents and pictures which were carefully held onto the surface of the table by steel clamps. This was to prevent their drifting about the room as a result of their weightlessness. Bergman drew a large, colored photograph from a folder with the statement that it had been made but one week earlier and that it was the best one achieved so far. On this picture, the image of the planet Mars appeared about a foot in diameter. Of a raw whiteness, the famed South Polar Cap of Mars stood out in the upper part of the picture. Below it and dull bluish green in color was a large, similarly shaped area, the Mare Austral. As the eye moved towards the Martian equator, the picture became more confused. There were sharply rimmed spots and indefinitely outlined zones of all shadings from reddish brown to dark yellow, alternating with greenish blue to grayish blue areas. But throughout the whole region there ran a series of fine, dark green lines gracefully curved and following the vaulted shape of the Martian globe. These were the famous and controversial Martian canals. The contrasts on the face of the disk were much paler near the edges. It was apparent that the light at these points had had to travel a much greater distance through the atmosphere of Mars than elsewhere before emerging into interstellar space. This gave an almost plastic and stereoscopic aspect to the photograph. Holt regarded the image silently and reverentially for a long time, unable to conceal the emotional impact of his thoughts. Finally, he spoke. It is really a second Earth. But what a mysterious, strange one. The continents float in no oceans. There are no rainy zones, shrouded in cloud. But the view of this picture leaves us almost no room to doubt the existence of intelligent inhabitants. No photograph of this size made from Earth would reveal such obvious testimony of the workings of intelligence. You're a member of the planning staff of Operation Mars, are you not, Colonel? asked Bergman when Holt had again fallen silent. Colonel Holt will have command of the expedition. Interrupted Hansen solemnly. The young astronomer's present looked upon Holt with surprise followed by joyous enthusiasm. Their questions poured over him in a torrent which lasted until he had answered every one. When it was over, Hansen spoke again. Dr. Bergman. Please tell Colonel Holt briefly the essential things which we know about Mars in relation to their importance to the expedition. Do not forget any aids to observation and methods of measurement which we have available. We propose to discuss an all-embracing new work plan in relation to what you will have reported. Chapter 4 Let's talk about Mars Dr. Bergman began his exposition. Mars is the fourth of the nine major planets of the Sunday the orbits of Mercury. Venus and Earth lie closer to the Sun than its orbit, while those of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune and Pluto lie outside of it. The elliptical orbit of Mars around the Sun is of considerably greater eccentricity than that of the Earth. At perihelion, when Mars most closely approaches the Sun, it is 206 million kilometers away from it, at aphelion, however, the distance is 249 million kilometers. Hence its mean distance is 228 million kilometers. The Earth, whose orbit is nearly circular, has a mean distance of 149 v 2 million kilometers from the Sun. Day the Earth's aphelion and perihelion differ from this mean distance by but 5 million kilometers, roughly. The orbit of Mars lies in a plane at an angle of 1 degree and 51 minutes of arc to the plane of the ecliptic which means that Mars and the Earth rotate around the Sun almost in the same plane. Mars requires about 687 Earth days for a full revolution around the Sun, and this may be considered as a Martian year. Mars rotates around its own axis once in every 24 hours, 37 minutes and 22.7 seconds, making the Martian day only slightly longer than the Earth day so that the Martian year has 569.6 Martian days. The rotational axis of Mars is inclined to the plane of its orbit by 24 degrees, 
which is very close to the inclination of the Earth's axis to her orbit, namely 23.5 degrees. This gives Mars seasons like those of the Earth. The diameter of Mars at the equator is 6,780 kilometers, while when measured along the polar axis, it is 35 kilometers shorter. This is a little more than half the diameter of Earth. The mean density of the planet is only 72% of that of the Earth. Its mass is proven to be approximately one-tenth of that of the Earth, within close limits. These figures yield an acceleration due to gravity at the surface of Mars as equivalent to only 38% of that of the Earth, or 0.38 grams. Mars has two very small moons, Phobos and Deimos. Phobos is very close to its mother planet, its mean distance from the center of Mars being equivalent to only 2.77 radii of Mars. It circles the planet in 7 hours, 39 minutes and 14 seconds, doing so several times a day, somewhat similar to Lunetta circling the Earth. Viewed from the surface of Mars, it would rise in the west and set in the east. Its orbit is noticeably eccentric. Apparently its diameter is but a few kilometers. The other moon, Deimos, lies at a distance from Mars of a scant 7 radii of the latter and requires about 30 hours and 18 minutes to encircle it. We estimate its diameter at 10 kilometers and its orbit is circular within close limits. Holt was making careful notes, but at this moment he glanced up. What are the planes of the Phobos and Deimos orbits? He asked. Both of them are, with great accuracy in the plane of the equator of Mars, answered Bergman. Thanks, but now what about the atmosphere of Mars, the climate and the general nature of the surface? I'd like to get some idea of conditions which we're apt to meet when we make a landing there. Certainly, Colonel. It is well proven that Mars has an atmosphere, although it's considerably less dense than that of the Earth. Once in a while, the formation of clouds has been noted. As to the surface, its formations are very clearly shown, particularly in infrared photography. At times, however, these formations are covered by some sort of diffuse white or yellow layer which registers particularly on ultraviolet photographs. Such layers must be considered cloud formations, and we take the white ones for water vapor and the yellow ones for sand clouds in all probability, whirled up by powerful storm conditions. Clouds containing water vapor must of necessity be present, in order to explain the regular appearance of snowfalls in the polar regions in winter, and the occasional snowfalls in the temperate zones. There's no other possible explanation for regions of hundreds of thousands, or even millions, of square miles being concealed, sometimes in a very brief period, by a blinding white layer. The borders of the polar snow caps also are frequently surrounded by a veil of clouds. We are inclined to interpret this veil as fog banks, developing over regions where snow is beginning to melt, rather than as clouds in the conventional sense. These fog banks develop in the cold Martian nights. Generally they are gone by noon. What is your guess for the atmospheric pressure on Mars? Asked Holt. A mercury barometer at sea level on Earth reads 760 mm where a corresponding one on Mars would read only 64 mm, if we've estimated correctly. That's only one twelfth of the terrestrial atmospheric pressure at sea level. Confound it! That means we'll have to wear pressure suits and employ artificial respiration on Mars. There's no doubt of it, Colonel. Surface atmospheric pressure will be equivalent to that at 60,000 feet above the Earth. Then I imagine that the Martian atmosphere isn't nearly so lofty as that of Earth? Asked Holt. You might be a little careful about that deduction, said Bergman. Remember that increase of pressure at the lower altitudes of the terrestrial atmosphere is caused by terrestrial gravitation. The pressure is higher at low altitudes because the lower we descend the heavier is the column of air above us. Now the acceleration of gravity on Mars is but 38% of ours on Earth. So any column of Martian air of equivalent mass would press upon the air below it with only 38% of the weight with which it would do so upon Earth. 
consequently increase in density of Martian air with diminishing altitude necessarily takes place more slowly that upon Earth. Putting it another way, we can say that decrease of barometric pressure with increasing altitude takes place more slowly than at home. Expressed in figures, the atmospheric pressure of the terrestrial atmosphere decreases by a power of 10 for every 18 kilometers of altitude, that is to say that ground level pressure is reduced at 18 kilometers altitude to a tenth, at 36 kilometers to one ten thousandth of an atmosphere. But on Mars, the pressure decreases by a power of 10 only every 47 kilometers by reason of the weaker field of gravity. So, if we have but a twelfth of our terrestrial pressure at the surface, we shall have one hundred and twentieth of that pressure at forty-seven kilometers, one twelve hundredth at ninety-four kilometers. Do you mean that at ninety-four kilometers above the surface of Mars, the atmospheric pressure is higher than it is seventy-two kilometers above the Earth? Asked Holt incredulously. That's what it is, strange as it may sound. It's got to be that way according to the inviolable laws of physics. Mars' weaker gravitational field just isn't able to compress its atmosphere to such a thin layer as the Earth's can do. Besides, we have visible proof that the Martian atmosphere must have just such a gradual pressure stratification, for we did some measurement on the clouds of Mars and found them to be at least 20 miles high. What's that? exclaimed Holt. Do you mean that you can actually measure the cloud ceiling on Mars? Surely, said Bergman quietly. It isn't even very difficult. Every now and then we observe luminous spots at the so-called Terminator, the borderline between night and day on the planet. These spots remain luminescent when night has already fallen below them at the surface. Those spots are high-altitude clouds and their height above the surface is calculated quite easily by their distance from the terminator at the time they occurred. Well, that's most interesting. But what actually leads you to the conclusion that the pressure at the surface of Mars is one twelfth of that of the Earth? I can understand that the potency of the Martian field of gravitation throws light on the ratio of stratification of its atmospheric shell. But where do we get the absolute pressures themselves? Bergman went on. That's a bit more complicated. But there are several independent methods by which we determine these values, and their results correlate pretty well. Initially, all these methods give us only the entire mass of a column of air pressing upon a unit of area on the surface of Mars. The law of stratification already referred to then gives us the ground pressure. One of those methods is spectral analysis. Another comes via the reflective capacity of the surface of Mars, known as the albedo to astronomers. Perhaps you'd like to hear a more accurate description of this latter method. The albedo is the reflected percentage of the radiant energy of the entire visible region of the Sun's spectrum intercepted by a planet. In the case of Mars, this is 27%. Now, we know from comparisons with similar objects on Earth that the rare radiation of the Martian desert areas, vegetated regions and snow fields accounts for only 10% thereof. Hence the remaining 17% must be accounted for by the rare radiation of its practically cloudless atmosphere, which reflects 74% of what it receives. So we perceived that the albedo of the atmosphere of Mars is to that of a cloudless terrestrial atmosphere as 17 is to 74, or about 2 to 9. Let us now assume that the total mass of a cloudless shell of air increases in the same ratio as its power of rare radiation. That should be approximately correct, because the power of rare radiation is largely determined by particles suspended in the atmosphere, and the ability of the air to keep such particles in suspension increases as its total number of molecules increases. This leads us to the conclusion that Mars has an air mass above each square inch of surface equal to two-ninths of that resting upon the same area on Earth. If we substitute this mass of air in the law of pressure stratification to which I referred, we arrive at a pressure at ground level of one-twelfth of an atmosphere. Holt smiled. It seems to me that you go all the way around Robin Hood's barn to reach that conclusion, but I suppose you know how much faith to put in it. In view of the importance to our enterprise of the structure of Mars' atmosphere, 
I almost think that those revelations, as I may well call them, urgently need a much more solid underpinning. No doubt, Colonel. Recently we've been trying to find the atmospheric pressure at ground level by another method, which might be called meteorological. We've set up a ratio between the presumptive air temperature and humidity of a certain section of the Martian atmosphere and the pressure. Using this ratio and the laws of meteorology, we have arrived at the atmospheric pressure at which clouds ought to form. We compare the results with the actually measured cloud height and postulated the computed pressure as existing at this height. By applying the law of pressure stratification, we computed the pressure at ground level as 79 millimeters of mercury. This is only slightly higher than the pressure obtained by the Albedo method. Spectroanalytic results are perhaps the least reliable, because of the technical difficulties attending measurements, but they also are not far from this figure. You should be able to get data on the chemical composition of the Martian atmosphere by spectral analysis, said Holt. Do you have anything definite on that subject? So far our efforts along that line have produced reliable results for two components only, namely carbonic acid and water vapor. We're very certain that there is nitrogen, even though the latter is difficult to detect spectroscopically. We also have reason to believe there's a good deal of argon in Mars atmosphere. There's difference of opinion as to the oxygen content, some observers insisting that they have proved that it exists. But if, indeed, oxygen is actually present, the quantity is considerably less than on Earth, even percentage-wise. This remark brought a profound question from Holt. On what do you predicate vegetation and animal life? if the oxygen content is so low that it cannot even be definitely traced? He asked. There isn't the slightest doubt that plant life exists, and the botanists consider it well within the realm of credibility that Martian plants may live within a sort of internal oxygen atmosphere. A plant applies photosynthesis in order to live, and generates new oxygen in the process, although it does require a certain amount of oxygen for recycling. If we assume that such a plant can store oxygen within its system, there's no reason why it cannot do without any free oxygen in the surrounding atmosphere. Now as to animal life. The answer doesn't come quite so easily. Animals, in the ordinary sense of the word, cannot live without oxygen. Nature, however, discovers the most extraordinarily manifold methods of providing animals with oxygen, even on Earth. Fish, for example, attract oxygen from the water through their gills. Monocellular organisms absorb oxygen through their exterior membranes, just as they do their food. Why shouldn't a Martian animal get its oxygen by eating plants which have stored oxygen produced by photosynthesis? It would, of course, demand that the lungs be more intimately connected with the digestive organs than are our own. Should you think this hypothesis a little far-fetched? There are other plausible explanations. Take, for example, the condition of symbiosis, which is quite familiar in natural history. Here animals and plants are able to survive jointly under conditions which would be fatal to either party alone. Corals, which are fauna rather than flora, are a case in point. We know that the oxygen content of the water within an extensive bank of coral is far too low to sustain life in the coral creatures inhabiting it. So nature simply grows oxygen producing algae throughout the coral bank. Thus it's quite reasonable to assume that Martian animals may live with oxygen generating plants in some analogous symbiosis. We do have animals on earth which require no oxygen at all to remain alive. Intestinal parasites such as tapeworms, are typical of this class. Instead of relying on the chemical process of oxidation as do most other animals, they use fermentation to obtain the energy essential for the maintenance of life. Fermentation is the dissociation of sugar into alcohol and carbon dioxide, which is the process that transforms grape juice into wine or champagne. Fermentation, like oxidation, generates heat. Intestinal parasites exist amid a superfluity of sugar. They are beautifully protected against temperature variations by the bodies of their hosts, so they live extremely contentedly by fermentation without any oxygen whatsoever. 
Lest you think this example somewhat depraved, I employ it only to bring out nature's inventiveness in finding ways and means for making life possible in the most inhospitable places. Well, said Holt reflectively, it begins to look as though we might indeed be sticking our noses into a very strange world in this Mars business. But tapeworms or no tapeworms, what about the climate? The average temperature throughout the year on Mars is somewhat lower than it is on Earth because of Mars' greater distance from the Sun, naturally. Nonetheless, it is not so low as this distance might lead one to expect. One of the most important reasons for this is the relatively low albedo of Mars, 60% of the total energy radiated to the planet from the Sun strikes the surface and is absorbed, in this case, not only the light radiation, but also the heat radiation. Then, too, there's little doubt that clouds form soon after sundown, preventing any very strong nocturnal radiation. This cloud formation is doubtless due to the rapid cooling of the air after nightfall and the low atmospheric pressure. But the clouds quickly disperse when the sun returns in the morning. Thus the mean yearly temperature on Mars is explained as being some 48 degrees Fahrenheit, versus about 60 degrees on Earth. The atmosphere of Mars is so thin that the temperature contrasts between day and ensuing night are very marked. This also applies to variations between seasons and latitudes. Such manifestations are familiar to us on Earth in regions of high mountains. On Mars, in regions where the sun's rays fall vertically at noon, the early morning temperatures will be on the order on minus 20 degrees Celsius. These temperatures will rise to around plus 30 degrees Celsius at noon, and then decline to approximately zero near nightfall. We must anticipate temperatures of more than 100 degrees below zero in the polar regions in winter, when the sun remains below the horizon for months, as it does in our own polar regions. During the polar summer, when the sun doesn't set at all, the temperature rises considerably above freezing. Otherwise the almost complete melting of the polar snow caps during this season would find no explanation. Here Holt interrupted once more. How do you explain that the melting of the polar snow caps in summer is so extensive? Our terrestrial snow caps don't do that, despite the fact that the mean temperatures there are markedly higher than those on Mars. That's a mighty good question, Colonel. It is explained both by the nature of the Martian atmosphere and by the length of the year on that planet. Our spectroscopic determinations lead us to estimate that the average water vapor content of the Martian atmosphere is very low, not more than about 5% of that of the Earth's air. This low percentage is easily understandable in view of there being no oceans or large lakes from which quantities of water may rise into the atmosphere. The extreme thinness of the latter stimulates the evaporation of moisture from vegetation zones. The relatively cool air becomes saturated after absorbing small amounts of moisture, however, and this means naturally that any air reaching the polar regions will carry lesser amounts of water with it. Here it will be cooled down to extremely low temperatures in winter, and will precipitate its water down to extremely low moisture contents. That is to say, it will precipitate its low moisture content considerably more completely than the Earth's atmosphere will. If we balance these conditions against one another, we're in all probability correctly concluding that the daily precipitation during the winter months in the polar regions is noticeably less than that in those regions on Earth. Conversely, we shouldn't forget that a Martian summer is nearly twice as long as ours, on account of the length of the Martian year. There's much more time available for solar rays to melt the snow of the Martian polar regions. These two effects explain the fact that the Martian poles have never formed such thick ice and snow caps as those of Earth. It is noteworthy that summer at the South Pole of Mars is generally considerably warmer, although shorter than at the North Pole. This is related to the pronounced eccentricity of the planet's orbit. During summer at the South Pole, Mars is near perihelion and closer to the Sun by 43 million kilometers than six Martian months later when it is summer at the North Pole. It is at perihelion that Mars reaches its highest orbital velocity, being closest to the Sunday thus summer in the Southern Hemisphere, is considerably shorter than in the Northern, 
being only 158 days against 183. What's the size of the polar caps in winter? inquired Holt. They're largest towards spring. The south polar cap extends as far as about the 42nd degree of latitude at this time, having a diameter of almost 5,700 kilometers. It shrinks gradually throughout the short but relatively hot summer, and usually disappears completely before fall. The cap at the North Pole does not grow quite so large. Due to the winter being shorter, the amount of snow falling there is obviously somewhat less. The snow at the end of winter doesn't usually go beyond the 51st parallel of latitude. In late summer, this snow doesn't, as a rule, melt entirely due to the northern summer being cooler, though somewhat longer. It then shows as a small, white spot around the North Pole, reaching down to around the 87th parallel of latitude. What is your general concept of the total amount of water on Mars? asked Holt. This must have an important bearing on the vegetative regions and the canals. We've attacked that problem from various angles, answered Bergman. The most attractive one seems to be related to the probable amount of snow in the polar regions. Our approach is as follows, on Earth, the sun is capable of melting about 6 meters of snow during the 4 months of summer at and around the poles. Now Mars is more distant from the sun and therefore receives less solar heat. On the other hand, however, its atmosphere irradiates a much smaller amount of this heat, so that a greater proportion reaches the surface. Furthermore, the Martian summer is about twice as long as ours. It is hence reasonable to assume that the sun probably melts about 6 meters of snow depth on Mars also. Since by the end of the summer the snow on the polar caps is gone, we may conclude that the mean depth of snow at the polar regions is likewise 6 meters at the end of a winter. 6 meters of snow is equivalent to 60 centimeters of water, and at its maximum extension, the southern polar cap covers about 24 million square kilometers. From this we compute about 14 million millions of cubic meters of water. That's about 20 times the volume of Lake Erie, or a 100,000th of the water in our terrestrial oceans. You might quite properly object that our assumptions concerning the depth of the snow caps are pretty arbitrary and that the quantity of water might well be one half of our estimated value. We won't take exception to that. An additional consideration is the fact that vegetative areas near the northerly latitudes are seen to be flowering and green when the south polar cap is largest. So we're sure that by no means all the water on Mars collects in the form of one polar snow cap or the other during the winter in either hemisphere. My figures were intended to approximate the order of magnitude of the water on Mars. Just think, it's only 100,000th of Earth's water supply although the surface of the Earth is only about three and a half times greater than that of Mars. Makes it a pretty dry planet, doesn't it? Well, that figure alone, no matter how much you may question it, shows pretty plainly how arid Mars has become. What makes you think that Mars once was wetter? inquired Holt. The huge zones of vegetation, particularly those in the southern hemisphere seem, for many and various reasons, to have been oceanic basins. The earlier astronomers even named them there because they thought that they were actually lakes. Today we know that open water bodies of any such size are unimaginable in view of the low atmospheric pressure of Mars, why, they'd evaporate in no time. What happened to the prehistoric Martian oceans and lakes is in prospect for our own, incidentally. We can follow on Earth the long process of their shrinkage through the various geological ages, and even through the short span of human history. Rome, for example, was a seaside town when the Republic flourished, but since then the ocean has receded and Rome lies many miles inland. We find fossilized fish in all sorts of places in the mountains and deserts of the southwest states of America. These leave no doubt that large portions of the American continent were underwater and only emerged by reason of the sinking of the oceans and inland lakes. 
The Great Salt Lake of Utah is a tiny remnant of the prehistoric Lake Bonneville, and even now its level is dropping at a rate which can be measured year by year. Planetary water loss is irrevocable and pitiless. On one side, the water sinks into the crevices of the solid crust. These crevices continue to gape open as long as the incandescent interior is undergoing a cooling process and shrinking. On the other hand, water evaporates into the air. This process becomes more rapid as the atmosphere is dissipated and its pressure drops. What's that about the atmosphere dissipating? Asked Holt curiously. Bergman went on coolly, the molecules of the air are in motion, irregular and uncoordinated. Because they continuously collide, some of them may attain velocities sufficient to overcome gravity and thus escape from the atmosphere into the void. In the case of the Earth, this velocity of escape for a molecule must be not less than 6.9 miles per second, but on Mars, where gravity is much less potent, 3.1 miles per second suffices. Those two figures clearly show that the Martian atmosphere must have dissipated much more rapidly than that of the Earth. It's pretty safe to assume that there must have been about two-fifths as much air over every square inch of Mars as there is over a square inch on Earth. That's plain from a very simple computation. But, as I said, the amount now present is only two-ninths, and the difference is presumably that portion which has been dissipated. Now tell me, Doctor said Holt, if that much of the Martian atmosphere has been dissipated already, where is the moisture, the water vapor, which the air has absorbed from the evaporation of the erstwhile oceans? Did that fly out into space too? Only a very small part of it, answered Bergman. Molecules can escape from the upper strata of the atmosphere only in these strata are necessarily very dry. The major portion of the water vapor must have combined its oxygen with the soil. For many millions of years, some moisture was precipitated on every cold Martian night in the form of dew, oxidizing the metals present in the soil. This splits off the hydrogen, permitting it to rise into the upper atmosphere, from whence it dissipated gradually. We suspect, said Bergman, with a gesture towards the photograph that this reddish coloration of the Martian desert stems mainly from ferrous oxides which were thus formed at the expense of the oceans. Looking at this photograph, said Holt, I find the great contrasts in coloration particularly striking. What conclusions do you draw from them? Well, said Bergman, taking a deep breath, the reddish-brown, ochre-yellow, and orange zones are doubtless arid desert but their coloration must be much affected by the position of the sun, and they may therefore be somewhat subjective in every picture. Of course, we cannot tell what individual types of minerals make up the whole. If you contemplate taking a geologist along on your expedition to Mars, it ought to be a fascinating problem for him to examine the formations. Perhaps he'd find remnants of sea animals in the dried up ocean beds or maybe extensive salt deposits in the sinks where the last drops of the oceans lay. We're certain that he could do much to complete and supplement the theories we've built up on Mars development. Now, it is our belief that the greenish zones represent vegetation. These tend to appear primarily around the polar caps at the time the melt begins. It is extremely impressive how the canals grow toward the equator out of these green melting regions with water from the melted snow or ice. The artificiality of these canals is attested to by the fact that all canals hitherto known to us run in great circles across the surface of the planet, thus automatically achieving the shortest distance between the ends of any one canal. This alone lends considerable credence to the attestation, but the green areas at canal junctions, which are usually circular, tend to confirm it. My dear Dr. Bergman, remarked Holt seriously as he put down the photograph, you must know that the project before us is a very major one. We cannot possibly base our plans upon hypotheses and guesses, no matter how plausible they may be. We can only use clear, definite facts and results of such measurement as is entirely beyond doubt. These we must have. No effort must be spared to collect every bit of confirmed data available here. 
our entire project can be endangered by a single erroneous conclusion or a set of figures which is not absolutely correct. Anything like that would distort the groundwork of our planning. Your dissertation was of immense interest to me and what you have said will be very useful. But I want to suggest that we drop any further attempts to line up further theories about the Martian civilization and what it may have created. It would be very kind of you to tell me something about the methods of observation and measurement that you have been using. You might also make a few suggestions about how to improve these methods, with respect to what we can do to perfect our applicable knowledge. At this point Professor Hansen broke in. We'll use this observatory as the main tool for all future work on Mars, he said. I don't believe that we can use anything from the terrestrial observatories henceforward. Perhaps Dr. Bergman will tell the Colonel why observations and measurements from here are so much better and more promising. Minus zero, I'll begin by citing an example, continued Bergman. Let's take the composition of the Martian atmosphere. Spectroanalysis is the only method astronomy has for finding this composition. All the light coming from a planet is reflected sunlight which has traversed the planet's atmosphere twice, once when it strikes the planet's surface, and a second time when it is reflected back into space. The gases of which the atmosphere is composed produce certain characteristic dark lines in the planet's spectrum. The latter is otherwise a pure solar spectrum. This happens because every gas has the characteristic of absorbing light waves of certain quite definite frequencies. We can deduce what gases are present in the planet's atmosphere from the frequencies corresponding to certain dark lines in the spectrum, known as absorption lines. Now, when light must pass through the Earth's atmosphere before entering a telescope, black lines originating in the Earth's atmosphere superimpose themselves upon the other black lines. Let's take carbon dioxide and water vapor, for example. They are found in the atmospheres of both Mars and Earth. Therefore those lines which are caused by the carbon dioxide on Mars are superimposed on those caused by the carbon dioxide on Earth, and the same thing applies to water vapor, since the lines lie at very definite places in the spectrum. This dilemma is circumvented by photographing Mars spectrum at a time when the two planets are receding from or approaching one another at the highest rate. Then the Doppler effect displaces Mars spectrum and it is possible to distinguish Martian absorption lines from those of our atmosphere. Unfortunately, this procedure calls for the photographs to be made at a time when Mars is rather distant and that is an unfavorable time for observation. Results thus obtained up to now have not been altogether satisfying. Working from Lunetta, there are no such difficulties, and we can take spectral photographs when Mars is very close to us. Another advantage is the absence of the flickering caused by the Earth's atmosphere. From the optical angle alone, our work is vastly better than can be done on Earth. Now let's take another example. Just think of all the difficulties confronting a terrestrial observer who is trying to follow consecutively the burgeoning and fading of any given Martian vegetative region. Of course even on Lunetta, we cannot obviate the difficulties that the change of distance between observer and observed brings during a half year. But the astronomers on Earth must fight many handicaps from which we're free. Many observatories in the Northern Hemisphere and particularly in highly developed regions such as Europe and America, work under such poor atmospheric conditions as to be almost unsuited for delicate observation work on planets. Local weather conditions often interfere just when astronomic ones are best. Even observatories near the equator, less bothered by weather, work against a handicap when it comes to consecutive observations of Mars over extended periods. Let's consider an opposition of Mars. The planet is then exactly opposite the Sun, and to all terrestrial observatories, it transits the southern branch of the meridian at midnight and may be observed from nightfall until daybreak. Since Mars rotates once in 24 hours and 37 minutes, any one spot on its face appears approximately in the same place on two consecutive nights at the same moment. An observer will see the same hemisphere of Mars each night while the other hemisphere remains invisible. The latter, however, 
could be seen by an observer antipodally located, whose midnight is 12 hours later than that of the first observer. But the picture is gradually changed by the 37 minutes difference in the times of revolution. Any given spot on Mars appears at its western rim each night later, by 37 minutes. So 15 or 20 days afterwards, it appears just before dawn, when daylight and the low altitude of the planet obstruct observation. Therefore, to get continuity of observation, an observatory located where it can see the subject at night must take over. You will not find it difficult to imagine what a lot of errors can thus creep in. There's the difference in personal reactions, without even bringing up the number of unsuccessful measurements and examinations in the past stemming from lack of accurate coordination between various observatories, widely separated geographically. This may not appear insuperable, but it's very difficult to get such coordination in practice. On Lunetta, we have none of these handicaps. With our bi-hourly orbiting time, Mars can never be hidden from us for more than an hour. We can always see it for a full hour or more. We can keep its entire sphere in sight so consecutively that we can check changes in certain regions throughout long periods quite easily and without interruption. This is one of the more important keys to successful examination of Mars. Being free of atmospheric disturbances, we can observe Mars even when it is most distant from the Earth, unless, indeed, it is hidden by the sun day such observations, naturally, lack the quality obtainable in Mars oppositions, but no terrestrial observatory can make Mars out at all at these times, for it is obscured by the bright daylight. There are many more advantages of a space station like this as an observatory, but I suspect it might bore you to hear them all. Not at all, not at all, said Holt with a friendly grin. As an old spaceman, even if I was military, I always get a kick when I hear that rocketry has done something for astronomy. You know, there's a natural relationship between our two trades, and a pretty close one at that. So we've got to pull together every time we can. But let's get back to business. What was that you were saying about temperatures on Mars? You gave the results, but I'd like to know how you get them. Here's the way it's done, said Bergman. There's a tiny thermocouple in the focal plane of the telescope with which we are working on Mars. The strength of the radiation is a measure of the temperature of that spot on the surface to which we have adjusted the thermocouple. It's not quite as simple as it sounds, for the total radiation of a planet consists of rather more than the heat radiated by the planet itself. The more is reflected solar radiation, and our conclusions must be drawn from the former only. So we've got to separate the two. This is done by interposing a layer of water about half an inch thick in the ray. This permits the short wave, reflected solar radiation to pass, slightly weakened. But it completely cuts off the long wave heat radiation which comes from the surface of the planet. There's a ratio between the current produced by the thermocouple with and without the water filter and this ratio enables us to determine the rate of the planetary radiation. With it, we can finally derive the temperature at the surface. Our thermocouple is hardly as big as a pinhead, and you can guess what a job it is to run it to and fro over the tiny image of the planet. At points where radiation is strong enough, namely in the focal plane, the image itself measures but a few millimeters. When it is done in a terrestrial observatory, the tiny image also glimmers on account of the passage of the light through the atmosphere. So it is quite miraculous that measurement technique down has advanced to the point where the required accuracy has been attained. You seem to imply, said Holt, that we may anticipate improvements in work of that nature done from here. There's no doubt about it, assured Bergman. You have but to provide funds and scientific assistance, and induce the authorities to enlist the services of some of the more efficient research institutes to perfect our instrumentation then we'll be able to get readings up here on much of the data you'll require. Planetary examination presents one of the most difficult problems in measurement technique. But we can do much more than heretofore if we can tackle it with such means and resources as have been lavished on many industrial instrumentation efforts. If Operation Mars gets underway, said Holt, you'll get what you need. 
I'm sure that Professor Hansen will concur in my request that you write an official memorandum for me on the procedure you would like to adopt. And here's a questionnaire covering everything I'd like to know about Mars, which I do not expect you to be able to fill in completely at this time, however. Please remember that every question that remains unanswered before we start is a source of danger to the whole enterprise, so put into your memo everything which might be important, even though there's no apparent immediate solution to some particular measurement problem. Include measurement methods which require original development, problems of that nature which you already face, and personnel and institutions you think should take part. Don't forget new instruments for this observatory, or anything which may facilitate the work. Give us an idea of how much time and how much money you'll need. Don't spare the horses, Mr. Bergman. This is no place for economy drives. Holt paused, noting Bergman's gleeful face, for the latter was obviously overjoyed at the scientific windfall that had dropped at his feet. All his life he had yearned to probe the secrets of the Red Planet and here came the opportunity of a lifetime, free and unsolicited. Thoughts of applying then and there for a membership in the expedition raced through his mind, but to express them then he dare not. At that moment, Hansen broke in with, Do come and have a look at your planet, Colonel. You'll be here for a couple of hours, and we can go into your further questions later and I'll stay for some days and have plenty of time to look through the great eyepiece. Minus zero, Bergman and Holt unstrapped their chair belts and reached for the fireman's pole which took the place of stairs or corridors in the weightless interior of the observatory. Hand over hand, they floated themselves to a circular manhole located diametrically opposite the bay in which they had been landed by their busy bee. Bergman opened the plate to admit them into the observation chamber, much after the manner used with the bee. After closing the doors, Bergman took the wheel and pressed a switch which caused the chamber to slide out of the bay and into space. Opening the throttle moved the chamber towards the telescope structure floating at the end of its connecting line. As they approached the guide rails, Bergman reversed the thrust momentarily and, with a metallic click, the chamber entered the rails and locked fast at their inner limit stop. The chamber had a hemispherical glass dome in whose center was a minuscule, swiveling telescope. Bergman drew himself against it, turning it until it registered on Mars. When the latter was within his field of view, he threw a switch which audibly started electric motors somewhere in the fabric and ponderously the whole telescope structure, chamber, observers and all began to orient itself towards Mars. Now Bergman fixed his eye to the ocular of the main scope. See what I'm doing? He offered without looking away. I've got the idea, said Holt, but I don't follow all the detail. The small sighting instrument is hung in gimbals which have sliding resistances or potentiometers as well call them, attached to the axes. Currents running through these are a measure of the angular difference between the instrument and the main tube. After the sighting scope has been bracketed on Mars, it is kept the by a light sensitive cell, and two flywheels train the main scope until the two are parallel, thus bringing both scopes onto Mars. The comes our planet now, just sliding into the field of vision. Want to look? Holt traded places with him and applied his eye. There it was a huge disc treble the size of the moon. Its coloration, indescribable in its variety, well nigh overwhelmed him for a time. He could see the famed south polar cap, almost blinding in its stark whiteness. There was the rim from the melting edge of which the ever thirsty Martians were supposed to draw their pitiful water supply. Below were the red, yellow, and dark green zones, the deserts and vegetative regions. The longer he gazed, the more detail registered with him. Suddenly, though they were. The canals. A whole hemisphere was almost covered by their fine, filigreed network, each meticulously following the bold sweep of a great circle. More and more seemed to appear from nowhere. What did they really mean? Here was no longer the red planet, but one like Joseph's coat. His it would be to plumb the distant mysteries by a dive into space deeper than any man had ever made. Chapter 5, 
The serious returns Holt left the observatory full of admiration for the work going on there, and for the various adjuncts available to him for preparing his plans. His new knowledge, reinforced by the almost neighborly feeling of his close-up view of Mars, had given him a better sense of where he was headed. The busy bee shot him back to Lunetta's artificial gravity where he spent hour after hour with Riley indoctrinating the latter with the full magnitude of the coming effort. Then the time for him to drop back to Earth rolled around, and leaving the comfortable cabin which had been assigned him, he made his way to the elevator door from which he would rise against Lunetta's centrifugal force to re-enter the conical nose of the Sirius. A tall officer stood by the elevator door, suitcase in hand. Why, if it isn't Tom Knight, my old co-pilot of war days. I've been stuck in this donut for two weeks, and now am I'm going to fly the Sirius back to Kailui. You riding? Well, I was going to ride, said Holt, but now am I'm a co-pilot, unless you want me to spring rank on you. Knight grinned, and ten minutes later, Holt took his place at Tom's right in the pilot's compartment. This was in the nose of the conical stump remaining after the release of the two enormous booster stages of the Sirius. It was not unlike the cockpit of a large plane. The couches, previously necessary to enable the crew to withstand the high accelerations after Earth launching, had been set up as ordinary seats. There were four in the crew, captain, co-pilot, mechanic and radio man. These men faced a task of skillful piloting on the return trip. When leaving the Earth, automatic devices had done everything, course keeping, detachment of boosters at predetermined velocities, and the crew had merely reported the proper functioning of the incredible ingenious mechanical and electrical brain that had controlled the mighty, if short-lived power. Now the captain would operate controls, like any pilot in the atmosphere. Two oval ports permitted him and his helper to view whatever lay before the sharp nose of the ship and below the ports was a mighty instrument panel. In the same plane as pilot and co-pilot sat mechanic and radio man, just below the operating seats. Each had an instrument panel, below which were two ports similar to those of the pilots dot with passengers and express aboard. The airlock to Lunetta was closed. The interior of the mooring cone was all that Holt could see through the glass of his port. Sirius nose was still tightly held within it. A green bulb flashed on the panel, signaling from Lunetta's flight controller that they were free to go. Knight closed a switch. A click showed that the toggle which had held them was open, then light began to filter around the rims of the ports. A compressed air piston was slowly expelling them from their snug berth. Lunetta gradually came into view, huge and glistening. Ponderously and silently, she receded. Knight started one of his flywheels and Holt had the impression that Sirius was slowly beginning to rotate around her longitudinal axis. Going to spin down? He asked Knight with a laugh. Then he caught himself. Don't bother. I must be getting rusty. Of course, you've just stopped us from turning with Lunetta. Before we were turning with her. I'd better get back into this space stuff. Still they floated not far from the great wheel. Knight drew a set of tables from the side pocket and turned its pages. He noted the hour on a large timepiece on the instrument panel. Then he reached for a periscope eyepiece which protruded from the ceiling and directed it at the star that he had identified from his tables. He set his crosshairs onto the star with adjusting screws. Then he moved the switch once more and the flywheels buzzed. The ship began to orient itself away from Lunetta and Holt saw the huge disk of the Earth, brightly lighted by the sun, swing into view. Knight was busy with his periscope, turning the adjusting screws to keep it bracketed on his star, despite the angular movement of the ship caused by the flywheels. He could see a set of changing figures, graduated in degrees, which showed that his ship was gradually coming parallel to the periscope. As the readings diminished, the tone of the flywheels dropped, stopping as the pointer hit zero. The ship was exactly lined up with the chosen star. Knight noted the time twice more, made an adjustment of the setting of his glass after a look at his tables, 
and then used his flywheels to add this correction to the angle of the ship. Sirius was now orbiting around the Earth's stern first. There was complete silence except for the rising whine of the steering gyros coming up to speed. Ten seconds to go, said Knight. He advanced the throttle as the second hand touched ten, and there was a subdued hissing sound, followed by the vicious howl of the main jet. Acceleration pressed them back into their seats. The accelerometer went up to three. LG. Knight was retarding the orbital velocity of the ship with a hundred tons of thrust, just half what the motor could develop. This would bring her into the upper atmospheric layers after half a revolution around the Earth. Once she had penetrated them, their drag and lift would serve to reduce the speed and make a landing possible. The application of thrust lasted some fifteen seconds, whereupon silence again enveloped them and the heavy load imposed by the negative acceleration was gone. Sirius was now turning around the Earth at a rate of 480 meters per second lower than that of Lunetta. The latter, so far as they were concerned, was just another one of the myriad heavenly bodies in space. Knight again started his flywheels, gradually rotating Sirius 180 degrees, so that at the end of five minutes, her nose was pointing in the direction of flight. He continued to apply them from time to time in order to compensate for the curvature of their flight path. Everything about the ship was still weightless, and the sunlit surface of the earth glared up at them through the cabin portholes. Knight pointed out a cloud bank far to his right. That's Hawaii, he remarked. Just one turn more around the earth and we'll be home. The wide span of the Pacific shone up at them through the cloudless haze for Sirius was still streaking along at over 1,000 miles altitude on the elliptical path leading to the landing. Her heading was southeast and a chain of woolly cloudlets bubbled past far below Holt's window. Their shadows on the shimmering surface of the immense ocean betrayed their height. Holt knew from experience that cloudlets of that sort indicated the presence of islands and he was soon able to coordinate them on his chart with the Marquesas. Those ahead would be over the Tuamotu archipelago, that well-nigh forgotten legion of lonesome isles of the South Pacific. Another fifteen minutes passed with naught but the waters of the ocean in view. Holt thought of Mars water famine, less than one hundred thousandth of Earth's water. It seemed to him that we on Earth might do quite well with vastly less than we have, so why shouldn't the Martians manage one way or another? Ahead and to starboard there appeared a glistening whiteness which Holt promptly identified as the southern barrier ice. We must be between Cape Horn and Antarctica. He remarked tonight. Correct, said the latter. Our landing ellipse reaches its sunmost point just where the Antarctic Circle passes between North and South Graham Land. By now Sirius was tearing into the rapidly approaching nightfall and the sun popped out of sight on their port hand so that all their senses could interpret of the shell-like trajectory was what was on the luminescent instrument board. It's getting about time to rig out the wings, remarked Knight and pressed a switch. There was the whine of a serve motor, and Holt, peering through his porthole, could see the telescopic wings slowly emerging by the light from the after cabin. Hitherto hidden by the stubs housing them, too thin, Narrow wing panels now increased the span of the ship to triple what it had been. Knight pulled the control wheel away from the instrument board where it had been latched and engaged it into the lateral and pitch control mechanism. The temperature indicator of the leading edges still read zero. He tried elevens and rudder, but they moved freely in his hands and the ship did not react. That meant they were still clear of the most tenuous layer of air. We ought to get some air soon, said he. It's been 46 minutes since we started to decelerate and we'll be at our perigee, 80 kilometers from the Earth, in five minutes. He now moved the controls almost constantly, with an anxious eye on the leading edge temperature gauge. Soon slight movement of the ship began to follow the control movements. Very, very weak they were, but nonetheless perceptible. There was a light sensation of tripping tending to draw them forward against their belts. 
At last air was reducing the 8,270 meters per second which showed on the air speed meter. The needle of the leading edge temperature gauge kicked and then rose slowly but steadily to 150 degrees, 200 degrees, 300 degrees Celsius. Higher and higher it moved. Night pushed the wheel slightly forward, keeping the altitude at an exact 80 kilometers. They were lifted slightly out of their seats and against their shoulder belts by acceleration in the vertical plane of about O.LG. This came from the negative lift that Knight had imparted to the wings by his forward movement of the controls. Had he not done so, Sirius would have again emerged from atmosphere at perigee, and the second branch of her landing ellipse would have carried her back to Lunetta's orbit. What sort of skin temperatures do you get nowadays? asked Holt. Oh, she'll take up to 1,100 degrees and more, answered Knight, but the highest we're apt to get is around 730 degrees Celsius when we're at 5,000 meters per second at 60 kilometers altitude. Not much, is it? asked Holt. With the old Jupiters, we used to heat up to almost 900 degrees. These new vessels have a much lighter wing loading. That lets us do our gliding considerably higher, and there's less heat transfer because the air's less dense. On some of our troop transfer trips, the boys got very jittery when they looked out the ports and saw the wings a bright, incandescent red. Despite Knight's reassurances, it was getting uncomfortably warm in the cockpit. I'll turn up the refrigeration a bit, so the boys back the won't get to cooking too much and be all nervous. He said. He twisted the adjustment screw of the temperature regulator and the whine of the cooling turbine rose in pitch against the hissing and roaring of the onrushing air. Above their heads, the star strewn sky seemed motionless and below them was naught but pitch darkness. Their wings and nose had begun to glow with the color of old port wine, which penetrated the portholes with a ghostly glimmer and reflected from their faces. Their enormous velocity was betrayed only by the instruments and the incessant roaring as they split the air. There's the lighthouse on the Cape of Good Hope! exclaimed Knight, we'll be subsonic in another hour or so. There was still very little sensible evidence of the slowing down of the Sirius. Not long before, they had been lifted into their shoulder belts by the centrifugal acceleration of the wings forcing the ship into a circular path but this had slacked off and was no longer noticeable. It meant that the excess speed with which Sirius had entered the atmosphere had sunk to approximately that of the local orbital speed. But the longitudinal deceleration still read less than O.LG. Twenty minutes after they had passed the Cape of Good Hope, their speed was still above 7,000 meters per second and their altitude well over 70 kilometers. All this time, the leading edge temperature gauge read but little under 700 degrees Celsius and the entire nose of the ship was heated by the air friction to a luminous cherry red. Holt's view of the wings revealed that their dark red incandescence progressively diminished towards the trailing edges. It was striking evidence that the boundary layer was growing thicker in cord and reducing the amount of heat transferred by the onrushing air. It seemed a long time before they became aware of a sickle-shaped glimmering ahead of them. It grew rapidly on both sides of their nose, revealing that they were flying into the dawn. Above the horizon soon glared the livid mantle of the solar corona, to be followed rapidly by the orb of day itself, painfully contracting the pupils of their night accustomed eyes. Soon the advancing line of dawn on Earth had passed below them, and Holt noticed that they were flying above an illimitable forest crossed by a silvery, serpentine line which could only be a river. That's the op remarked Knight with a glance at the clock. If our directional gear has been working properly, Nova Sabir's got to be out there to your right, then Tomsk, and the Yenisei River after a minute or so. Sure enough, another mighty river, disguised from their height as a tiny, silvery thread, passed below them. Occasional patches of snow appeared in the forested Siberian wilderness, growing thicker as they advanced, until near Verhojensk, the coldest city. The whole lonesome waste lay rigid under its icy frost. Here they had reached the limits of the Arctic, the northernmost point of their great circle path. Now headed towards the southeast, Sirius skimmed across the frozen Kalama River. Now, at last, 
The airspeed meter dropped to 6,000 meters per second, but the altitude was still above 65 kilometers. The wing temperature was on the upgrade and read slightly above 700 degrees Celsius. But Sirius was now over the ocean once more. Holt saw Kamkatka's huge peninsula through a hole in a fog bank, thrusting out like a great barrier between Siberia and the Bering Sea. They could distinctly feel the increased deceleration imposed by the air upon the racing ship, they were drawn forward against their belts, as though seated in a car whose brakes are applied. When they passed the western outposts of the Aleutians the speed had dropped to 5,000 meters per second, and five minutes later it was only 4,000. The wing temperature, which had been stuck for a long time at around 730 degrees Celsius, had sunk to 670 degrees and was now rapidly diminishing. From below the pilot's seats, the radioman's hand appeared with a slip of paper. Here's the first bearing from Kilui, said Knight, twisting the knob of the course gyro and resetting the ship onto the corrected course. Sirius was cutting deeper and deeper into the atmosphere, whizzing diagonally downward. Knight checked speed and altitude with the figures on a tablet attached to the steering column. These showed him at what altitudes various speeds should be passed as Sirius rapidly lost velocity. When they hit the 1000 meter per second mark at 33.3 kilometers height, according to plan, the wing temperature was only 237 degrees Celsius and Knight gave the order to tighten seat belts. Five minutes elapsed without incident, then the deceleration suddenly increased noticeably for a few seconds. Knight's face grew tense as he manipulated the controls firmly. His eyes were glued to the Mach meter. Transonic speed, he said. Sirius was still 24 kilometers high, but her deceleration again diminished. Gravity had been growing on them imperceptibly all along and was now wholly normal. It held them to their seats as Earth dwellers have been held through the centuries. Soon the ship had also almost ceased to decelerate. At night's command, the mechanic lowered the leading edge flaps a few degrees in order to adapt the supersonic airfoils to subsonic flight. The wings were now at almost the same temperature as the air. The radio operator handed up course corrections in increasingly rapid succession, and soon they could see the cloud caps above the Hawaiian Islands far below on their starboard bow. Night banked Sirius into a wide spiral glide which ended in a broad sweep across the airport. At his command the mechanic lowered the landing gear and flaps and he finally set the ship on the runway with no more fuss than some casual airliner coming in from Wake Island. A tractor hooked onto them at the end of the runway and hauled them solemnly to the terminal building of Kilui Spaceport. It was almost 12 hours on the dot since they had been projected upwards towards Lunetta by the huge booster stages. Catherine was waiting. She had spent the night with some old friends in Kilui. And as she and Gary got into a taxi, Knight gave them a friendly wave of the hand. Drop in on us, next time you're near Emerald Bay, shouted Holt. Chapter 6, Is it technically possible to reach Mars? When President Van den Bosch's recommendation that an expedition to Mars be set afoot reached the newspapers and radio commentators, the Red Planet came alive in the minds and consciousness of people the world over. Speculation was rife as to the nature and makeup of the space vessels that would compose the fleet. Technicians and laymen flooded the press with both fanciful and serious comments and suggestions. Rocketry became overnight a word as familiar as television had been 40 years before and was far more controversial. The names of Braden, Spencer and Holt ran from mouth to mouth like wildfire. Catherine Holt immediately found herself called upon to redeem her promise to her husband to support his interplanetary plans, for the tremendous interest aroused by the project infallibly induced would be participants and contributors to seek access to the leader by the domestic route. A California state trooper was stationed outside the modest house on Emerald Bay to ward off the crowd of strange inventors who besieged its gates. Public relations requirements, however, indicated that inaccessibility, or at least the reputation of it, be avoided at all costs, so Catherine found herself interviewing a strange assortment of people ranging from gentle mystics to astrologers. 
The local postman brought daily a heavy sack of mail from which Catherine selected such letters as appeared to her to be true personal correspondence and forwarded the rest to Holt's office where they were processed by an especially engaged battery of secretaries and typists. The reaction of Congress to the President's message was anything but uniform for the appropriation requested was $2 billion and there were implications that this might not suffice. Many of the representatives felt grave doubts as to the wisdom of devoting so great a sum to a project which, in their opinions, could contribute nothing immediate to a cure of the economic unbalance which was the main concern of every session of the world legislature. The past war had severely strained the resources of every country on earth united though they now were after finally building an enduring peace. Even the victors had strained their financial means to the breaking point, for they had been forced not only to repair their own war damage, but had also endeavored to succor the vanquished so that the heart-rending suffering among them might not break out into renewed unrest. The most strenuous efforts were being made all around the globe to establish a universal peace economy such as had not been known for more than two generations and it was to taxpayers burdened with such an enormous load that the request was in the end directed, a request for billions with which to carry out a project of questionable value and of equally questionable technical feasibility. The Congress appointed a special committee to study the matter and chose Senator Perossi, an Italian, as its chairman. Perossi was a physicist of note and had won the Nobel Prize for his epoch-making work on cosmic rays. Although he was now devoted to statesmanship, it was well known that no basic scientific error in the plan would escape his critical eye and caustic tongue. Under his direction, the Mars Committee decided on a series of public hearings at which they would question those concerned with the management of the enterprise. Unless these men could give satisfying answers to every question, the appropriation would fail of the necessary votes in committee and never reach the floor. Zero. Bruce Spencer was the first man called. His it was to defend the technical aspect of the planning and to report on the construction of the spaceships for Operation Mars. He entered the committee room with a briefcase in one hand and a huge roll of drawings in the other. The witness stand was crowded with microphones. Reporters and spectators occupied every available space. At the long conference table sat the nine committee members with Senator Perossi at their head. He greeted Spencer heartily and invited him to display whatever material he had brought. Spencer unrolled a large drawing and fastened it to a display board convenient to the witness stand. Brusquely and without preamble, as was his wont, he began. Gentlemen, his deep voice rumbled. Here in the middle of the drawing is the Sunday the outer circle represents the orbit of Mars, the inner one that of the Earth. You all know that the Earth requires a year, 365 days, to circle the Sunday it requires a certain speed to do this. It can easily be determined, since we know that we are 149 v 6 million kilometers from the Sunday that speed has been computed as 29.8 kilometers per second. The orbit being curved, we may say that the Earth is in a continuous turn. This means that centrifugal force is generated, just as happens to you when you make a turn in your car. This force tends to urge the Earth away from the Sun, exactly in the same manner as you are forced outwards within your car. But the Sun also exerts a gravitational force upon the Earth which balances the centrifugal force to which I have just referred. This makes the Earth's path around the Sun a smooth, even circle. The same applies in principle to Mars, but its orbit is longer and its velocity along it is much lower, namely 24.1 km per second. Hence it takes 687 days for a complete circle around the Sun, and this is the length of the Martian year. If you'll examine the drawing, you'll note that the orbit of Mars is not exactly circular. Here, at this point, Mars is evidently closer to the Sun than when at a point diametrically opposed to it. Doubtless you will desire an explanation of how this comes to be. As I told you, orbital centrifugal force and solar gravity are everywhere equal for the Earth, but this does not hold absolutely in the case of Mars. Take this point where Mars is remotest from the Sunday we call this point is aphelion. 
Solar gravitation here exceeds centrifugal force because Mars orbital velocity is lowest at this point. Hence Mars increases its speed towards the Sun day but it cannot move directly towards the Sun, being prevented from so doing by its orbital velocity. Mars, therefore, falls, as it were, around the Sun in curvilinear fashion and approaches closest at this point, called perihelion, which is diametrically opposed to the aphelion. Now its orbital velocity has been considerably increased by this free fall. Therefore, at perihelion, centrifugal force exceeds solar gravitation and the planet begins to recede from the Sun day but there has been no dissipation of energy during the fall, so Mars is compelled to return to his point of origin, the aphelion. The whole procedure is a sort of oscillation, somewhat like that of a swing. There, at aphelion, when potential energy is greatest, kinetic energy is least, and vice versa. Far back in the Middle Ages, an astronomer named Johannes Kepler proved that these planetary orbits are elliptical. Hence the expression Kepler ellipses. The center of attraction is always located in one of the foci of a Kepler ellipse. In the case of the solar system, it is the Sunday the foci are so close together in the Earth's ellipse that the latter is, to all intents and purposes, a circle. But Mars orbit is markedly eccentric, as you've been shown. Gentlemen, it is Kepler's elliptical orbits that point out how we may journey from one planet to another. Let us assume that we could increase the orbital speed of the Earth at some arbitrary point of her orbit. That would increase the centrifugal force with which it would recede from the Sun day if we could increase Earth's orbital speed from 29.8 km per second to 32.83, that is, by 3.03, she would intercept Mars's orbit after one half a revolution along such an ellipse around the Sun day while we cannot do this with the entire Earth, it is quite possible to do so with a minute portion of it. A modern rocket ship finds it no great problem in attaining 3.03 km per second, and such a ship may be considered as that minute portion. There's yet another factor which bears vitally upon the practicability of this kind of rocket voyage. I shall now cover it. So far, we have discussed the flight path of a ship en route to Mars only as it is related to the solar system. But if we think of ourselves as looking at a rocket from some point on the Sun, and desire to increase its speed by 3.03 km per second above the speed of the Earth, we must first overcome Earth's gravitation in order to do so. This is a much more difficult task. If we want to accelerate it enough to let it come to a standstill at the point where terrestrial gravitation has, to all intents and purposes, become zero, we must give it an initial velocity of 11.18 km per second, an enormous figure. And if it is to depart from the Earth's gravitational field with a residual velocity of 3.03 km per second, the initial velocity would have to be even higher namely 11.6 km per second this is beyond our capabilities at this stage of development. But there are other means at our disposal. You are familiar with our artificial satellite Lunetta, circling the Earth these many years without any application of propulsive power. Her orbit around is subjected to the same Keplerian laws that determine the movements of Earth and Mars around the Sun day. The centrifugal force imparted to her components when they were freighted up to her orbit and assembled sustains her weight and prevents her from falling to Earth. Her orbital velocity of 7.07 km per second just suffices to keep her centrifugal force adequate to maintain that situation. In order to retain the required residual velocity of 3.03 km per second beyond the field of terrestrial gravitation, we should only be obliged to accelerate the ship by 3.31 km per second along Lunetta's orbit and in the direction of her motion. This additional slight velocity increment to the orbital velocity, 7.07 .07 km per second, of Lunetta, will give us what we need. You will note that such a maneuver calls for only a minute fraction of the power of a ship designed to rise from Earth to Lunetta. There is, however, a regrettable catch in the Lunetta business, for Mars orbit lies in the same plane as the ecliptic, whereas Lunetta's does not, 
a practical and economic drawback to launching from Lunetta. Thus we must effect the departure of Operation Mars from an orbit similar to that of Lunetta, except that it must lie in the plane of the ecliptic. We have actually selected a path of departure almost exactly equivalent to that of Lunetta and which, at the intersections of the planes, lies but a few miles from Lunetta's orbit. Spencer paused and ran a flamboyant bandana handkerchief over his hairless skull. Then he downed a glass of water and continued. We must remember that our problem is not limited to shooting our rocket ship to Mars on a one-way trip. You have doubtless realized from the foregoing that this might be done with our existing vessels if they were to depart from an orbital path around the Earth. But our expedition must not only reach Mars. It must remain there for quite a time and then return safely. This is much more difficult of achievement. So let us consider the demands made upon us by this problem. I have just shown you that 3.03 km per second beyond the orbital velocity of the Earth is required to be imparted to a rocket ship after it has left the field of gravitation of the Earth, if it is to follow an elliptical free flight path that will contact the orbit of Mars after one half or circle of the Sun and that this velocity must be imparted in the same direction as that of Earth's orbital velocity. We also have learned that, if the start is made from an orbital path around the Earth in the plane of the ecliptic, in which path the ship has an initial velocity of 7.07 km per second, we shall only have to accelerate it by 3.31 km per second in order that it may leave the field of gravitation with the required residual velocity of 3.03 km per second. To attain this velocity increment of 3.31 km per second is the first propulsive problem of our trip. When it has been completed, the ship will coast on without power on a Keplerian ellipse through the solar system. After 260 days, at the time it reaches its aphelion, it will intercept the Martian orbit. Here I should note that all these figures are valid for the mean distance of Mars from the Sunday that is, I have assumed Mars orbit to be circular for purposes of simplification. If we so arrange matters that Mars arrives at the point of contact of this ellipse with its orbit after 260 days, the ship will enter Mars field of gravitation. We must remember that Mars has an orbital velocity of 24.1 km per second, while the velocity of the ship at this point will have been reduced to 21.5 km per second by its battle against solar attraction during the voyage. Mars will, therefore, overhaul the ship from a stern with a differential speed of 2.6 km per second if the ship at its aphelion were exactly in Mars orbit it would be caught by his gravity and crash upon Martian soil. But we are in a position to locate the ship's aphelion just inside of Mars orbit. Thus Mars would attract it hyperbolically, according to the laws of motion of heavenly bodies. The ship would approach most closely to Mars at the vertex of such hyperbola, and it would escape Martian gravity for all eternity on the second branch of the hyperbola. But, by the use of the rocket power plant, we may reduce the ship's velocity appropriately just before it reaches this vertex and cause it to enter a circular or slightly elliptical orbital path around Mars. Its radius around Mars will be about the same as the distance of the vertex of the hyperbola from the planet. The ship may orbit here indefinitely without propulsion. In effect, it will have become an artificial satellite of Mars and will so remain until the situation is again altered by a propulsive maneuver. We have selected for our purposes an orbit at 1000 km from the surface of Mars. In order to go into this satellite orbit, a change in velocity of 2.01 km per second has been computed as necessary. If the trip to Mars involved only this entrance into a satellite orbit, our ship would have two velocity changes only, 3.31 km per second to leave the satellite orbit around Earth and 2.01 km per second for entering the satellite orbit around Mars, a total of 5.32 km per second even this is far less than the velocity change necessary to reach Lunetta from Earth. The return trip requires exactly the same velocity changes. 
2.01 km per second are required to depart from the Martian satellite orbit so that the residual velocity beyond Mars's gravitational field is again 2.6 km per second if we impart this residual velocity to the ship in a direction opposed to that of the travel of Mars around the Sun. It will eventually follow the latter at a rate 2.6 km per second less than his own. The ship's orbital speed, being now less than that of Mars, reduces centrifugal force so that solar attraction outweighs the former dot thus the ship will move in a Keplerian ellipse which somewhat represents the continuation of the ellipse of arrival, and this ellipse contacts the orbit of the Earth at perihelion after 260 days. If the timing is such that the Earth reaches this point at the same time, the ship may be attracted into a hyperbolic path by the former. We can arrange matters so that this hyperbolic path will have its vertex at the same height as the circular path from which we originally took our departure. Now we must decelerate the ship just before it reaches this vertex and bring it down to the local orbital velocity, just as we did near Mars. We shall require a velocity change of exactly 3.31 km per second for this purpose, identical with that of the departure. This is plain if the principle of the conservation of energy is considered. Once the ships are in such a satellite orbit, we can take off the crews with serious class ships. To recapitulate, the trip to Mars and return will necessitate four propulsive maneuvers as follows colon 1. Departure from satellite orbit around Earth. Velocity change, 3.31 km per second. Point 2. Entrance into satellite orbit around Mars. Velocity change, 2.01 km per second. Point 3. Departure from satellite orbit around Mars. Velocity change, 2.01 km per second. Point 4. Entrance into satellite orbit around Earth. Velocity change, 3.31 km per second. The sum of the velocity changes is therefore 10.64 km per second. We need propellants to change the velocity of a rocket vessel, and their amount determines the size of the ships and their method of construction. Interplanetary filling stations, you'll agree, will be few and far between for some years, so we must carry along all propellants required, down to those for the final maneuver. Since the fuel which will be used in the last maneuvers represents ballast during the earlier ones, more propellant is required during the earlier maneuvers to achieve equal velocity increments. Before, however, I get to the actual quantities of propellants involved, I must acquaint you with some points of view which determine the structures of the vessels, and thus significantly affect the computations. You will have noted that the four maneuvers described do not involve surface landings, either on Earth or on Mars. This eliminates the determining factor for a surface launched rocket ship, namely that the thrust must exceed the weight of the ship. We require thrust amounting to only fractions of the weights of the ships, by reason of their weights being constantly sustained by the centrifugal forces generated in their satellite orbits. We can get by with surprisingly small power plants, which will, however, be operated for relatively long periods during the initial maneuvers when large masses are still involved. These masses consist mainly of the propellants reserved for later maneuvers. We propose to use units of no more than 200 metric tons thrust, such as have long been employed in the top stages of serious class vessels. Secondly, these Mars ships will always operate in a vacuum and that permits us to neglect all forms of streamlining, in contrast to our rocket ships, which must traverse the atmosphere. Nothing even remotely resembling the familiar hull is required. Propellant tankage will be supported in light, tubular, thin-skinned framing. Although the tankage volume, particularly for the first maneuvers, is very large, stresses are never very high because the unvarying thrust of 200 tons cannot accelerate the ships rapidly when heavy. Therefore, all tanks can be of very light construction. In the third place, we shall be able to abandon the multi-stage principle. We shall rather jettison each tank, together with its supporting structure, as the propellants contained are exhausted. Fourthly, the tanks, as well as the crew spaces, 
will be made of thin walled plastics. This will mean that tank shells and supporting structure will weigh but one seven hundredth of the weight of the contents. Such tanks are collapsible, and will be freighted up to the orbit of departure all ready for assembly despite their bulk. Operation techniques of this nature were developed for Lunetta, so they are familiar to us. Fifthly, our rocket motors will be more efficient owing to their operation in vacuum. They will be more economical of propellants than those working in denser atmospheric layers. This improvement is accounted for by the so-called expansion ratio, which is particularly favorable in vacuum. In vacuum, the gases of combustion do not have to drive out of the nozzles against the back pressure of the atmosphere, thus we can convert a greater proportion of the energy liberated during combustion into kinetic energy of movement of the gases. Of course, this is also done in the top stages of our present ships, so that their power plants are designed for just these conditions and there's nothing novel about it. The figures used in computing our propellant requirements include an exhaust velocity of 2,800 meters per second. You might be interested in the fact that the first booster of a serious class vessel, designed for low altitude, attains an exhaust velocity of 22,550 meters per second and now, I'd like you to bear with me for a moment on the subject of mathematics. I'll cut it as short as I can. One of the basic formulas of rocketry states that the velocity increment of a rocket in vacuum and beyond gravity is the product of the exhaust velocity and the natural logarithm of the ratio of initial to terminal weight. That sounds a bit more complicated than it really is. It simply means that it is possible to compute directly the initial weight of a rocket vessel before a propulsive maneuver if the change of velocity, the exhaust velocity and the final weight are known. The difference between the weights, of course, represents the propellants expended during the maneuver. This allows us to compose in tabular form the propellant requirements of the four maneuvers already discussed. Since the only figure that we can accurately predetermine is the final weight of the ship after the last maneuver, namely 50.5 metric tons, our purpose is best served by commencing with that figure. I will explain later how we reached this figure. Please note that in the following an allowance is made for a velocity reserve of 10% in each of the power maneuvers 2, 3 and 4. For maneuver 1 the computation of the required propellant weight is a bit more complicated because, in view of the extremely low accelerations, we have to take into consideration the climb against the Earth's gravitational field during the power maneuver proper. The velocity reserve for maneuver 1 amounts to but 3.5%. Roughly. Spencer turned to the blackboard and wrote upon it the following tabulation, there it is, he said with a gesture at the board. 3720 metric tons total initial weight, 3662.5 of which are propellants used in the four maneuvers, is required so that the ship may weigh 50.5 tons when it is all over. The volumetric content of the propellant tankage for the initial maneuver of exit from the orbit of departure must suffice for 2814 tons. Those tanks will be jettisoned before the second maneuver is undertaken, the latter requiring tankage for 492 tons. This will likewise be jettisoned before departure from the satellite orbit around Mars. 222 tons of propellant suffice for this departure and when the corresponding tankage has again been disposed of, the final tankage for entering the terminal orbit around Earth need hold but 134.5 tons. The above will give you a rough idea of the general dimensions of a spaceship for a round trip to Mars. Minus zero, I have described only a part of the proposed journey, namely that between the two satellite orbits concerned. To effect safe and satisfactory landings on and departure from the surface of Mars poses an entirely novel set of problems. These cannot be solved by the vessels hitherto discussed. It would be worse than spend thrift to land all those propellants on the surface of Mars and then be faced with the tremendous power requirement for overcoming Martian gravity. Not only that, but the construction of the vessels utterly unsuits them to operate in any kind of atmosphere. They have no fuselages or hulls, nor are they winged, 
and their rocket motors wholly lack the power to lift them from the Martian surface. For that reason, we propose to make our landings in special craft which we shall call landing boats, the spaceships themselves continuing to orbit around Mars at the altitude of 1000 kilometers. They will complete this orbit in about 2 hours and 26 minutes at an orbital velocity of 3.14 km per second now, the problem of descending from this orbit to the Martian surface is not dissimilar to that of descending from Luneta to Earth. That is to say, the landing boat will decrease its velocity from that of its mother ship. This will throw it into an unpowered elliptical path touching the upper layers of the Martian atmosphere after one half of a revolution around the planet. Such a landing boat must of course be equipped with wings and controls permitting it to produce negative lift, in order to force it into a circular path within the atmosphere. The drag will then slow the boat down. The wings will eventually produce the positive lift required for a glide and a normal landing in airplane fashion. But a landing of this nature on Mars is accompanied by two novel problems when compared to its terrestrial counterpart. One is due to the Martian atmosphere being, at surface level at least, markedly less dense than that of Earth. This will diminish the following tabulation there it is, he said with a gesture at the board. 3720 metric tons total initial weight, 3662.5 of which are propellants used in the four maneuvers, is required so that the ship may weigh 50.5 tons when it is all over. The volumetric content of the propellant tankage for the initial maneuver of exit from the orbit of departure must suffice for 2814 tons. Those tanks will be jettisoned before the second maneuver is undertaken, the latter requiring tankage for 492 tons. This will likewise be jettisoned before departure from the satellite orbit around Mars. 222 tons of propellant suffice for this departure and when the corresponding tankage has again been disposed of, the final tankage for entering the terminal orbit around Earth need hold but 134.5 tons. The above will give you a rough idea of the general dimensions of a spaceship for a round trip to Mars. Minus zero, I have described only a part of the proposed journey, namely that between the two satellite orbits concerned. To effect safe and satisfactory landings on and departure from the surface of Mars poses an entirely novel set of problems. These cannot be solved by the vessels hitherto discussed. It would be worse than spend thrift to land all those propellants on the surface of Mars and then be faced with the tremendous power requirement for overcoming Martian gravity. Not only that, but the construction of the vessels utterly unsuits them to operate in any kind of atmosphere. They have no fuselages or hulls, nor are they winged, and their rocket motors wholly lack the power to lift them from the Martian surface. For that reason, we propose to make our landings in special craft which we shall call landing boats, the spaceships themselves continuing to orbit around Mars at the altitude of 1000 kilometers. They will complete this orbit in about 2 hours and 26 minutes at an orbital velocity of 3.14 km per second now, the problem of descending from this orbit to the Martian surface is not dissimilar to that of descending from Luneta to Earth. That is to say, the landing boat will decrease its velocity from that of its mother ship. This will throw it into an unpowered elliptical path touching the upper layers of the Martian atmosphere after one half of a revolution around the planet. Such a landing boat must of course be equipped with wings and controls permitting it to produce negative lift, in order to force it into a circular path within the atmosphere. The drag will then slow the boat down. The wings will eventually produce the positive lift required for a glide and a normal landing in airplane fashion. But a landing of this nature on Mars is accompanied by two novel problems when compared to its terrestrial counterpart. One is due to the Martian atmosphere being, at surface level at least, markedly less dense than that of Earth. This will diminish the obtainable aerodynamic lift. It is indeed fortunate that this drawback is to some extent counterbalanced by the weakness of Martian gravity, which decreases the weight to be supported by the wings. The atmospheric pressure at the surface of Mars is but one twelfth of that on Earth, or not far from it. This, of course, 
reduces the load carrying capacity of any given wing panel to one twelfth at any given speed close to the surface. But gravity at the surface of Mars is but 38% of that of Earth, and this likewise reduces the weight and the required lift for any given landing boat to 38%. This is of great importance in the matter of landing speeds. Landing speed is the lowest speed at which the craft can be held in the air by the application of every possible aerodynamic expedient, such as flaps, slots, extreme angle of attack, etc. The figures indicate that any given landing boat will have just about double the landing speed on Mars that it would have on Earth. That means that our wings for a landing on Mars will have to be about quadruple their normal area, if we propose to maintain the same landing speed as on Earth. That, however, is but one half of our problem. Here's the other. When our Sirius class ships return from a lunetta's orbit, we're accustomed to their being almost empty, for their propellants are nearly exhausted by the climb. This makes the ships light on their return to the atmosphere. The conditions of the landing craft for Mars will encounter this situation in reverse for they will be obliged to later depart from the surface of the planet. To do this they must land with an adequate propellant supply. Spencer grinned at his audience. Mr. Hansen has praised the intelligence of the Martians very highly, he said. But my engineers refuse to work on the basis that they'll have hydrazine and nitric acid in quantity ready for us. So, the landings will inevitably be made with rather heavily loaded craft. Of course this handicap is somewhat mitigated by the feeble gravity of Mars. This not only tends to decrease the effect of the mass of the landing boats and to reduce their landing speed, it also facilitates their return to the satellite orbit. It requires a terminal velocity of 8.26 km per second for a Sirius class vessel to reach Lunetta from Earth, and this must be gained in opposition to the powerful gravitation of the Earth. To reach the satellite orbit in which the spaceships will be circling around Mars, however, our landing boats will have to be accelerated only to 3.70 km per second and will be opposed only by that planet's much weaker gravitational field. Even the maneuver of adaptation by which the flight of the landing boats is made to conform to that of the circling spaceships requires less power near Mars. 180 m per second suffices in this case versus 460 meters per second for a Sirius class vessel approaching Lunetta. Another important factor is given by the fact that the takeoff weights of the landing boats also amount to only 38% of what they would be on Earth, and thus we can lift off an initially much greater mass with a reasonable rocket thrust and impart to it to a very satisfactory initial acceleration. The large area wings which will be required for safe landings must, of course, be abandoned on Mars before departure. The combination of advantageous circumstances referred to permits the use of a single stage rocket to rise from Mars to the satellite orbit. This is in contradistinction to the triple stages required to solve the analogous problem on Earth. But it is not my desire to bore you with too many details about the rather involved problem of the landing boats and their design and construction. Here are their main features in a nutshell. Each boat will have a 200 ton thrust unit, deviating from the conventional type only insofar as its expansion ratio will be somewhat reduced by the not inconsiderable density of the Martian atmosphere. In other words, the gases will not expand down to as low a terminal pressure as in the rocket motors used in our spaceships. That means that we shall lose some exhaust velocity. The rocket motors of the boats will achieve exhaust velocities of about 2,600 meters per second versus 2,800 meters per second in vacuum. With full tanks, the boats will weigh 200 terrestrial tons at departure from the satellite orbit. This weight will decrease to 185 tons by the expenditure of propellants used to throw them into the elliptical landing path. These 185 tons will effectively amount to only 70 tons in the Martian field of gravity. The landing payload of 12 terrestrial tons will be decreased by 7 before departure from Mars, and both wings and landing gear, which together weigh about 40 terrestrial tons, will be abandoned. This will reduce the takeoff weight on Mars to but 138 terrestrial tons, 
namely 52.5 Martian tons. Their 200 tons of cut and dried rocket thrust is, therefore, capable of giving them a very respectable acceleration, permitting them to lift 5 tons of payload back to the satellite orbit of the spaceships. Let us drop the landing boats and return to the loads the spaceships will have to cope with. The initial weight of each landing boat, namely 200 tons, must be considered pure payload for those spaceships which haul them into the satellite orbit around Mars. But after the boats have served their purpose of landing and have returned their crews and payloads to the circling and waiting spaceships, they have completed their tasks. Their value does not justify the expenditure of the propellants required to return them to Earth. Nor, as a matter of fact, is it practicable to return even their mother ships. Both, therefore, will simply be abandoned in the satellite orbit around Mars. The crew will return to the orbit of departure in the remaining ships, and from that orbit crews and load, if any, will be taken off by the good, old, reliable Sirius class. If we assume that the landing boats will be transported to the Martian satellite orbit in mother ships of performance characteristics similar to the spaceships designed for the round trip, you may note from my tabulation that the weight of such a space vessel after the second propulsive maneuver, that is, entrance into their Martian orbit, will be 410 tons. The tabulation also shows that 222 tons of propellants are required to depart from the Martian orbit and a further 134.5 tons must be used to enter a satellite orbit around the Earth. Therefore, such of the spaceships as are to return home will be obliged to devote an overwhelming portion of their load carrying capacity at arrival near Mars to propellants for the two homeward bound maneuvers while these vessels to be abandoned can employ the major portion of the available 410 tons for payload. This reveals the trick by which we are able to get the 200 ton landing boats into Mars's orbit at all, despite our otherwise very tight situation with respect to weight. The empty weight of mothership on arrival in its Martian satellite orbit is about 15 tons, for it consists only of power plant empty plastic tanks and a light connecting structure, once it has completed its one-way task. If we subtract the weight of a landing boat, 200 tons, plus the 15 tons from the available 410 tons, we get 195 tons for useful load of various sorts, and believe me, we can use it. So you will easily see that the trick of abandoning some of the spaceships near Mars frees us to a large extent from our weight limitations. Minus zero, let me now cover the technical overall planning of the voyage. We anticipate that the expedition will consist of seven passenger ships for the round trip, and three cargo vessels to be abandoned in Mars's orbit. Each of the latter will bear a landing boat plus 195 tons of useful load. This gives us a total of three landing boats and 585 tons of cargo in addition to the load carried by the passenger ships. The crews will be 70 in all. You have heard that their one-way trip to Mars will require 260 days. To this will be added a stay on Mars of 449 days, which I shall later explain. Let us refer to this as waiting time, although the expedition will then fulfill its actual purpose. The waiting time will be followed by the return trip which will also require 260 days. Obviously the expedition as a whole can draw on the supply of the three cargo vessels during the trip out and during the waiting time. On the return voyage, the passenger vessels, bearing the personnel and whatever Martian cargo may be appropriate, will be on their own. This enables us to determine the payload requirements for the passenger ships. Each of the seven ships will carry a crew of ten on the way home. Those ten people have to be provided with food, drink and utility water, as well as breathing oxygen, for 260 days. Adding all these loads to the empty weight of the ship proper, we come to a total of 41.5 tons. Now I told you that, in effect, we based our calculations on a terminal weight of each passenger ship of 50.5 tons after completion of the last propulsive maneuver. So we still have a leeway of 9 tons per ship, 
or a total of 63 tons, which we have so far made no attempt to assign specifically. There are, of course, many uses for this reserve which are desirable although not vital. For example, busy bees will be extremely convenient, not only for visiting between ships, but also in the event of one or another ship getting into difficulties and requiring help. Long distance radio, borne on the trip out by the cargo vessels, could be taken over by one of the passenger ships for the run home. I can assure you that those 63 tons of available capacity for the trip back will gradually be filled up with various things as our plans and program take more definite shape. The final decision on the utilization of this reserve may be left to the discretion of the command of the expedition. The situation is envisaged as being even somewhat more favorable than I have here represented to you. We may well assume that accurate navigation will render the 10% propellant reserve after propulsive maneuvers 2, 3 and 4 somewhat excessive. But we cannot exactly predict just how great this excess will be after each application of power and the corrective maneuvers that may follow it. Hence we propose to equip both passenger and cargo vessels with four reserve propellant storage tanks, each of 15 cubic meters capacity. Prior to any new maneuver, when it is desired to jettison the tankage of the previous one, any remaining liquid can be drained into the reserve tanks. During the earlier power applications, when large quantities of propellants are involved, accurate work on the part of the navigators and the control equipment makes possible the saving of very considerable quantities of propellants. If these savings be later applied, when the ships are relatively light, they mean large reserves for load carrying capacity or for changing velocity. It will largely be up to the command of the expedition to apply these reserves at the times and in the manners which will do the most good, enabling them to choose whether they will bring back more payloads or save the reserves against possible unexpectedly large velocity change requirements. Let me now discuss the payload distribution of the cargo vessels. You know that, aside from the landing boats, there are still available some 195 tons aboard each vessel. We shall have to deduct from this the weight of the oxygen, water, and food required for the voyage out and the waiting time together, 709 days. Each ship will require 25 tons of oxygen in liquid form, 35 tons of water, and 20 tons of food. In addition, there's a reserve of 20 tons of water in the event that one entire cargo ship should be lost, but we still have 95 tons of available capacity. It would be a long task to convey to you all the articles which will comprise these thrice 95 tons, but here are the most important, two heavy-duty radio sets for communication between the expedition and Lunetta. A large reflecting telescope with which to reconnoitre the surface of Mars from the satellite orbit. Such reconnoitring is a sine qua non before an attempt is made at landing. Three complete spare rocket power plants, each being applicable to either passenger or cargo vessels. Two spare tanks of each size, in the event of any of the regular ones springing a serious leak, will be kept ready at all times together with a lavish stock of all sorts of spares. Our damage control and repair equipment will even include two small lathes. There will be gravity cells, the busy bees for intership communication, as well as other things. Zero, and now, gentlemen, I must touch upon another point in my discussion the timing of the expedition. It is, perhaps, the most critical problem of space shipping, and particularly so for a voyage through the solar system. We would profit but little by attaining Mars orbit unless he is at the right time at the point where we intercept it. The same applies to meeting the Earth amid the vastnesses of space on the return trip. Let me now present the timing problem, in somewhat simplified guise, by assuming that the orbits of both Earth and Mars are circular. In actuality, of course, both orbits are elliptical, that of Mars in particular displaying a very considerable eccentricity. And when we perform the actual computations, this is, of course, considered. Mars makes a complete, 360 degrees circle around the Sun in 687 days, equivalent to a segment of arc of 0.524 degrees per day. Earth, 
On the contrary, takes only 365 days for a complete encirclement of the sun and therefore accomplishes 0.987 degrees in a single day. In view of the 260 day length of the trip to Mars, the latter must, at the moment of departure, be at a point 260 times 0.524 degrees, 136 degrees, ahead of the intersection of the path of the ships with the orbit. When observed from a hypothetical point on the sun, this intersection will lie 180 degrees behind the point of exit of the ship's elliptical path from the terrestrial orbit. Hence Mars, at the moment of departure, must be 180 degrees minus 136 degrees equals 44 degrees ahead of the Earth in his orbit. Therefore, a departure for Mars on that type of elliptical path becomes a possibility only when Mars, as seen from the Sun, is 44 degrees ahead of the Earth. During the outward voyage, the Earth will travel through 0.987 times 260 degrees, 256 degrees of arc. Once the ships have completed their full semi-ellipse of 180 degrees and have arrived at Mars, the Earth, as seen from the Sun, will have advanced to 76 degrees ahead of Mars. This gives us the key to the timing of the return voyage. Since the travel time is the same, it is apparent that at the moment of departure from Mars, Earth must be momentarily located 256 degrees behind the intersection of the ellipse of return with her own orbit. That is to say, she must be at 256 degrees minus 180 degrees behind Mars, or 76 degrees. Thus we have the following question with respect to how long the necessary waiting time on Mars will be, when the ships arrive at Mars, the Earth will be, as seen from the Sun, 76 degrees ahead of Mars, and the return cannot be undertaken until she is 76 degrees behind him. How long will it take for this condition to establish itself? The computation is relatively simple. On her shorter, inner orbit, Earth moves more rapidly in arc and must cover 360 degrees minus twice 76, or 208 degrees with respect to Mars. The difference of movement in arc of the two planets is 0.987 minus 0.524 or 0.463 degrees per day. That is, Earth gains on Mars 0.463 degrees each 24 hours. Thus 208 degrees divided by 0.463 equals 449, the length of our waiting time in days. Minus 0, before I finish, I want to give you some idea of the extent of the financial and other efforts, which the expedition will require. There will be manifold special research and development operations, but the main effort will consist in freighting the ships, supplies and propellants into the satellite orbit of departure. At this time, we have only a relatively modest number of Sirius class vessels adapted to this purpose. Each requires 5,583, almost 5,600, tons of propellants, and can transport 25 tons of payload into the orbit of Luneta. You've been shown that the 10 vessels destined for Mars will weigh 3,720 tons, a total of 37,200 tons of payload up to the satellite orbit of departure. That means 1,490 trips. The situation begins to appear somewhat less startling, however, if we consider the following factors. It is usual for a serious class vessel to leave behind in Lunetta about 8 tons of the reserve propellants she carries besides the regulation cargo. Furthermore, since our ellipse of departure lies in the ecliptic, ascent to it will be somewhat more economical of propellants than the trip to Lunetta, because we can utilize for the climb a greater component of the circumferential velocity of the Earth. This, we believe will permit each shipload on the ferry trips to deposit some six additional tons of propellants in the orbit of departure. Thus we anticipate that each Seamus class ferry will leave there either 39 tons of propellants, or solid cargo amounting to 25 tons, plus 14 tons of residual propellants. 
this would reduce the number of ferry trips to about 950. Each ferry flight will, however, consume 5,600 tons of propellants or thereabouts, a total of 5,320,000 tons, which is the product of 950 and 5,600. It would take 443 tank steamers, each of 12,000 tons capacity, to hold this amount. This is about the equivalent of the fuel for six months in one of the theaters of World War III. Both the Mars vessels and the Sirius class ferries will use highly concentrated hydrazine and nitric acid as propellants. These chemicals are produced by the suppliers of the space forces at an average price of about $100 per ton. The quantity envisaged will presumably necessitate some plant expansion. Thus the cost of the propellants for the ferry trips to the orbit of departure will be around $500 million. The same item with respect to the Mars vessels and their landing boats is almost negligible in comparison, the cost will be but three and a half million dollars, roughly. Just about one fourth of the entire two billion dollars will be expended in propellants for the ferry flights. We believe that the remaining three quarters will suffice for the solution of the other problems. Minus zero, Spencer closed his speech abruptly. Sitting down on a chair in front of the witness box, he produced his cigar case and lit one of his villainous stogies after his usual elaborate preparations. Not a sound came from his listeners. Even the Mars committee held its peace. After some time, Perossi's white head rose into prominence as its owner addressed Spencer with a strong Italian accent. Mr. Spencer, he remarked, please accept the gratitude of the committee from my lips. You have certainly cleared many matters in our minds. Many of us, I know, felt the same way about it as I, but you have removed many doubts and explained many hitherto moot points. Let us now proceed to a question session, for I know that not only I, but many other members of the committee have much to ask, judging from the busy pencils I saw during your address. I shall begin with one or two questions of my own. If I'm right. You stated that the aphelion of the elliptical path of a ship approaching Mars would be located just short of the orbit of Mars instead of right on it. This, I understand, is to prevent the ship from crashing vertically to the surface of the planet, overhauling it from a stern. Rather the ship should be drawn into a curved hyperbolic path by the gravitation of Mars. Then when it approaches closest to the planet at the vertex of this hyperbola, the ship's velocity is to be slowed until it corresponds to the orbital velocity appropriate to its location. Have I understood you right so far? That's correct, Senator. There's something about it which I do not quite grasp. Apparently you have assumed the ellipse of interplanetary travel to result exclusively from the combined effect of the motion imparted to the ship in the form of kinetic energy and the gravitation of the sun until such time as the ship approaches the field of gravity of Mars. But it would seem that the ensuing hyperbolic flight path is produced by Mars gravitation alone. The orbit of Mars itself is certainly determined by the gravitation of the sun and so the hyperbolic flight path under discussion must, in some way, also be affected by solar gravity, even within the sphere of Martian gravity? You're quite correct, sir, answered Spencer. Perhaps I oversimplified my method of presentation on this detail to some extent, as also on other matters. In actuality, the business of entering a satellite orbit around Mars is quite a bit more involved than I have pictured it and gravitation, both solar and Martian, must be used in the computations. Point Noir, a French mathematician, evolved the mathematical methods he used when he solved the so-called problem restraint to problem date war core. The same applies, furthermore, not only to the entry into a satellite orbit around Mars, but also to all four maneuvers and to unpowered interplanetary coasting insofar as these take place not too remote from Mars or the Earth. The gravitation of our moon adds a few complications to the mathematical aspect close to the Earth. None of these effects are quantitatively very large, nor do they affect the figures I quoted to any material extent, nonetheless, they must be taken into account in working out the navigation, both prior to and during the voyage. 
That brings up another question, said Perossi. According to your drawing, the intersection of the ellipse of the voyage and the Martian orbit is at about 377 million kilometers from the point of departure from the Earth's orbit. Then you propose to effect the manpower of adaptation at Mars in such manner that the resulting satellite orbit shall be 1000 kilometers distant from the surface. Should your departure data at the termination of the first thrust maneuver be even minutely in error as to velocity or direction, you might easily be many thousands or even millions of kilometers off when you approach the orbit of Mars. I can imagine that navigation will have to be kept current with extreme accuracy and that any errors will be subject to running corrections. That's quite so, replied Spencer. But there's plenty of time in route for meticulous navigation. Throughout the 260 days of the voyage there will be constant checks on the position of the ships and any aberrations from the predetermined track will be computed and corrected. As I informed you, there is available a certain propellant reserve, and this can be used for any corrective maneuver found necessary. From the serried ranks of the committee an elderly gentleman wearing nose glasses rose and inquired how positions could be plotted in space. That's relatively simple, answered Spencer waving his cheroot. The navigating officer will simply take the stadiometric angle between any planet in the plane of the ecliptic and some star in the same plane. Since the voyage takes place in that plane and since the ephemeris gives the positions of both planets and stars, this angle will immediately fix the position of the ship. Our experienced spacemen call this procedure the determination of planetary parallax. The same measurement may be taken perpendicular to the plane of the ecliptic by finding the angle between some fixed star and a planet when a line drawn between them cuts the plane of the ecliptic at right angles. This will also give a check on whether the vessel has strayed from the plane of the ecliptic, and the data for the appropriate corrective maneuver. Spencer looked around for further questioners, whereupon a spare, grey man looking somewhat like a retired cowman spoke up. You mentioned that food, water and oxygen for the crews is an important factor in the cargo requirement of your spaceships. That is quite plausible in the face of the long duration of the voyage. Can you tell us something about the rations on which your weight calculations are based? With pleasure, said Spencer. I hope you will excuse me if I don't have all these figures in my head, so let me just look into my papers. He sank his ham-like paws into his briefcase and, after some digging, produced a folder. Now let's see, he said, leafing through the pages. First of all, we're allowing to each of the 70 men 120 kilograms for personal baggage. This baggage included, we reckon that all in all, crew weight will be 14 metric tons. This makes two tons apiece for each of the seven returning passenger ships. Each man will require 1.235 kg of breathing oxygen per day on the average, as has been confirmed by practical experience in Lunetta. Since both on the outbound leg of the voyage and during the waiting time oxygen can be drawn from the cargo vessels, the oxygen supply of the passenger ships can be limited to the needs of the return trip, 260 days. Each of the passenger ships will therefore need for its crew of 10 an absolute minimum of 10 times 1.235 times 260, equals 3220 kg of oxygen. Each ship will actually be provided with 5 tons. Water will be needed to the extent of 2 kg per person per day. For the passenger ships. That's twice 10 times 260, equals 5,200 kg. We're providing 5.5 tons. We're also supplying an extra 2 tons of non-potable water. It will be stored in a special system and used for cleaning purposes and the like. Oddly enough, this utility water will increase daily as the result of water recuperated from the air drying plant. This recuperation will amount to about 1.62 kg per person per day. It comes from perspiration and moisture in the breath of the personnel, and there's no reason at all why it cannot be employed for utility purposes, after thorough treatment, of course. Thus the utility water will increase during the return trip to 6.2 tons from the original 2 tons. 
Of course, the drinking supply will be correspondingly diminished. Where food's concerned, we reckon with a daily consumption per person of 1.2 kg, that's about army standard, and each passenger vessel will require about 3.12 tons of food as a minimum. We shall provide 3.5 tons. Food containers will weigh around 1 ton, making 4.5 tons in all. When all this is added up, each of the seven passengers' ships will haul two tons of payload composed of the crew and their personal belongings, five tons of oxygen, 5.5 tons of potable water, two tons of utility water and 4.5 tons of food, or 19 tons altogether. In this connection let me give you the remaining figures affecting the terminal weight of the passenger ships. Personnel spaces of each ship will be spherical and have an empty weight of 3 tons, more or less. Furnishing and fittings will raise this to around 4 tons. Air and water recuperation equipment calls for another 3 tons, navigational and course keeping gear, 2 tons, while the electrical generating plant weighs another 2 tons. That's 30 tons altogether. Now, the rocket power plant as presently used in the top stage of the Sirius class, weighs almost exactly 10 tons, and we expect to use it without alteration. This includes rocket motor, gas turbine driven propellant pumps, and gas generator for the turbine, as well as valves, tubing and all the various components. The tanks for the final thrust maneuver weigh a scant half ton and the required structure, after jettisoning the other tanks weighs not quite one ton. And so we reach a total empty weight for each passenger vessel of 41.5 tons, including the entire useful load. You will recall that this gives us a leeway of 9 tons per ship, since we actually based all performance calculations on a terminal weight of 50.5 tons. Spencer seated himself once more and looked expectantly at the cowman. Seems all right to me, said the latter. I get the idea that you've gone far enough into this thing to start right in building your strange gadgets the moment the appropriation's through. And I guess it wouldn't be long before the whole outfit would go busting off into space. Spencer hurriedly got to his feet. Hold on a moment, sir he protested solemnly. It's not as simple as that. When you get down to the details of a job of this kind. It is so involved and varied that it will call for years of work on the part of a veritable army of scientists and engineers, not to mention production men in every imaginable field. That will have to be gone through before we can even dream of launching the convoy into space. Let us not deceive ourselves, gentlemen. There are enormous problems ahead of us. It will be much like an attempt to climb some very high and rugged mountain. Often we shall see what we believe to be its summit clearly before us, not far away. But when we reach it, we shall find that it is not the true summit and that a strenuous climb still lies ahead. All I had hoped to accomplish today was to convince you that it is even now technically possible to fly to Mars using means, materials and methods which are presently available to us. In no way do I desire to minimize the difficulties facing the project. But I am absolutely certain that if our work is begun with adequate facilities, Mars will soon conceal no more mysteries than Moscow. Chapter 7, What of Life on Other Planets When Spencer had finished, not a man in the Mars Committee doubted that a voyage to Mars was technically possible, and the effect of his presentation was a lasting one. But in the public press, and even among the members of the committee, there were those who vociferously questioned the value of the objectives of the undertaking and furiously opposed the expenditure of the vast sums which the enterprise could not fail to demand. After Accra Doratory it was finally determined to interview Professor Hansen, the foremost astronomer of the day. His opinion that Mars was inhabited by creatures of intelligence was important, and likewise, what he thought would be encountered by an expedition after landing upon the surface of the distant planet was valued. The whole city of New York was in a turmoil of anticipation when Hansen appeared before the Mars Committee. As he left his car, at the door of the great cupola of the capital of the world in Greenwich, reporters by the hundreds swarmed around him, vainly seeking advance information as to his testimony. After he had taken the stand, he looked solemnly at his hearers and began. 
before touching the practical phase of the astronomical aspect of Operation Mars, I feel it my duty to pay tribute to a great man. For several decades, the turn of a forested peak near Flagstaff, Arizona, has covered all that was mortal of Percival Lowell. Beside his grave rises his beloved observatory where, over eighty years ago, he pronounced to the world certain truths, which have now been confirmed by the perfecting of our methods of research. He had seen almost all of it through the eyes of genius, his gift of observation and his ability to combine the seen with the felt. By fellow observers he was often ridiculed because they, lacking his keen eye and even keener perceptiveness, could discover no confirmation of the vital findings at which he had arrived after many years of laborious work. It would seem that his very eyes had been so trained by the labor of the years that they could clearly discern what others thought too dim for credence. You, gentlemen, might well open Percival Lowell's books written in 1903 and 1905 and in those musty tomes find everything which I propose to lay before you today. In point of fact, all I have to tell you is that photographs and measurements taken from the Lunetta Observatory, under the direction of its distinguished chief observer, Dr. Hans Bergman, fully confirm all the theories advanced many years ago by Percival Lowell. Astronomers today generally hold that the origin of most stars is as follows, empty space no longer is thought to be really empty. Rather is it believed permeated with cosmic dust. The distribution of this dust is so unbelievably fine that it does not appreciably affect either the passage of light or the movement of the stars. In the illimitable reaches of space between the fixed stars, this dust is subject to radiation pressure from the surrounding heavenly bodies. As eons pass, the combined action of some of the closer and powerfully radiating stars, omnilaterally surrounding any given sidereal space. drives this dust together and condenses it into the shape of the well-known cosmic clouds. As the particles of dust are heaped together, they develop a common center of gravity, to which other particles are attracted with increasing velocity. Such a cosmic cloud finally collapses on itself with protean violence and the sudden deceleration of the particles manifests itself in incredibly high temperatures. This phenomenon becomes visible as a new star in the heavens. We have reason to believe that this is the way in which our sun came into being. Hitherto, there has been no completely satisfactory hypothesis as to the creation of the planets in the solar system. Theory after theory has been advanced, only to be found wanting in one respect or another. The presently favored explanation postulates that the sun at one time was circled by a very large satellite, with which it formed a double star. Then it is thought that some wandering star appeared from the depths of space and collided with the satellite after entering the Sun's gravitational field. Quite possibly the planets as we know them are the remnants of the incandescent wreckage of that sidereal cataclysm. The molten character of the newborn planets allowed them to assume spherical shapes under the influence of the gravity of their own mass. They cooled more or less rapidly. According to their magnitudes, the larger ones remaining hot longer. Heavier components concentrated in the center, forming a core, while the lighter, gaseous ones surrounded them as atmosphere. The core of a planet would first become cool at the surface, due to the continuous loss of heat by radiation into space. This formed a crust while the liquid center shrank more and more. Then the crust, already solidified, became too large for the shrinking core and began to develop folds and crevices, exactly as does the skin of a drying apple. Mountains and valleys were thus formed, and basins for seas and lakes. In these, water collected, precipitated by the cooling of the vapor in the atmosphere. A heavy, impenetrable layer of clouds still hovered above the permanent gloaming of the surface. This shielded off any direct sunlight and reduced the loss of heat during the nights. Our planet was like this when life made its first appearance, and the experience of Mars must have been the same, although it seems to have taken place sooner, in view of Mars' smaller size. For his smaller size contributed to his cooling process occurring more rapidly than ours. 
our scientists no longer believe that life came to earth in the form of bacteria or living cells from somewhere in space. Meteorites could hardly have brought such life, for they glow red hot when they enter the atmosphere and would kill any germs. Radiation pressure from the sun might have brought life germs, but from where? Hardly from its incandescent surface. So we are forced to believe that our life originated here. When the water had cooled below its boiling point, protoplasm appeared within it. The reason why it did, only the creator knows, but protoplasm is the foundation of what we call life. At first it was the lowest, monocellular beings which were protected and given the uniform conditions and food they required by the naturally thermostatic oceans. Then life evolved from monocellular creatures into the incredible variety of marine plants and animals, algae trilobites, fish, and marine reptiles. Water, however, is a poor medium for the development of the higher forms of life, ideal as it may be for its generation in primitive form. Fish, for example, deposit their thousands of eggs in it and leave their posterity to the tender mercies of chance. In the higher forms of life, the parents must supervise the growth of their young, must warn them of dangers and instruct them. And so we may visualize how one fine day, some reptile crawled out of the water and established a new home on terra firma. The great lizards of the Saurian period originated in the development of higher forms of life brought about by this step to solid ground. But the Saurians later became extinct and bequeathed the mammal's supremacy on dry land. Life out of water, however, brought combat with the asperity of nature. The water vapor content of the atmosphere had decreased and this caused temperatures varying between roasting sunlit days and frigid starlit nights. As the battle against the increasing obstacles grew fiercer, nature developed her most powerful weapon, intelligence. This led to the mastery of man. Intelligence enabled man to inhabit regions entirely unsuited to his bodily constitution. Had he not invented such things as clothing and housing, and discovered the power of fire, he would never have been able to extend his dominion far into the icy northern latitudes. Without his intelligence and these fruits of his creative imagination, he would miserably have perished there. Minus zero, now, Hansen continued, let us take a look at Mars. Here is an aging planet, much further along his life's path than we. The protecting clouds of his earlier days are gone very nearly entirely. His oceans have dried up. His mountains have eroded away. Five-eighths of his area is bare desert with no signs of fruitfulness throughout the Martian year. The temperature variations between day and night are tremendous according to our standards. This comes from the almost total absence of protective cloud covering and the fact that the Martian atmosphere has become as tenuous as our own stratosphere throughout the passage of thousands of years. A few figures will be illuminating. Near the Martian equator, sunrise temperatures are of the order of minus 20 degrees Celsius, near noon they are from 20 to 30 degrees Celsius above freezing, and at sunrise they fall to zero. During the night they go as low as minus 30 degrees Celsius. Gentlemen, even the winter temperature range in my home state of New Mexico pales into insignificance beside that sort of variation. It's common knowledge that it takes a very smart man to survive in New Mexico, so you can figure out for yourselves how smart the Martians must be. A roar of laughter at this sally burst from Hansen's hearers and several reporters elbowed their way to the door in order that the world might know of Professor Hansen's culminating bit of evidence for the existence of intelligence on Mars. The chairman banged his gavel for several minutes before he could silence the guffaws which burst from the erstwhile solemn listeners, and when he at length succeeded, Hansen continued. We have reason to believe that Mars once had oceans like ours. Certain wide, dark spaces lie at a lower level than the surrounding deserts. This suggests that they may have been oceanic basins at one time. Hence, we have the same basic conditions for a parallel development of the simpler forms of life on Mars as upon Earth. There can be no doubt that, as the seas receded, life moved likewise on to solid ground. Conditions grew more and more difficult thus stimulating nature mightily to develop intelligence as a means of protecting life. 
it seems reasonable that on Mars, too, only one species of living creature can wear the crown of creation. If this is so, the history of Mars should reveal that conditions there favored the creation of a community of living creatures which dominated the planet after man's fashion here. Let us consider the evidence on the face of Mars which tells us that such creatures once existed and that they still exist. We cannot, of course, observe them in person, but their intelligence has left traces upon the surface of their smaller world, and these traces we believe we can interpret. There is a dense, spider web like tracing of dark lines all over the surface of Mars. Giovanni Schiaparelli, the Italian astronomer who first discovered them, called them canals. Until quite recently, this method of designation has caused much confusion, for the general public concluded that it referred to canals in the common meaning of navigable waterways. The idea is wholly erroneous and I would ask you to consider the word canal in the Martian sense to be but a label for those peculiar lines. All these canals are not visible simultaneously, for, as we shall see, they are subject to marked seasonal changes. So far, 437 of these lines have been definitely catalogued. They may be from 5 to 15 miles wide and from 200 to 3000 miles long. The longest known to us is called Eumenides Orcus and extends 3450 miles from a region known as Phoenix Lake to a large, accurately triangular zone named Trivium Charontis. The system of canals exhibits certain peculiarities which I shall now recount for you. First, all canals, long or short, are accurate great circles. That is, they follow the shortest distance between their terminal points. Second, the aspect of the canals is intimately connected with the seasons on the planet. When the Antarctic snow cap begins to melt in springtime, a blue-green zone develops around its white edges. From this the canals seem slowly to grow towards the Martian equator. Such canals as were invisible or inconspicuous increase in breadth and definition and then stand out in strong relief against the ochre brown or reddish deserts they traverse. As the spring advances in the southern hemisphere, this widening of the canals extends over further towards the equator. Our observations have timed the advance from the 72nd parallel of Martian latitude to the equator at 52 days. The distance is 2,650 miles. The rate of advance is remarkably uniform, namely 51 miles per day, or 2.1 miles per hour third. The widening of the canals extends across the equator, far into the northern hemisphere and is accompanied by a change of color of good sized areas from matte to lush blue-green. These areas are frequently geometrically shaped and the change requires only a few days. Fourth, six months later, the same phenomenon is observed in the other hemisphere. Remember, gentlemen, Mars is in a continuous drought, and water is as valuable as in our Sahara. We cannot but conclude, with Lowell, that the system of canals is the creation, the mighty creation, of beings of intelligence. Its purpose is to utilize the water of the polar melts for rendering fruitful the arid wastes of the planet. We hold that the blue-green areas I mentioned are not open water, but zones of vegetation which spring into bloom when water flows through the canals from the poles. The canals themselves, as we see them through telescopes, are strips of vegetation whose flowering and withering is caused by water or lack of it in the subterranean watercourses below them. Nor does the low atmospheric pressure of Mars permit us to assume that water could reach the equator at all, unless the veins of water lay below ground. Otherwise it would evaporate during its long journey. You will have noticed that there is a remarkable distinction between springtime on Earth and on Mars. As seen from a lunetta, Earth's polar snow cap recedes gradually, followed by the growth of the surrounding vegetation towards the pole. On Mars, however, vegetation begins to grow in the melting zones around the pole and then extends gradually equatorwards. As you know, the awakening of vegetation from its hibernal sleep requires warmth and water. On Earth, water is constantly available everywhere except in deserts and the plants are brought to life by the extension of the temperate heat belt towards the poles during springtime. In the cloudless atmosphere of Mars, 
daytime temperatures rise more rapidly in spring than do our own, but the plants cannot react to them until the irrigation system built by the Martians provides the necessary water. There is ample evidence to prove that this system is definitely artificial, aside from the mathematical precision of its layout. For instance, it has been disproved that the equatorward movement of the water results from centrifugal force generated by the rotation of the planet on its axis, such force would be zero at the poles and maximum at the equator, but it cannot explain how the water extends beyond the equatorial line when coming from either pole. Likewise, Mars is an oblate spheroid with flattened poles, like Earth. His diameter is 35 kilometers less at the poles than at the equator. Thus water would be forced to run uphill 17 kilometers on its journey from either pole to the equator. On the other hand, we know that a plumb bob hangs exactly vertical to the plane of the local horizon at any latitude on any planetary oblate spheroid. There is, therefore, no possible explanation of the movement of the water through the canals of Mars except that it is artificially pumped. We can estimate from other data that the amount of water frozen each year at the polar caps is about one one hundred thousandth of the water on our Earth. That is approximately twenty times the content of Lake Erie. How many millions of horsepower it must take to pump such an enormous quantity through the canal system, twice yearly, for thousands of miles? I'll leave to your imagination, but the pumping stations must be very powerful. It appears to me that three basic conclusions may be drawn from these facts. First, Mars must be inhabited by intelligent beings who have built a tremendous irrigation system over their whole globe. They keep it constantly in operation, and in order to do so, they must have a political organization of a global nature and be subject to some central authority. Second, they equal us technologically, and have perhaps surpassed us, or they could have built no such system of canals and pumping stations. Third, Mars is an aging planet and his inhabitants can keep alive only by the exertion of extreme intelligence. They would not have survived at all, had they not applied that intelligence, their technological capabilities, and their strength to a far greater degree than have we. Minus zero. Of course you'll want me to tell you what these creatures look like, in view of my predictions that they at least equal us in intelligence and may be immeasurably ahead of us in knowledge and capabilities. But here, gentlemen, you will ask in vain. We know that the atmospheric sheath of Mars has become thinner and thinner with the passing years and today has but a fraction of the pressure of our terrestrial air. Our spacemen will be obliged to wear pressure suits while on Mars and would suffocate without artificial respiration. From that we may deduce that Martians are differently constituted. But of their actual appearance we are totally ignorant. They might be mammals with specialized lungs. Could it be that some form of gigantic insects or reptiles have performed those technological miracles? We cannot tell. The mathematical precision of the layout of the canals must fill us with awe. But does not the bee produce the comb with marvelous mathematical precision, storing it with food against the winter? And is not the hive an example of social cooperation which permits amazing communal achievement along technological lines? We are baffled by the problem of how intelligent beings survive in the thin Martian air and among his violent temperature variations. But here on our own earth, there are animals which marvelously survive under conditions lethal to humans. May not frogs become frozen in the ice all winter long, only to awaken unharmed when spring comes? Do not fish of the profoundest ocean deeps live under a pressure of hundreds of atmospheres, dying when brought to the surface? We must believe that God's will that there should be life in nature cannot easily be frustrated by physical obstacles. And when he wills that the characteristics with which he has endowed them shall no longer withstand the environment which his will imposes upon them, he selects special favorites for the gift of intelligence with which to alter their environment. No, gentlemen, it would be fallacious to assume that we sentient begins stand alone in the universe, nor should we arrogate to our earth the distinction of being the only planet to bear higher forms of life. So let us reach out. Let us fare forth to seek our fellow beings in the depth of space. 
perhaps we too can learn from God's creatures on our sister planet. For on its countenance are clearly written the symbols of creative and intelligent works wrought by them. Chapter 8 the mission of space travel a number of speakers were to come before the Mars committee after Spencer and Hansen had had their day. Holt was required to outline his plans for preparing the organization and Lusini went deeply into the subject of radio communications. Dick Payton, chief designer of United Spacecraft, told them many of the details of the construction of the Mars vessels. Finally, Professor Ashley related what the World Research Board proposed to undertake in the matter of preparatory research. After long study and debate, the Mars Committee unanimously concluded that Operation Mars presented no insuperable difficulties to an energetic and determined attack. It proclaimed without a dissenting voice that it believed that the enormous sums of money required would indeed be well spent for the general benefit of humanity. Not one of their signatures was missing on the favorable report in which they advocated consideration of the Mars Exploration Act by the World Senate and House. It was on the floor of the Senate that the initial victory of the proponents of Operation Mars proved to be but a first battle in what was to be a lengthy war, for both Senate and House were composed of a congeries of people whose primary interests lay anywhere else rather than in a costly excursion into deep space. A very considerable number of the delegates held their positions below the vaulted dome in Connecticut, with the avowed intention of devoting their full time and effort to ameliorating the lot of their particular constituents, and to the neglect of all else. All too many were obsessed with the desire to cater exclusively to such feelings, desires, and needs as might animate those who had elected them. Narrow, Provincial points of view frequently dominated the thoughts of those whose votes held a way over the welfare of all the inhabitants of Earth. Nor were such men backward about emphasizing what they felt to be their duties along such lines. Countless regions still suffered dreadfully from the aftermath of the ultimate war. Wounds suffered in direct combat still bled copiously, and even the quasi neutrals in many cases existed precariously at the very brink of an economic precipice created by the almost complete stagnation of world trade which had accompanied the destructive conflict. It was small wonder that the United Congress had become a sounding board for the plaints of those impoverished countries whose primary objective it was to pick the pockets of the more opulent. The price exacted of the victors for a global democratic government had indeed been high for it was not long before the poor but populous regions of South and East Asia began to throw their numerically superior representatives into the scales within the great, domed structure of the Congressional Building. More and more the scales inclined towards the indigent populations and to the detriment of the erstwhile Western powers. The 800 million voters in India and China weighed heavily behind the efforts of their representatives to tap the remaining resources of the West and to ameliorate the sufferings caused by the civil wars which had torn them during the global conflict. With oriental guile they set about the task of piping a flood of gold and goods into their insatiable moors. When Operation Mars reached the Congress it was promptly projected into the maelstrom of these conflicting interests. The appropriation of $2 billion called for by President Van den Bosch represented an outlay which loomed large beside the funds for the World Recovery Plan, to which America was contributing the largest part and so it was not long before a block of great power was formed in opposition to Operation Mars. It was composed, significantly enough, of representatives of regions from which few, if any, contributions to it could be expected. The leader and mouthpiece of the opposition was a Chinese senator named Kyle Orhen. The dignity and pomposity of his appearance in no wise obstructed the cunning machinations he aimed at the obliteration of Operation Mars. Kyle Orhen meticulously and skillfully avoided any mention of the financial aspect in his speeches on the floor, or when he buttonholed prospective supporters of his stand in private. Rather would he quote impressively from the writings of Buddha and Confucius, emphasizing their admonitions towards economy and salutary moderation in all things. With oriental adroitness, he warned against the dangers of passionately plunging into the unknown. Kyle Orhen explained to all and sundry how the past war, with its horrors, might have been avoided if only mankind had abjured the intoxication of dynamic ideals and had devoted itself to self-sufficient, 
God-fearing contemplation of the karma. He was wont to fortify his arguments with references to eternal China and timeless India. Solemnly he recounted how often both had been raided throughout history by belligerent and dynamic neighbors, and how the invaders had inevitably succumbed and been absorbed by non-resistance and the very inertia of their almost stoic inhabitants. Do not, I beg of you, violate the Tao. Was the culmination of his great speech before the Senate? God is eternally on the side of those who serve him and are subservient to him on the land where he created them. In his anger he will surely castigate men who, with impious hands, would reach into his heavens. Rhetorical appeals of such fervor did not go unheeded. Kyloren struck a chord in the very hearts of Chinese and Indian voters, where it resounded ever louder and deeper. On such a high plane did his verbal crusade proceed that the actual critical aspect, the procurement of funds, was completely obscured from view. It was not long before the powerful Asiatic bloc in the Senate stood united in purposeful and almost devotional opposition to further exploration of space. Even in the weary and tax-ridden Western countries there were those to whom Kyle or Hen's blandishments were not without a profound appeal. The supporters of the measure, those on the other side of the fence, were drawn from very heterogeneous groups. Scientists were almost unanimously in favor of the plan, for almost every man or woman of science could not but be titillated by the almost illimitable extension of research in many fields that such a grandiose scheme would engender. The Congress was literally flooded with pleas and challenges from the men of science to show itself equal to the great task before it. The space forces had launched a campaign of publicity which united behind the scientists a very large section of the forward-looking and progressive public. The press of the world in general, with all its power to mold public opinion, espoused the cause of Operation Mars. Whether or not the prospect of future headlines motivated much editorial thought did not affect the energy with which they supported the crusade. It was in industrial circles that the strongest proponents of Operation Mars made their appearance, for many were the producers of armaments and related products who found themselves with plant facilities swollen by the war demand and now facing the almost helpless problems of conversion to peaceful production. The military organization maintained by the world government for police purposes more than sufficed to suppress any internecine strife which could be humanly foreseen, but it was still infinitesimal in comparison to the great armies, fleets, air and space forces created and supplied by the huge munitions plants during the war. Many of such plants were so highly specialized that conversion to the manufacture of such things as vacuum cleaners and bathtubs proved literally impossible. Plants so specialized viewed Operation Mars with the billions to be expended therein as a godsend substitute for the armament contracts without which they could not hope to maintain the technical levels and the skills they had so long labored to achieve. As diverse as were the motives of the proponents of the operation, they soon welded together a solid front against the Orientals. Manipulating their best weapon the world news services, with consummate skill. At the head of this group stood a senator from America by the name of McLee. In furthering his cause, he moved in a direction diametrically opposite to that of his celestial opponent. McLee made no bones about avoiding the involutions of the pseudo-ethical arguments with which Kyle Orhan attempted to enmesh him and concentrated his fire directly upon the real crux of the situation, the finances. His strategy was to satirize and minimize, with dry and humorous comment, the oriental urges towards bucolic laces fair which beset him. With sardonic wit, he sent shaft after shaft of biting comment winging through the public press with such skill that those who supported the project did so with a smile upon their lips. Did you ever realize that short drinks in America cost more in one year than we ask for Operation Mars? This was one of his innocent, yet effective gambits. In one of his speeches before the full Senate, he referred with a gentle bitterness to the cost of women who had reached what he called the cosmetic age. Following each item with the amount of yearly expenditure devoted to it, he listed permanent waves, eyelash curlers, skin rejuvenators, falsies, girdles, lipstick, and all the myriad adjuncts of the beauty business. 
he showed that Operation Mars would cost far less than they, sadly and gently wondering whether a lesser expenditure might not be justified to bring the cosmic age to mankind. As McClee listed feminine accoutrements in meticulous detail, many a worthy senator would cast a comprehending glance at some fellow domestic sufferer. The glaring contrast between the costs of cosmic and cosmetic achievement made the headlines to the vast detriment of Kylo Ren's sanctimony. Zero, in Holt's sitting room at Emerald Bay, Spencer sat behind a cloud of acrid tobacco smoke and vented his rage at the stalemate in Congress. There they sit, on their fat bottoms, said he. A bunch of Asiatic mystics who want to persuade us to squat there gazing into our navels and musing on the virtues of inaction as a way of life. Forty long years I've been battling for space travel. I've worn every last hair off my head for it, I've talked myself deaf, dumb and blind for it, I've just about written my fingers off for it, hundreds of fine young fellows have lost their lives for it. And here comes some sanctimonious, sententious son of a mandarin blatting about how Confucius wouldn't like it. Holt was no less perturbed at the possible frustration of the enterprise than Spencer. Confucius has been dead a long time, he said, and I think the assumption that he would have been against it is entirely unwarranted. I know that General Iraden's conviction that we should carry out this plan is fervent, and there's a lot of religion in that fervor. Isn't there someone who could upset that oriental mysticism? Spencer shook his head wearily. Braden would be the man, of course but I've argued vainly with him to go before the Congress. He says everybody identifies him with high brass, and claims that people don't want to have anything to do with brass ever since the war ended. He thinks that anything he said would only make matters worse. And, of course, he's quite wrong, for the whole world, including our former enemies, recognizes him as the man who put an end to the war before civilization was entirely destroyed. He's stuck his neck out for every one of the space developments that really form the basic groundwork of our peace. And every time he did it, he invited unpopularity, criticism and opprobrium. Nevertheless, he overcame ridicule, doubt, bureaucracy and every single obstacle that could be put in his way. Even our sit-down strikers from East Asia know they wouldn't be where they could make their opposition felt if it weren't for him. He's the only man I know to whom even they might listen. If only he wasn't so modest and retiring. Sighed Holt. He just can't get it out of his head that he's anything but just another soldier serving the people. While Holt and Spencer were bewailing the threatening hiatus in their long cherished undertaking, Catherine Holt had been in the kitchen preparing a snack for the dispirited conferees. None of their remarks had escaped her. For several weeks she had noticed that Gary's usually high spirits had been drooping and had wondered whether this could be attributed only to the delays caused by the celestial long-windedness in Congress. She entered the sitting room bearing her offering of food upon a tray, and with a quiet little smile on her face. Catherine, my dear, said Spencer, if it wasn't for you and people like you, we'd never be able to keep up our morale during times like these. You keep your man's courage up the way you always have, and we'll find some way out of this dilemma sooner or later. That's very kind of you, Mr. Spencer, said Catherine. I'll do what I can. By the way, Gary, didn't I hear that you two were going to fly out to Kilui for a few days? I was thinking I'd like to take a trip to New York for a visit to Mother while you're gone. What would you think of that? An audacious idea had begun to whirl around in Catherine's head, for it had suddenly occurred to her that she might do more than simply keep up Gary's courage. But to put it into effect, she must go to New York, and she must go without Gary's knowing the real purpose she had in mind. It's a grand idea, Katie, said Gary. You pop along to New York and take a breather from handling all these queer creatures who want to go to Mars. You need a rest probably much more than I do. When Spencer had departed, Catherine opened all the doors and windows to rid the house of the pestilence which his stogies had left floating in the air, but her heart was unaccountably light. She felt sure that her plan would succeed. General Braden drew nervously on a cigarette and worried. 
a call from Catherine Holt seemed to add to the myriad difficulties in which Operation Mars had entwined him. From the insistence with which Catherine had sought the interview, he anticipated that she was going to attempt to influence him to find some other man than Gary Holt to command the expedition. The mere fact that she felt that way about it half inclined him to accede to her request when she presented it for he had his doubts about the effectiveness of a leader whose loyalties might be torn between an unwilling wife and even the greatest objective. He wanted every last man of the expedition to be heart and soul in it and not to have the slightest misgiving. Perhaps it might be well to appoint a different leader. On the other hand, what would be the effect on Congress and the general public? Might not a change in the command prove a boon to the opponents of the plan in Congress and elsewhere? Rumors of dissension within the directorship of the enterprise would begin to fly, talk of cold feet would become rife. Perhaps the integrity of the whole business might be called into question. He was engrossed in such thoughts when Catherine was shown in. Rising to meet her, he perceived her with a quizzical glance. There was no doubt that her hair was grayer than when he had last seen it a year ago. He summoned up the courage he always needed to talk to a woman. How nice to see you. Katie my dear, was his not entirely sincere greeting. How's everything in Emerald Bay? And how's your good husband? He's not well, General, answered Catherine with a wan smile. Is he really sick? Here it comes, thought Braden. He offered her a chair and seated himself beside her. Catherine looked at him fixedly. He's sick at heart, General, she almost whispered. Then the floodgates of her speech almost washed Braden off his feet. General, you are what is making him sick. He idolizes you. Everything is held up by Buddhism and Confucianism and all sorts of isms and he can't get through his head why you sit inactive and silent. You, the man who fought like a tiger when people wouldn't believe that men could ride in rockets. You, who really created Lunetu and the spaceships seemed to him to have slumped back into a narrow, military mentality when the whole world awaits your open advocacy of Operation Mars. He simply cannot understand how the man who sparked the enthusiasm of all those who are working day and night can sit in silence behind the screen of a soldier's preference for avoiding politics. He feels that it's as much your duty to fight for Operation Mars as it is his to command it. If you want him to get well, you'll get in there and bowl over these oriental objections like a set of nine pins. Catherine had risen and was practically pounding her small fists on Braden's desk. As for the general, he was momentarily incapable of answering. So violent was the reversal of thought within his mind that no words came. The graying woman had turned the tables on him, for he could not but admire the self-sacrificial tenor of her speech despite the embarrassing situation into which it put him. Her deep loyalty to her husband in coming here to reproach him with remissness aroused unbounded admiration. Katie, you're wonderful, he finally brought out. If that's the way you feel, everything's fine. Everything's fine? She said, what do you mean by that? As unjust as it may have been, Katie, I thought you were coming to persuade me to replace Gary with another man because you wanted to keep him at home. But after what I've heard, I know that you're braver than I. I'm going to match your courage and appear before Congress, although I'd much rather take Gary's place and lead the expedition. General, you can't get one member of this family all worked up over something and then let him stew in his own juice without hearing from the other Holt. Katie's eyes were moist above the relieved smile with which she looked back through the half-opened door at the astounded Braden.0, not many days later, Braden put on his best suit of civilian clothes and mounted the steps leading to the podium in the capital at Greenwich. The hopes of thousands were on his lips as he began his address. Gentlemen, as an old soldier obeying the orders of the President, I come before you to give an opinion on Operation Mars. I am too much of a realist to attempt to predict what might happen in the event of a surprise attack on us by intelligent enemies from some other planet. The results might well be so fantastic as to be incredible, and I'll leave prognostications of that nature to the authors of dime science fiction. But as a military man, I cannot but be concerned with our old Earth's vulnerability to external threat, 
and we must remember that Lunetta, our most potent concentration of military power, floats unprotected and unarmed in neighboring space. Any interplanetary attacker would be able to reduce that outer bastion with little or no effort, compared to taking effective possession of even the tiniest section of the Earth itself. A most venerable military principle states that the best protection for an isolated outpost is good reconnaissance. Should such a reconnaissance reveal that there's no menace to our outpost, we may contain our souls in peace. If so, we at least have gained some time in which to devise protective measures. Professor Hansen laid before you the cogent reasons why we must be convinced that Mars is inhabited by a race of intelligent creatures, and we may well assume that they are potential enemies until the contrary is ascertained. I'm sure I need not emphasize this simple principle with any fanciful horror stories. The history of our planet up to the present has always been that of two or more armed camps. To our great good fortune, all these camps are now united, and conflict can only come from somewhere in space and be directed against each and every one of us, just as we are preparing to enjoy the fruits of our dearly won peace. In my opinion, the future happiness of our good old earth has too much at stake to neglect any precautions whatsoever against some raid from space. That, gentlemen, represents my professional viewpoint. But there are a number of remarks I'd like to make about the general value of Operation Mars, and I offer for them your very serious consideration. From my earliest youth, I have despised the Greek proverb which claims that war is the father of events. Nonetheless, my whole life has been one consecutive revelation of the core of truth that lies within that proverb. Since the dawn of time, man has sought wings, but no sooner had they taken their first, faltering strokes than the newborn aircraft was swept into the capacious maw of the military. It required the immense expenditures of money which bred bombers and fighters throughout the whole earth to evolve the useful and reliable airliner of our present day. Let me ask you whether any scientist could dedicate himself to a more fruitful task than to freeing nuclear energy for the liberation of mankind from the yoke of physical labor? Nevertheless, only the dire need for an all-destructive weapon, the atom bomb, could have raised the fantastic sums needed for the nobler concept. Rocketry has followed a similar path. Do you believe that the thousands of scientists, engineers and craftsmen who labored for decades on rocket aircraft, guided missiles, and finally, on our great satellite vessels, envisaged in their loving work and ingenuity the diabolical ends to which their creations were often put? I tell you no. Gentlemen. Those men were animated by secret visions of reaching into the heavens, of bringing their fellow men closer to what our primitive ancestors felt was the outward manifestation of the deity and which was by them so worshipped, the stars, great and small. But the vast appropriations which were applied to the development of our present-day rocket ships could not be pried from the public purse save by the cogency of their overwhelming potency in war. During the last conflict it was quite plain that he who held control of space over the heads of his enemy held victory in his hands. We are today at peace, thanks be to God. Well may we apply advances in fighting aircraft to civil aviation. Well may we work frantically to convert the war-born destruction of atomic energy into a blessing for all mankind. And by all means, we should apply the billions spent on space travel and our little, war baby satellites to actualize that most ancient of dreams, flight into and among the stars of the heavens. Do not think that nowadays it is but a dream, nor that military necessity is that which gives Operation Mars its main right to be considered a valuable and practical enterprise. We must, I tell you, face up to the driving forces which heretofore have goaded civilization forward. Why did men yearn to sail the seas, generation after generation? The answer might be that seafaring is an economic necessity, because through it alone can world trade exist. Your real seaman, however, cares not a whit whether the cargo of his vessel upon the high seas be gold or grain. We may well doubt whether Columbus, on the quarter deck for the Santa Maria, was animated by a burning desire to reduce the freight rates on Indian tea, when he sought a new passage to Cathay and found America with wart his whores. 
the great adventurers, Marco Polo, Magellan, and Henry Hudson did not sail forth upon distant and dangerous oceans on occasions of economic urgency, nor of closely reasoned logic. Theirs was the fire of genius, the divine urge, the response to the challenge of the unknown. Again, why has the desire to fly plagued us humans since the days of Icarus and Daedalus? The mail bags and the passengers in their pressurized cabin are of small concern to your true pilot. He took to the air because, when he was a small boy, he had seen an eagle circling in the Empyrean blue, and because since that day some mystic longing constantly drew him upwards into the depths and distances of the sky. Explorers, seamen and flyers live their lives by certain elementary rules with which the Creator endowed them. Economic advantages to the generality of humanity come only in the train of their fundamental, basic drive. Gentlemen, if we really face it, we might find that it is actually unwise to inquire too stubbornly into the reasons that urge us to set afoot this expedition to Mars. You have all heard, quite clearly, that we have the necessary technical means to carry it out. Were we now to send out a call for volunteers? we should be swamped with applications from enthusiastic, enterprising youths, ready and eager to embark on the great voyage. When Isabella the Catholic granted Christopher Columbus request for the ships of his westering voyage, she little knew what amazing results would follow in its wake. But there was no question in her mind that any but the creator of all things had imbued his children with that urge into the unknown which distinguishes the pioneer. After prayerful watching, she fell in with the plan, secure in the knowledge that he knew the purpose of his endowment of Columbus with the spirit of adventure. Only through God has the door to our neighbors in space been opened. Shall we slam it in his face? Chapter 9, Headaches of a Spaceship Designer Holt's first task was the selection of his crews. His old war buddy, Tom Knight, had signed up without hesitation and Holt appointed him deputy commander and captain of his flagship. John Wigand, the man with whom Holt had spent many thirsty days in a pneumatic boat under the burning sun of the Indian Ocean, had immediately agreed to abandon his profitable automobile agency in Fort Worth as soon as the project took tangible shape. John was an old timer in space shipping, with an engineering background. He had been through the teething troubles of the Jupiter class and then directed the assembly of Lunetta personally and in situ. Holt knew his merciless meticulousness about the smallest detail, and for this reason had picked him out as chief engineer. Since geology promised to one of the most fruitful fields for investigation on Mars, Holt had succumbed to the blandishments of a solemn, spectacle wearing scientist by the name of Samuel Wolfe. A well known geologist of middle age, he had dreamed of the intentions of making an expedition along his professional lines, and had pestered Professor Rashley with applications to a point where he gave him a letter of recommendation to Holt. The latter interviewed him and was much impressed by the way Wolf had combined his plans for geological studies of the structure of Mars with various other objectives on the planet. Dr. Bergman, the light haired astronomer, assented immediately when Professor Hansen let him know that Holt desired him to be in the party. Hansen did not tell him that he had long since guessed that his secret dream was to go along, and had spoken strongly in his behalf. Since Holt's visit to Lunetta, Bergman had increased his efforts to the limit of human capabilities in order to squeeze every conceivable advantage from the existing opposition of Mars, when conditions favored observations and measurements. Bergman's equipment was kept busy to its ultimate capacity during this time. For six solid weeks he had lived in the observatory, returning only occasionally to Lunetta for sleep. He had kept the busy bees busy indeed, bringing his meals over from Lunetta to the observatory. Each returning Lunetta ferry carried a thick sheaf of data for Holt back to Kilui, as Bergman compiled what he thought might assist the planning. Then there was Glenn Hubbard of Los Angeles. For years he had been a civilian test pilot in the service of United Spacecraft, until the flight surgeons began to hint that he would last longer and enjoy himself more in a swivel chair behind a desk. He then became technical assistant to Spencer but his wide experience when testing the Jupiter class, particularly because it was he who had worked out their landing procedure, 
had been of inestimable value to every new design put out by the company. When Operation Mars was first announced, he immersed himself immediately in study of the glide characteristics and landing procedures which would face the landing boats in Mars' peculiar atmospheric structure, and came up with many valuable design tips. This aroused in him such enthusiasm for the whole project that he asked Holt if he might have a command. He wanted to strike a final blow for the cause to which he had dedicated his life, for flight in space, in which he had often risked his neck. The trip would be a high point for him ere he must retire into innocuous inactivity. Another captain was Charles Laroque, the French underground fighter in the last great war against the overrunning of Western Europe by Bolshevism. Unknown at first, he had finally emerged to fight the barbarians in the air, becoming the ace of the French aces who, at the peak of his powers, had joined the United States Space Forces to become one of the first great spaceship masters. Since the war had ended, Laroque had found no satisfactory outlet for his boiling energy, despite his fondness for social frippery and his many feminine conquests. Visiting with some wealthy acquaintances, he had accompanied them on an African hunting safari, but when his old friend Knight hinted that there was to be an Operation Mars, his request to Holt for a part in it figuratively burned up the mails. Zero, Holt called a conference of his key men at the plant of United Spacecraft, that they might be apprised of the state of advancement of the planning. He gathered them in the study of Richard Payton, the chief designer for a report by the latter on the manifold questions relative to the details of the designs. Dick Payton was an old timer at the business. When he and Spencer began their work together in the days of the early long-range rockets, it was his engineering conscience which had provided the balance wheel for Spencer's almost pestilent fantasy and furious creative drive. If Spencer was the man whose wide vision could connect seemingly unrelated factors and discover new solutions when no progress seemed possible, if he could win an argument with his own engineers with the same assurance that he could overpersuade a board of directors or a Pentagon party, Peyton was the lover of detail, paternal to his designers, never allowing an error in a drawing, no matter how insignificant. He had a strange gift with subcontractors, coordinating their efforts in producing the hundreds of special parts and auxiliary equipment which went into the building of great rocket ships. When the meeting was called to order, Peyton began with a report on the requirements for steering the great ships on their long voyage through space. He made it clear that steering could only be applied during the relatively short power applications. Between these power maneuvers, the ships would coast through space for weeks on end, like wandering meteorites, their flight paths predetermined by the direction and energy imparted to them during the preceding application of thrust. But, if the running position checks by star angle should show any departure from the pre-computed course, it would, of course, be necessary to enter a corrective maneuver, during which accurate steering would be as necessary as during the main maneuvers. No one needed to be told that the steering problem of the Mars vessels would be attacked by automatic mechanism, as was that of the mighty triple stages on their departures from Earth. Manual steering, as used in busy bees, could not be considered for any such high degree of accuracy as the navigation of the Mars vessels required. A gyroscopic plane of reference was to be established by a system of control gyros, rigid in space. So called program devices were slowly to displace this plane in angle during applications of power. Any deviation of the vessel from the attitude imposed by the gyros would then call into being the angle changing moments which would bring back the set attitude. Such control moments were to be generated by four relatively small rocket motors. These were to be mounted symmetrically at four opposite points on the periphery of the main motor. Each could be rotated around one axis. When all were set to zero, their jets would parallel the jet of the main motor. Yaw and pitch control would be given by changing the angles of one or the other pair of opposite jets, each moving conjointly an angle. Rotation of the vessel around her own longitudinal axis could be initiated or stopped by deflecting all jets clockwise or counterclockwise. 
the angular displacement of each steering jet was to be produced by a small electric motor whose motion was controlled by rheostatic devices coupled to the gyros. Up to this point, remarked Peyton, attitude control of spaceships is a routine problem. But the actuators of these control jets now are called upon to fulfill a novel function, for we are steering not a single ship, but a whole convoy. We shall hardly be able to produce mechanisms uniform enough so that there will not be very slight divergences in track and velocity at combustion cutoff. In the course of a long coast through space, the ships will therefore diverge more or less. The busy bees will find their trips from ship to ship growing longer and longer. Therefore, it will be necessary to close up the convoy from time to time. To do this with the main motors would call for a laborious turning of each vessel in space by its directional flywheels, so that the thrust of the main motor, even though applied but momentarily, would be in exactly the right direction. That would be quite an elaborate procedure for what is, after all, a very minor correction. We are therefore making provision to cut out the automatic gyro control devices temporarily, and are equipping the steering rocket jets with manual electric remote controls which permit them to be directed anywhere within a full 360 degrees around their axes of rotation. Thus, should it be found that a ship is moving too fast in line with its longitudinal axis, all four steering jets can be turned to face forward and their thrust will decelerate the vessel directly. Similarly, we can swing any ship into or out of the convoy column. The main advantage is that we can make really fine corrections with these fractional thrusts when compared to the main motors. Corrections can be made by small thrusts over extended periods rather than by short, but violent ones. You will, I think, easily appreciate the advantages of this modification. Next to come up was the question of waste disposal. To eliminate every pound of weight possible prior to each new power maneuver meant fuel saving and increased reserves of power. Such reserves might be of vital importance if a navigation check should show that any maneuver had not turned out entirely according to plan. The problem was to expel waste matter from the pressurized living spaces into the surrounding vacuum of space and simultaneously to prevent the accumulation of masses of such matter in the immediate proximity of the ships. Nothing, as a matter of fact, would prevent some discarded tincan from following faithfully throughout any portion of the voyage between power maneuvers. Peyton described a clever dodge which might solve this problem. It was planned to place waste matter in an airlock through a small door. The door would then be closed, and a piston impelled by the internal air pressure would project the waste with considerable velocity into the outer vacuum. It became plain that one of Peyton's pet projects was to connect this gadget with the ship's sewage system. He discoursed pridefully and solemnly at some length on the problems attending the use of the latter during long, unpowered stretches of the voyage under weightless conditions. So serious and detailed was his presentation that howls of laughter burst from his auditors. Peyton further reported that untied spacecraft was already in negotiations with the American Blower Corporation of Detroit for air regeneration equipment. This company had pioneered in the development of machinery of this kind for the pressurization of Lunetta, but here too was a knotty problem. First, the air would have to be freed of the carbon dioxide developed in the lungs by breathing. Air continuously exhausted from the living spaces would first pass through a dust filter and then traverse, under increased pressure, a tank into which water was simultaneously sprayed. The carbon dioxide would combine with the water under this increased pressure and form carbonic acid. Then, when the water was subsequently decompressed, the carbonic acid would bubble out as it does from the contents of a bottle of soda water, and be exhausted into the vacuum of space between the worlds. The air, now free of carbon dioxide, would be passed through a bone charcoal filter for deodorizing. Then it would be replenished with oxygen, the latter being carried in liquid form and hence requiring to be gasified. After this treatment, and before being readmitted to the living spaces, the air thus regenerated would require conditioning to the exact temperature, 
pressure and humidity desired for breathing purposes. The air regeneration system was closely integrated with the water recuperation system. Breath and perspiration would liberate more than one and one half liters of water daily per man, to be extracted by the system. This recuperated water, added to the utility water carried for cooking, dishwashing and the laundry machines, would increase the utility at the expense of the slowly shrinking potable water. It would be necessary to sterilize such water by distillation, recondensation and germicidal additives, for it would be unthinkable to jeopardize hygienic standards on a lonely, year-long trip, where so many people would live in such a restricted space and have access to such limited medical assistance. Measures to this end were considerably handicapped by the weight limitations which Peyton had found it necessary to impose upon the developing company. But this was not all, for the constituency of the air was closely tied in with the type of glass to be used in the portholes. Experience on Lunetta had confirmed this. There was a high concentration of ultraviolet in the light impinging on these windows being unaffected in its passage through empty space by any atmospheric filtering effects. This not only caused malignant conjunctivitis but also led to the formation of ozone in the living spaces. The Lunetta Cruz had frequently complained that she smelled of artificial mountain sun, and that it eventually gave them headaches. For some time, development of special window glass had been underway. Such glass was to absorb a considerable proportion of the ultraviolet radiation and likewise to reduce somewhat the glare of the sunlight. It was a tough assignment, for most glass is slowly disintegrated under the strong ultraviolet light. All this was completely novel to Dr. Wolf, who followed Peyton's remarks with rapt attention. But the longer he listened to the latter's dissertations on toilet problems and odors of ozone in space vessels, the more his mind concentrated upon a burning question which seemed to him vastly more important than all this detail, and to which he could find no answer with all the will in the world. Finally, he burst out when Peyton paused for a moment. Mr. Peyton, said he anxiously, what about the temperature in these spaceships? Away back in school, I learned that the temperature in space is absolute zero or minus 273 degrees centigrade. With an outside temperature like that, how in the world are we going to keep warm? Solar heating's the answer, Mr. Wolf, answered Peyton. You're obviously under some misapprehension about maintaining temperatures in spaceships. Space, you see, really has no temperature. What is temperature, anyway? It's only a way of expressing the rate of movement of molecules. The faster the molecules composing a body whirl about within it, the higher is its temperature. But space is composed of absolute vacuum and might as well have no molecules. So how can empty space have temperature? Aren't you splitting hairs, Mr. Payton? Certainly not, although I must admit that right now we're interested in a somewhat different problem, namely, what temperature does a body suspended in empty space assume? The body, of course, consists of molecules, and these may have motion and therefore temperature. Let's consider the simplest case, namely a sphere floating somewhere in space, remote from the earth and equidistant from the sun day one half will be irradiated by the sun, the other will be shaded. Thus one side will absorb heat radiation and the sphere will become warm. From the shady side, heat will be lost by re radiation. The sphere will continue to grow warmer until the rate of radiation equals that of absorption. At the temperature where this occurs equilibrium is established. This temperature of equilibrium is primarily dependent upon the distance of the sphere from the sun, the nearer it is to the latter. The more solar radiation is absorbed and the higher is the equilibrium temperature at which the sphere can re radiate the increased amount of heat absorbed. But does not the temperature attained by the sphere also depend upon the nature of its surface and above all on its color? A mirror finish reflects all radiation, while a black surface swallows it all. Quite right. But what applies to the irradiated surface also applies to the shaded side. A mirror finish does not re-radiate, while a black one greatly furthers re-radiation. If the sphere is completely shiny, it absorbs no heat on the sunny side and radiates none on the shady side. 
An entirely black sphere absorbs much and radiates much. Either is the same with respect to the temperature of equilibrium. It's not quite so simple when intermediate colorations between mirror and black are concerned, for then the so-called spectral absorptivity and emissivity play a considerable role. Solar radiation is a considerable portion of short wavelength energy, that is, visible and ultraviolet light, while the sphere, warmed but to moderate temperatures, radiates long wave, invisible infrared only. The absorptive capacity of some particular paint for short wave radiation may differ materially from its ability to radiate long waves. Thus there are different temperatures of equilibrium for the sphere at identical distances from the sun, and these vary according to the nature of the sphere's surface characteristics. But for a sphere whose surface is either completely reflective throughout the whole spectrum, or completely black in the absorptive sense, the temperature of equilibrium would be the same at the same distance from the Sunday you seem to be telling me, wondered Wolf, that whether a spaceship be painted with black or with reflecting paint, its temperature is wholly and solely dependent upon its distance from the sun? Why then, the interior of the vessels ought to get colder and colder? Because our distance from the sun will increase constantly during our trip out to Mars. Now wait a minute, said Peyton. That's another reason why we must take steps continuously to adjust our temperature of the sphere, we'll assume that it's black on one side and mirror reflecting on the other. That will make its equilibrium temperature at any given distance from the sun also dependent upon its attitude to the solar rays. If the black side is turned sunwards while the other is shaded, the sphere will heat up several hundred degrees, because it is absorbing much heat and can give off but little of it. But if we reverse its position and face the mirrored surface to the sun, the mirrored hemisphere will permit no heat to be absorbed, while the black side will be radiating the accumulated heat into space. Under those conditions, and, make no mistake about it, under those conditions only, the sphere may finally reach absolute zero. What is done in practice? Most of the exterior of the ship is polished to a mirror finish. Then the temperature simply remains exactly as it is, for there is neither heat absorption nor radiation to any extent. Being surrounded by vacuum, the vessels may be regarded as Brobdignagen thermos flasks, for in such flasks, that which was cold remains cold and that which was hot, hot. We regulate temperature accurately as follows, the reflecting surfaces of the ship are spotted by small, black areas shielded by silvered venetian blinds the black surfaces under them are exposed and absorb heat when the blinds are open when the blinds are closed their reflecting surfaces prevent the absorption of radiation by the black areas in practice there's an automatic thermostatic control system which operates the blinds jointly with the air conditioning plant now i understand it but tell me how about the propellants stored aboard the vessels do we not also have to maintain them somewhere within a limited temperature range? Wouldn't they otherwise boil or congeal? Quite right. They must be held quite accurately at one temperature. One factor is that the thin balloon fabric tanks could hardly withstand any such pressures as might be produced by extensive evaporation of the propellants. Another is the problem of maintaining accurately the predetermined mixture ratio between the two propellant components. This necessitates each of them being fed to the thrust unit at rather definite temperatures. The tanks will be painted aluminium. The propellant temperature will also be controlled by Venetian blinds, automatically operated by thermostats. There's quite a variation in the preferred temperatures of different parts of such a ship, incidentally. Think, for instance, of the liquid oxygen tanks for cabin pressurization. The oxygen in them shouldn't boil, despite its low boiling point of minus 183 degrees centigrade, in order not to produce any undesired pressure in the storage tank or leak losses through the safety valve above it. Then we have the food storage bays in which the food should lie deep frozen. And of course, we should like to spare ourselves the weight of refrigeration equipment with a capacity for almost three years store of comestibles. That can all be done with this method of blinds operated by thermostats. 
It's a simple and relatively trouble-free expedient and involves a low weight penalty. All this seems to me most intelligible, remarked Wolf, but I'm somewhat surprised that the Mars vessels will have this bright, mirror finish, when all the pictures I've seen of the Sinus Ferries to Lunetta show them as black as ink. Peyton smiled tolerantly. There's quite another reason for that, said he. Don't forget that the Ceriuses have to traverse Earth's atmosphere at such high flight speeds as to cause great heating of their skins by air friction. By coloring that skin black, the friction generated heat is dissipated by better radiation, and the skin does not reach such high temperatures as would otherwise be the case. The pilot's compartment and the disposable interior of a serious vessel are temperature insulated within the outer shell, and their temperature regulation is exclusively taken care of by the air conditioning system. But the Mars vessels have, as you know, no outer sheathing. That means that radiation balance must play the premier role in temperature control. At this point Holt injected himself into the conversation. If you'll excuse me, Sam, perhaps I can add a little illustrative touch to this Mars vessel temperature subject, he said. Lunetta remains in the umbra of the Earth for almost one half of each of her revolutions around it, during the equinoxes at least. She too is painted silver and uses the same method of temperature regulation which Dick has just described. Now we've noticed that the regulating blinds hardly change their angle even when passing through the umbra, when there is no sunlight at all. That happens because the heat capacity of the station is so great compared to the slight amount of rare radiation through the usually half-opened blinds that a single hour is hardly enough for the interior temperatures to react to the absence of solar radiation and to affect the thermostats. Dick also forgot to mention another factor, namely the heat which is constantly being liberated in the operating spaces. In the case of Lunetta, there's a continuous utilization of some 15 kilowatts of electrical energy. This is converted into heat via lighting units, hot plates, motors, and the like. Then too, there are some 80 men in Lunetta's peacetime complement. You'd hardly believe what a lot of heat 80 men, each eating 4,000 calories of food per day, can put out. They alone are a very efficient heating plant. In point of fact, the blinds on the shady side are almost constantly wide open in order to expel all that heat. Otherwise I can assure you that it would gradually get uncomfortably warm. John Wigand decided to put his oar in at this point. Speaking of electricity, what are you going to do about that in these Mars ships? Will it be the same setup as in Lunetta? John had been intimately associated with assembling the power station in Lunetta and was vaguely remembering a lot of almost forgotten difficulties. No indeed, Johnny, answered Peyton. Not only the problem, but the whole build-up of our Mars ship power plants differs in several respects from those of Lunetta. Her current requirement is a relatively steady 15 kilowatts, more or less. When she's in the umbra, her steam generator naturally cuts out because there's no solar radiation reaching her reflector, and that's about half the time at the equinoxes. The load is taken over by accumulators, so the generator, when it's operating, has to furnish 15 kilowatts to the mains and another 15 to recharge the batteries so that they can carry the load during the next passage through the umbra. The picture on the Mars ships is quite different, for there are no repeated passages through the shadow of the Earth. On the other hand, when power maneuvers are in effect, each ship calls for some 70 kilowatts for steering purposes. The earlier propulsive maneuvers last much longer than the later ones. So we shall draw the major part of the electric current from batteries and jettison a part of the batteries afterwards, which will economize on propellants by decreasing the mass of the ship when the next maneuver comes up. The intervals between maneuvers will be very long, so that a trickle charge can easily bring back batteries pretty well run down by a power maneuver. All in all, it means that, even with the heavy currents called for during the relatively short periods when the rocket motors run, we can get by with generators of moderate capacity. Lunetta needs a minimum generator capacity of 20 kilowatts and we have actually installed 35 kilowatts, but on the Mars ships, 16 kilowatts generators will do. During their long, unpowered flight periods, 
most of the current will be used by the blowers and pumps for water and air regeneration and recuperation. All of these together will call for about 6 kilowatts, leaving ample current available for such auxiliaries as electric stoves, washing machines, remote annunciators, thermostatic controls and the like. We shall not need, except to a small extent, electric lighting, for unlike Lunetta, our ships will almost always fly in sunlight. Of course the batteries will stand an occasional peak load of 40 or 50 kilowatts if it is not applied just prior to a power maneuver. The power plants of the Mars vessels will be operated by turbo generators fed by sun-heated boilers. We shall require solar reflectors of 94 square meters surface to produce the required 16 kilowatts, and oddly enough, that's more surface than is used for Lunetta's 35 kilowatts. The apparent discrepancy is explained by the need to keep up our 16 kilowatts even when near Mars, where the solar energy caught by the reflector is less than half of that near the Earth's orbit. After the vessels have been drawn in by Mars's gravitation, they will circle him and be in his umbra during one third of the time required for each circle. Then the problem will become much like Lunetta's. The mean output of our 16 kilowatts generators will be reduced to 11 kilowatts per vessel, and that's getting close to the tenuous current requirements of the air and water regeneration systems. It is, in a sense, fortunate that the crews of the ships awaiting in their satellite orbits the return of the landing craft will be reduced by the number of the landing party. This will diminish our current requirements during this critical period. Exhaust steam condensers present a particular problem in the Mars vessels. Those of you who have visited Lunetta will remember the spokes connecting her rim with the central station. These serve as condenser tubes reducing the aqueous vapor to liquid which the feed pumps can return to the boiler. It was possible to use this expedient on Lunetta because the spokes are shaded by the rim, due to Lunetta's rotating in the plane of the ecliptic. But the Mars vessels are not wheel shaped, and their attitude in space with respect to the sun may change continually. Hence we propose to locate the condensers behind the reflectors, because, since the reflectors must always face sunwards when the turbines are running, there will invariably be shadow behind them. But here we encounter a rather ugly difficulty. Our power plant has an overall efficiency of 30% only. Thus 70% of the solar energy from the reflector must be dissipated into space by the condenser. For the low exhaust steam temperature of 46 degrees Celsius, the condensing surface must be double that of the reflector. You may argue that there'd be no particular problem in placing a condenser with twice as much surface as the reflector in the latter's shadow. The design of such a condenser would be elongated and extending to the rear, so that it would radiate heat not only directly away from the sun, but also laterally. But that configuration would be rather bulky and unhandy, and we must not forget that the reflector with the condenser must be swivel mounted so that, for any attitude of the ship in space, it can face the sun directly. For all these reasons, we have decided to substitute mercury vapor for the more conventional steam. Such turbines are not a new departure and have the advantage of permitting higher admission temperatures to the turbine than steam and consequently the exhaust is hotter. That will give us a temperature of 120 degrees Celsius in the condenser. This, of course, will make the surfaces radiate much more actively and we can get by with relatively compact condensers which will easily fit within the shadow of the reflector. Say, Dick, said Holt when Peyton stopped talking for a moment, what about the electrical energy for radio communication? Have we got any figures on that? Peyton drew a deep breath and plunged on. Here's the communication story. According to the plan, we must consider three separate types of radio communication. The first type is for intership work. There's not much to that. It's short range stuff, not much different from the two way command sets used between airplanes in formation. Each unit will use only a couple of watts and draws practically nothing from the mains. The second type is for middle distances of about 10 to 20,000 miles. It will be needed primarily for communication with the landing party when the spaceships are circling Mars. Likewise, 
It will be useful for contact with lunar or terrestrial stations after return to Earth's orbit. We propose to equip three ships with transmitters for this middle distance service, and also one transmitter for each landing craft and ground vehicle. All vessels, landing craft and vehicles will of course have appropriate receivers. These middle distance transmitters will draw about 5 kilowatts each, and since the times during which they will transmit are short, the mains of the vessels will take care of it nicely. But the third and most problematical radio is for long, interplanetary ranges. These will be covered by the so-called high-duty radio sets, and these will have to be constructed as wholly separate structural entities, independent of the structures of the vessels. Two of the three cargo ships will each carry one of these sets. As a matter of fact, if the navigation should not be accurate enough to allow the command of the expedition to effect notable savings in propellants, the command may well be forced to abandon both these sets in the Martian satellite orbit, for we have been unable definitely to assign any portion of the payload of the passenger vessels to these radios. The idea is to erect a similar station on Earth with which they will communicate, although the boys are not yet quite sure of its configuration. It's not impossible that one exactly like those of the Mars vessels will operate from Lunetta's orbit. The range of these stations must suffice for two-way communication throughout the entire trip. As a matter of fact, this radio communication problem is giving us about as much trouble as any of them. You probably all know that we've been working with old man Lassini, and he's running this show. I don't know as much about radio as I'd like to, considering how my problems tie in with it. Communication across hundreds of millions of kilometers apparently calls for concentrating the radio energy into a ray pencil of small divergence. The radio boys are still pretty much puzzled over this. If they reduce their wavelength, the same size of directional antennas will give better concentration, but then they cannot build transmitters with enough output. On the other hand, longer wavelengths ease the transmitter problem, but require such large and cumbersome antennas that they give us acceleration troubles during power maneuvers. Right now, I'm still a little vague as to the outcome of this tail chasing, but it seems quite definite that these high-duty radio sets will have to be separate from the ships, not only structurally, but as to sources of power. Peyton had hardly closed his mouth after this speech than the door was flung open and Spencer burst in waving a newspaper. His usually solemn countenance was wreathed in smiles. Hey! Read this! He shouted joyously, it's all in the papers. The Congress has voted us a whole two billion dollars. Boys, we're off in a cloud of dust. Cosmic dust, at that. Chapter 10 how an army of technicians works all through 1981 and 1982 the key men of Operation Mars had been enmeshed in tremendous intricacies of problems and work, for the astronomers had set the date of departure at March 21, 1985, and there could be no tampering with it. The assembly shops of United Spacecraft were filled with purposeful bustle. The three landing craft stood nearly completed in a wide, spacious, but low-roofed hangar one behind the other. At first glance, they resembled enormous flying wings. But closer examination revealed individual peculiarities. Their wings were very much swept back. Throughout their span of 153 meters they were exceptionally thin in section and had the familiar sharp leading edges which point to supersonics. Those leading edges were on hinges like the flat trailing edges except that they could not be depressed to the same extent. United Spacecraft had developed this expedient many years before and it was in use on the telescoping wings of the Sirius vessels. Its purpose was to improve the slow flight characteristics of the thin supersonic airfoils which, after descending through the sonic barrier, were unsuited for the lengthy subsonic glide and the ensuing landing. Elevens, the well-known combination elevators and ailerons, were located at the trailing edges on the outboard ends of the wings. The cylindrical hulls, almost insignificant beside the huge wings, protruded but little fore and aft of the central wing section. They were 22 meters long, 
4.7 meters in diameter and sharp-nosed, while the afterbody terminated in the familiar flat base of rockets. Behind this was a cruciform empennage, so tiny in comparison with the wings as to arouse curiosity concerning its purpose. In actuality, it was proposed to control the craft within the Martian atmosphere by means of the rudders atop the wings and with the elevens only. The cruciform impenages with their own small control surfaces would serve when the wings had been shed on the surface of Mars. Then the landing craft would assume the guise of rockets pure and simple, and would launch themselves from a vertical position, standing on their stabilizing fins in order to return wingless to the satellite orbit in which their mother ships awaited them. One of the three boats had retractable skis, in contrast to her sister's conventional tricycle landing gear. Peyton and Spencer had scratched their heads for many a weary hour over the problem of landing these craft on Mars. Dr. Bergman had said that he couldn't assure them that there was any place large enough hard enough and smooth enough for a landing with wheels at the computed speed of 197 km per hour. So they accepted Bergman's suggestion that the first landing be made on skis in the snow-covered South Polar region, and conveyed it to the Space Forces. This suggestion, as appealing as it might appear at first blush, added no inconsiderable additional difficulties to the landing problem. Holt and Braden hesitated long before finally acceding to it, for it meant that the first echelon would be down in a region from which they could never return to the satellitic orbit under their own steam. This was because the satellitic orbit in the plane of the ecliptic could not be reached from that latitude. Hence, the first echelon after debarking would have to set out in their land vehicles towards the equator, in the hope of discovering a suitable landing area for the two remaining wheeled craft, or, if worse came to worst, preparing one. Such a surface voyage would most certainly face them with a passage through a zone of thaw and moisture, where the ground characteristics would be unknown. Holt and Braden's acceptance of this proposal made the enterprise of the first landing party an adventure upon whose outcome depended the success of the whole expedition, and which might bring all sorts of surprises. The hulls of the landing craft were arranged with the pilot's compartment far forward, with seats for pilot co-pilot, flight engineer and radioman. It had wheel controls and a mighty instrument panel. Hidden by the latter and jammed forward into the nose section were various electrical devices and the automatic course-keeping equipment, which would come into play when the wingless hull took off rocket fashion to return to a satellite orbit. Abaft of a small radio bay was a large cabin for the personnel and equipment of the landing party. It was about four meters long and filled the whole cross-section of the hull, thus exhibiting no marked distinctions from the cargo space of a medium-sized transport. Dot in its center, just atop a hermetic loading hatch, was the location for a special caterpillar for Mars. This could be passed through the hatch after landing by means of lowering tackle attached to the ceiling. Surrounding the vehicle there was ample room for food and other supplies. Flat couches for some 18 persons lined the walls, which had two rows of portholes for exterior vision of the occupants of the couches. Still further aft were two large propellant tanks, most of whose contents would be required for the rocket takeoff from Mars. The tankage bay was some 7.5 meters long. In the afterbody were located the turbopump, the gas generator and the valves and tubing of the rocket propulsion unit, with the motor proper at the extreme tip. Despite this motor's ability to develop the same 200-ton thrust as the top stage of a serious ship, the diameter of its discharge nozzle was but half the latter's. This smaller diameter pointed to the contemplated use of the motor in the Martian atmosphere. There had been an early decision to fly the landing craft into the terrestrial satellite orbit without disassembling, unlike the space vessels proper. This could be done by putting them in the place of the top stage of a Sirius vessel, and permitting the two Sirius boosters to lift them to a point where their own rocket plants could take over and provide the final velocity increment for attainment of the orbit. Their enormous wings, of course, would be dismounted, being freighted up in sections in the course of the regular supply operations. 
then they would be reassembled in space and mounted on the hulls prior to the final departure. The master plan called for a special expedient applying to the ski equipped landing craft only. This craft would, of course, need the same propellant capacity as the others in order to reach the orbit of departure. But since it was to be abandoned after landing near the Martian South Pole, it would need no propellants for the return. It had been computed that each landing craft would expend but 15 tons of its total propellant tankage of 128 tons to depart from the satellite orbit around Mars and to land on his surface, the remainder being needed for return to the orbit. The 113 tons in the ski equipped craft would thus be available for other purposes. Holt suggested that considerable supplementary equipment to ease the exceptionally difficult problems of the first landing party be made available to them in the extra load thus disposable. It was decided to remove the large plastic tanks of the ski equipped craft in the terrestrial orbit and to replace them with smaller ones which would suffice for the landing maneuver on Mars. That made available a volumetic capacity of some 12 meters by 4.5 meters in diameter which could carry a weight of not less than 125 tons of payload, where the other landing craft had but 12. Three big caterpillars would be the key equipment of this cargo, and with them the landing party would find itself with adequate transportation for the long trip towards the Martian equator.0. The Mars vessels themselves were under construction in one of the other buildings, but the onlooker could as yet discern but little of the clumsy outlines of these, the backbones of the expedition. Here and there isolated groups were being check assembled and then taken apart again for shipment into the orbit of departure. A casual glance into the great building conveyed the impression that one of the old harbingers of the air age was being resurrected to wit, a rigid dirigible like those which successfully attacked the kingdom of the air some eighty odd years before. The enormous propellant tanks of plastic fabric, thin, folded and empty, lay in stacks one upon the other and were reminiscent of hydrogen or helium balanids from the tanks of the long departed zeppelins. Not far distant, the noise of riveting hammers echoed through the filigree tracery of tubular trusses like those of some arched bridge. Eventually the tanks would be suspended in these structures. All long frames were sectional, connected by screw joints at certain intervals, for easy stowage in the holds of serious vessels. One of the spherical personnel nasals for a passenger vessel was inflated in one corner of the great assembly hall. It was blocked up on a flat, wooden stand, appearing for all the world like a glistening, silver balloon some ten meters in diameter. Within it, a crew of men were working on the interior fittings, having entered by the already completed entrance airlock by which the moderate internal pressure was prevented from escaping. The job in hand was to adapt and fit the electrical wiring and the rubber tubes for the air circulation system. When completed, these, like all the other fittings, would again be removed so that the nasals might be freighted up to the departure orbit collapsed, like the propellant tanks. There it was that the final assembly was to take place. In the upper part of the nacelle was the control room. This would be the foremost element of a Mars ship after final assembly and would contain a bewildering assortment of gauges, gyro gear, radio equipment, and operating panels. The uppermost segment, which would form the extreme nose of the space vessel, was the forward astrodome. Through it or through one of the seven others strategically arranged around the sphere, all angles could be visually covered. Each astrodome was a hemispherical glass bowl about one meter in diameter, through which the navigators might take the stadiometric angles of heavenly bodies required for running fixes. Light could enter the nacelle through a large number of smaller portholes liberally interspersed between the astrodomes. The deck below the control room in the spherical nacelle contained four sleeping compartments segmentally arranged around its periphery as was the captain's cubicle. The next lower deck was composed of two large living compartments, a radio office and a small library which might also be used as a chart room. On this same deck, air and water regeneration equipment was located, and space was left for a sick bay, a toilet and Peyton's famous garbage gun. The part of the great sphere that would be closest to the propellant tanks after final assembly contained the galley the food storage and a water tank. 
the entrance airlock was at the very bottom. Communication between the various decks was through central and concentric openings through which ran a fireman's pole, for the weightless condition which would obtain throughout the voyage rendered any sort of ladder or stairs superfluous. Rocket minded visitors often expressed wonderment that there was no sign of propulsive power plants in evidence, and there was an interesting and ingenious answer to their questions. Long before, the designers had decided to use the well-tested sinus cargo spaces. The rocket motors themselves were welded on and the diameter of their nozzles filled out the whole after section of the ferry vessels which they conventionally propelled. It was at this point that old Spencer's flexible ingenuity had saved the day. When you're assembling in the orbit of departure, just drop the series of their rocket motors and install them in the Mars vessels, he had said. Payton had objected to leaving a lot of valuable ferry ships circling indefinitely and impotently around the Earth, whereupon Spencer went on, you won't have to do that at all. A Sirius doesn't need 200 tons of thrust to get back to Earth. She can do it with a couple of thousand kilos if they work a bit longer. So you just ship up a few propulsion plants from the old rocket fighters and install them in place of the cannibalized thrust units. They are so small that they will not fill out the openings in the sterns of the ships, but we can have some sheet metal cover plates made up in sections to be installed around their little nozzles to cover the open wounds. The plates will go into the cargo spaces without difficulty. Minus zero. Not long after the World Congress handed down its historical decision, Professor Ashley the Wise, graying head of the World Research Board lived up to his promise and assigned suitable research institutes, university facilities and specialized companies to a vast number of partial research and development problems related to Operation Mars. The difficult task of coordinating this worldwide program with the constantly changing design and construction work going on in Long Beach came under the cognizance of the Development Commission appointed by Braden. This commission drew the contracts in detail and supervised the distribution of work. Holt, Spencer, and Payton were members. When Operation Mars began to take tangible shape, a veritable army of engineers and technicians went to work on a wide variety of problems of which instrumentation for Martian conditions was not the least difficult. Pressure altimeters for the Martian atmosphere were developed in conjunction with other types and special gyro compasses for the caterpillars replaced magnetic instruments in view of the lack of information on Mars's magnetism. In order to set the control gyros on the ships and to adjust the ship's attitude in space for a power maneuver, a new and ingenious device had been developed. The problem was to adjust the gimbal system of the attitude gyros to a direction established in each individual case by the navigators for both the main power maneuvers proper, and the corrective maneuvers as obtained by the running navigational fixes. This being accomplished the ship had to be brought into the same attitude in space. The Sperry Company in Great Neck had developed a device for this purpose which worked as follows. Two small telescopes were mounted on a gimbal system in which the position gyros were suspended. These telescopes were to be centered on two fixed stars and kept on them by light-sensitive cells. This established a plane in space upon which an arbitrary system of reference with three coordinates could be built up, having the vessel itself as a center. Three scales attached to the prime axis of the gimbal system could be set to the angularity of the desired three-dimensional heading as referred to this arbitrary system of reference. After this had been done, the gyros were started, and this brought the entire gimbal system automatically into the prescribed special attitude. When, after several minutes of operation, this attitude was attained, the triple attitude flywheels of the ship were set in motion and continued to run until the ship itself coincided with the special attitude of the control gyro system. The purpose of this device was to eliminate lengthy adjusting to and fro, and to bring the Mars vessels more rapidly and more accurately to the desired headings for any power maneuvers. There were a great number of mathematical labors to be performed aside from such technical developments as those described. First, there was the task of recomputing the voyaging ellipses to comply with the departure date and time selected. As a navigational essential, it called for the utmost precision, although not affecting the basic layout of the ships. 
into these computations would enter accurate elliptical orbits for both Earth and Mars. The complicated interaction between solar and planetary gravities when the vessels approached either planet, not to mention aberrations in the flight paths produced by other heavenly bodies such as Jupiter and the terrestrial and Martian moons. This last mentioned factor called for the closest scrutiny. Furthermore, it was necessary to run another set of computations for the four main power maneuvers as affected by these more accurately worked out data. The periods of power application would be long, particularly the earlier ones, and it would be necessary that the ship's attitudes coincide with their curved, powered flight paths. This could only be done by gradual alteration of the spatial attitudes, such alteration being impressed by the control gyros in accordance with a set time program. The initial power maneuver of departure from the terrestrial orbit would last 66 minutes, more than a full hour, and during that time a ship would more than half circumnavigate the Earth along the departure orbit. The velocity would change but slowly until the final hyperbolic escape velocity was reached, and this would give the track of departure a marked curvature, to be accurately complied with by the control gyros. All the other power maneuvers posed the same problem, although to a continually lessening degree. Bitter experience it taught the space forces that captains and navigators must be freed as far as possible from involved computations while under the stresses of a voyage. Burke's adventure with Hercules had redoubled the efforts to furnish ship commanders with flight data already prepared for all eventualities and unforeseen deviations from the prescribed track from which they could determine proper procedures immediately and without lengthy calculations. The high accuracy required for navigation in interplanetary space even made a further step necessary to prepare the Mars expedition. The vast program of the many thousands of flight path calculations required to cover the multitude of variations encountered by the most minute deviation from the predetermined track could only be handled with the help of huge electronic computers, which since 1940, had begun to relieve mathematicians of the burden of tedious numerical calculations. These electronic superbrains supplied their results in the form of a magnetic tape, on which the solution was imprinted in a magnetic pattern. The hieroglyphs on the tape were usually decoded by a separate printing machine which retransformed them into ordinary figures. What was more obvious, then? than to utilize the magnetic tape itself for the guidance and control of the ship, rather than to have the navigator first take figures from a table and adjust the control devices accordingly. It was comparable to running a punch tape printed with musical notes directly through an electric piano, which played the symphony, although without expression yet with absolute assurance against discords. Several thousand magnetic tapes were compiled from the many computations and each ship was to carry such a collection for its navigation. A handbook, crammed with diagrams and auxiliary tables, served the navigator as a key for picking the proper tape once a certain deviation from the prescribed track had been ascertained by running fixes. Notwithstanding all these preparations, it had been thought necessary to develop a novel type of electronic computer, small and light enough to be taken along by each of the expedition's ships. These computers were to stand by for entirely unforeseen events and were capable of producing guidance tapes while en route. Zero, a particularly broad program was the development of synthetic training devices and synthetic testers. Both faced the problem of reproducing as accurately as possible the circumstances under which certain vital components would operate, and also those which would affect the humans who would take part in the expedition. Synthetic testers were typified by the control simulating device. The weight of the Mars vessels would be reduced from 3,720 tons to almost 50 tons during the voyage, by the exhaustion of propellants and this reduction in weight would reduce the so-called mass moment of inertia, profoundly affecting the operation of the automatic controls. The control simulating device permitted an accurate laboratory test of the functioning of the control mechanisms under a broad variety of operating conditions. This would greatly reduce the risks attending any mechanical malfunction or some unpleasant surprise or other in the physical behavior of the control gear during the voyage itself. In order to study the behavior of the control system on such a device, 
The oscillation susceptible system of the automatically controlled ship was simulated by a complicated electronic hookup. This permitted an exact determination of the way an initial angular displacement impressed upon the vessel would be corrected by the automatic controls. It would show whether the attitude adjustment was rapid or deliberate, whether or not there was overcorrection, and how many corrective oscillations took place, or finally, whether the controls might throw the ship into the dreaded flutter which might break it to pieces. At the same time, the control simulating device afforded a splendid means of regulating the control mechanism to its most favorable setting for each of the greatly variable operating conditions. The synthetic training devices, on the other hand, were evolved with the idea of giving to the crews advance preparation in meeting and overcoming the problems they would meet on the voyage, even before it started. There were special training devices which duplicated the entire electrical system of the Mars vessels. These were especially for the training of the troubleshooters. Such devices afforded a field for the malicious talents of the instructors, in that they could produce intentional malfunctions to test the ingenuity and handiness of their victims. They might tear a single wire out of one of the hundreds of jack plugs or shove a burned match between the contacts of some inconspicuous relay. Stopwatch in hand, they stood around the great masses of wiring and switches while the troubleshooters labored to find and repair the defect in the shortest possible time. Then there was a complete, working mock up of the air and water regeneration plant. Here, the routine maintenance jobs, such as filter cleaning, gasket changing, and valve placing, could be practiced. The more serious malfunctions were, of course, not neglected especially those where speed of repair was of the essence. The crews were trained in blower troubles. No juice problems, defects in the water pump of the carbonic acid absorption tank, plugging of the oxygen supply and similar emergencies which might make the air unbreathable. Each and every emergency could be synthetically reproduced in all its natural horror. There was also a synthetic flight training device for the landing craft crews. It consisted of a pilot's cockpit from a landing craft, complete with all instruments. In it the pilot and his helpers could undergo the whole gamut of the landing procedures from the departure out of the orbit to the touchdown. Here they could be trained in coordinating altitude and speed. An elaborate electronic flight path simulator on the instrument panel accurately reflected the craft's response to control movements. Even a Martian landscape was portrayed on the rolling carpet that passed before the eyes of the pilot as he synthetically flew along. The presentation piece among the training devices was the command post. It consisted of a complete personnel nacelle of a passenger vessel situated centrally in a specially built planetarium. A practice run in the command post was almost uncanny in the verisimilitude with which it reproduced the conditions under which the crew of Mars vessel would someday work and live and have their being. Of course the pilot's cabin was equipped with the same maze of operating panels, warning lights, gauges and radios as the actual cabin. Through the astrodomes could be seen the brilliant reaches of the firmament. The sun, the earth, the moon, not to mention Mars with his dual attendants could be projected in any desired dimensions upon the dome of the planetarium. They and the other planets could be made to move against the background of the fixed stars. No crew ever went through the dry run of the voyage which this simulator offered without being deeply affected. The difficult final maneuver, the maneuver of adaptation upon return to the terrestrial orbit, when practiced in the simulator, took place as follows. The great sunlit shape of the Earth's sphere appeared on the velvet black backdrop of the planetarium's dome. As the vessel gradually drew nearer, accompanied by an accurate portrayal of the increasing velocity, this great shape covered and uncovered various fixed stars as it moved along, seeming to grow in size to the eyes of the anxious navigator as he lay within his astrodome. He measured the angle between Earth and certain of her neighbor stars, thus getting a fix from his pre-computed parallax tables. Chronometer in hand, he read the seconds at which certain of the stars near the Earth's rim were obscured by it and compared these times with what they should have been according to his tables. Then, as a check, he made a parallax measurement on the moon. 
when he was satisfied with his observations and had good coordination between his fixes as found by different means, he would again consult his tables and then, through the interphone, would pass on to the command the complete data on how to set up the necessary maneuver for entering the orbit of arrival. The captain would then aim his two telescopes, mounted on the gyro gimbals, at two reference stars on the dome of the planetarium and fix their positions by means of his photocells. He would set the course the navigator had given and start his gyros and flywheels. But where the course change would have turned the ship in reality, here it was the planetarium that moved around the nacelle, causing the entire firmament, sun, moon, earth and stars, to parade across its dome so that it appeared that the ship was acquiring its new attitude in space. Finally, when they had reached the position called for by the ship's new attitude, the motion stopped and the navigator would continue his observations from one of the other asteroids. When the time came to apply thrust, the preparatory motions and the maneuver itself in the simulator called for exactly the same manipulation of switches and levers as in actuality. The same warning lamps flashed, the same gauge hands trembled over their dials as though the flight were real. Even the muffled thunder of the rocket exhaust could be heard. Dim and distant, it would only reach the occupants by transmission through the metal parts of the ship, for the vacuum of space cannot carry sound. But there was one control panel in the mock up which in reality would be absent. Behind it sat John Wigand with a diabolical grin on his face. He could hear distinctly the piteous conversation between the engineer and the captain as he produced instrument readings on their panels calculated to drive them to desperation. Hearing their planned corrective measures, he could block their success by a turn of the wrist. One after another, he conjured up malfunctions to plague them. Suddenly, in the midst of a power maneuver, the respiration blower might stop. One of the four motors of the steering gear would show suspiciously high amp airage. The worst and emotionally most disturbing trick he would play would be to indicate on several instruments simultaneously a malfunctioning of the main rocket motor. This would include a most lifelike imitation of stuttering or howling in the otherwise steady growl of the exhaust. Then there was a matter of only seconds in which the captain had to do the right thing or else endanger the entire vessel. Every now and then, John would succeed in proving to some captain that his presence of mind wasn't all it ought to be. Looking at the victim with a cynical grin, he would remark, There are some mistakes a man makes but once in a lifetime, and not because he learns a lesson from the first one, either. He only makes the one because he hasn't the chance to make any more. Of course the command post simulator had no real danger attached to its operation, it wasn't a life or death matter but it served to fill Holt's record book on his personnel with vital data. An error and its consequences could be thoroughly discussed when committed here. Errors made could be countered later by the unhurried processes of logic, and the best means of preventing or correcting could be thought out at leisure. Some definite sequences of events could be repeated and repeated until the correct response had been drilled into the command to a point where it became a conditioned reflex. The command post simulator proved to be an invaluable aid in preparing crews for the massive difficulties which technological troubles might foist upon them during the trip, and its high cost was more than justified thereby. As the training proceeded, the command post simulator was to undergo a fate which had not been predicted by either Spencer or Holt, both of whom had shared in its basic conception nor did any of the many scientists and engineers who had brought it to a state of highly ingenious perfection have any suspicion of its eventual lot. The close of the date of eventual departure of the expedition approached, and the more millions were swallowed up in Operation Mars, the greater became the number of very important persons who could not refrain from getting a peep behind the scenes of this most titillating of all projects. Mostly they were driven by a combination of sense of responsibility and just plain curiosity. In ever increasing numbers they swarmed around the building slips of United spacecraft for inspections of the landing craft and the components of the Mars vessels. Almost all of them wanted a trip up to the orbit of departure to watch the final assemble, but at that point, 
General Braden called a very decided halt indeed. This made the command post simulator a favorite spot for cigar bearing senators and efficient looking executives. All sorts of dignitaries could be found in it, including Indian potentates and venerable, clever old Chinese, who were frequently said to be influential members of the United Congress. Gray headed generals renewed their youth in the simulator as they envisaged realistically what would face the expedition. Braden had found a smooth and satisfactory treatment for these gentry, for, while they often cluttered his efficient plans, he did not feel it wise to risk their displeasure by neglect. And so it came about that John Dwigand often found it necessary to restrict his tender ministrations in the matter of producing synthetic interstellar disasters. Whenever a practice run for once went off without incident, the otherwise tortured crews would remark, well, that was a VIP run, all right. Minus zero, meanwhile, Sam Wolf had not been idle and had lined up his program of geological studies on Mars under the supervision of Ashley's organization. Holt had promised him a detail of 12 men for excavation and similar geological purposes. This stimulated a veritable flurry of enthusiasm in the development and preparation of suitable digging and drilling tools. The latter presented no small problem in view of the limited tonnage assigned to Wolf's equipment, and particularly because they would have to operate under wide temperature variations in Mars's thin air and be manipulated by men encumbered by space suits. Among other things, Wolf procured a series of colored photographs of terrestrial rock formations of great variety in order to promptly recognize and classify those of Mars, so that he might purposefully lay out his work. The World Research Board took over in its psychological section a weird assortment of gifts which from all directions were pressed upon hold for transmission to the Martians. Each giver wished to dispose the Martian recipients favorably towards Earthmen and to acquaint them with the beauties, achievements and peculiarities of life on this terrestrial sphere. There was a marvelous collection of colored photographs showing every aspect of the Earth's vast countenance. Some were taken from Lunetta and showed Earth as an enormous disk of oceans, clouds and continents. There were pictures of towns and cities in all regions, landscapes, mountains, forests, factories, observatories, ships, railways, automobiles, aircraft and people of all races and colors at work and at home. Flora and fauna were not missing. But of all the photographic subject matter, the ocean was the most prolific. Surf, calm and storm in all their infinite variety seemed to be counted upon to make the greatest impression upon the liquid lacking Martians. Not neglected was a sample collection of artistic and handicraft products from different regions. Reproductions of famous paintings, sculptures, memorials and architectural masterpieces, phonograph records of symphonic music, opera and modern music came along with films of plays and extracts from daily life. There were artistic Chinese silks, Belgian embroideries, French jewelry, German optical work, English porcelain. Finally there were important varieties of woods and metals, ceramics and plastics, together with pictures typifying the advancement of arts and sciences including a chemistry set with which simple experiments might be demonstrated. It seemed well for Holt to carry with him under lock and key a folder showing the war potential upon Earth. Atomic explosions, men of war, bombers, space vessels, radar gear, tanks and battle scenes were here depicted in the unhoped for event that the Martian mentality might exhibit inimical inclinations towards the sister planet. But it was the deepest hope of Holt and of all his collaborators that even a discussion of eventual hostilities would never be called for. Chapter 11 The Cosmic Rays One of the training phases for the Great Expedition consisted of a month's course of lectures in the old rocket pilot's school in Kailui. It had the further objective of welding the participants into an integrated unit which should be capable of withstanding the physical and psychological hardships of a three years trip through space. Consequently, it likewise acted as a screening operation, subjecting its members to the most severe type of character test, including absolute sequestration from the outside world. 
three candidates in all actually failed to meet the requirements by mockingly belittling Holt's Spartan regulations. The physical capabilities of the future spacefarers were also tested to the limit under the supervision of a small army of medical and psychological specialists who allowed no defect, whether of body or of personality, to escape. Particular attention was paid to equilibrium and respiration. Even the scientists were made to undergo an exhausting course of athletic exercise to fit them for the great adventure. The lecture course included every possible phase of interstellar hypothesis and knowledge, it being one of Holt's cherished theories that no member of the expedition should ever pose any question which must remain unanswered within the knowledge possessed by the science of the day. Among the relatively unfamiliar subjects was the effect of cosmic radiation upon the human frame. The Lunetta crews were exposed to it but for short periods, since no man ever spent more than 14 days on duty in the artificial satellite, followed by not less than a month deep within the sheltering shell of the atmosphere. There was much discussion as to what would happen on the trip to Mars, when even the favored ones who would descend to the planet would be exposed to cosmic rays for almost a year and a half while the ship keepers who would circle in the Martian orbit would find no shelter from the rays for a full three years. There were those who insisted that members of the expedition would return to Earth, if indeed they returned at all, with severe damage to their organic systems. Even Holt's tougher lads became somewhat affected by the gloomy prognostications of some of the amateurs who made such dire predictions. Well aware though they were of the more obvious dangers of the mission, and as intrepidly prepared as they might be to face them, the idea of possibly returning to their homes with manhood impaired by treacherous, invisible rays, or that their posterity might be endangered by mysterious mutation changes, was depressing to even the least sensitive dot to lay the ghost of such fears and trepidations, Holt turned to the foremost radiation physicist who was no other than Senator Parasi and to whose sympathetic understanding much of the money and facilities available to Operation Mars might be ascribed. Parasi found time to keep up with the study of cosmic radiation, despite his political activity, and was not long in responding favorably to Holt's request that he come to Kilui for a lecture on cosmic rays and their physiological effects, in order that the fears of the spacefarers might authoritatively be allayed.0. We refer, Parasi began his lecture, to tiny particles, moving with enormous velocity from the depths of the cosmos into more proximate space, as cosmic rays. Most of these tiny particles are protons, that is, atomic nuclei of the hydrogen atom. About 0.4% of them, however, represent atomic nuclei of heavier elements of which the heaviest particles hitherto observed possessed a mass 96 times heavier than that of protons, thus corresponding to the weight of the nuclei of molybdenum. When such particles penetrate our atmosphere, they not infrequently collide with its atoms. Such collisions may occur after two fashions, according to whether the penetrating particle is decelerated only by the electrical field of the atomic nucleus, or collides head with the latter. In the first case, only ionization takes place along the paths of the incident particles. Their energy loss by ionization is low. However, the probability is considerable for every oncoming particle to impinge directly upon an atomic nucleus within the uppermost layers of the atmosphere. In this case, a so-called explosion shower is generated, in which protons, neutrons, mesons, electrons, positrons, photons, as well as heavy atomic fragments consisting of nuclei of elements like carbon or nitrogen, are hurled out. The more energetic electrons and photons created in such an explosion shower are of particular interest. Electrons are rigorously slowed down by the fields of atomic nuclei, thereby generating additional radiation quantum or photons. These photons, while traversing the strong electric fields of other atoms, are able to materialize by forming pairs of electrons and positrons which then fly off. If these electrons and positrons enter the fields of further atoms, they are retarded and again create photons. Thus the so-called cascade showers develop. Mesons, which have a mass some 200 times greater than the electronic mass and have one positive or negative charge, 
are but slowly absorbed in the atmosphere and even in the solid crust of the earth. They have been found thousands of feet underwater and even at the bottom of deep mines. Nonetheless, their number decreases rapidly during their travel through the atmosphere due to their inherent instability. Mesons are subject to radioactive decay, after an average lifetime of one millionth of a second, they disintegrate into a common electron and a neutron. Decay and transmutation products thus induced, together with fragments, now have the effect of secondary radiation. The secondary particles are subjected to further collisions which give rise to tertiary radiation, and the chain continues. Thus we, at the bottom of our sea of air, and anywhere within it, are constantly exposed to a continuous hail shower composed of an already much weakened primary radiation, largely very fast protons, plus a whole family of collision products. Among these collision products are secondary protons, electrons, positrons, neutrons, photons, mesons and heavy atomic fragments. Experience has shown that our human organism is very capable of long withstanding this shower of radiation, at any rate insofar as its strength and composition at ground level are concerned. Science is still largely in the dark as to the true origin of primary cosmic radiation. The mean quantitative distribution of primary particles in protons and heavier nuclei seems to reflect quite accurately the quantitative distribution of the chemical elements in the cosmos, as derived from spectroscopic examinations of fixed stars. The latter show hydrogen to predominate to a marked extent. There is, therefore, a tendency to regard cosmic radiation as a product of atomic explosive catastrophes within the universe, although we unfortunately are as yet unable to conceive of the mechanism of such explosions. The energy of the fastest particles hitting the top of our atmosphere has been estimated to be as much as 1000 million million electron volts. Most particles, however, have lower energies, their abundance being inversely proportional to about the square of their energy. The average energy of the incident particles amounts to 10,000 million electron volts. If we consider that the famous splitting of the uranium atom produces only some 200 million electron volts, and that this would be multiplied only by about 1,000 were the mass of the uranium atom wholly to be converted into energy. The origin of the huge energy of some primary particles remains a moot question. It is thought at the present time that there are pulsating magnetic fields in the vastnesses of space, created by cosmic clouds, streams of ions or clusters of fixed stars. The original, slow, energy lacking protons fly through such fields and are accelerated. They move from one field to another with increasing velocity, as in a betatron. But this theory is unable to explain many phenomena and certainly requires further perfecting. For our particular purposes, however, we may well omit further theorizing on the origins of cosmic radiation. Let it suffice that such rays exist and let us examine whether, and if so, how dangerous they may be to the human frame during extended space travel. We are justified in considering primary cosmic radiation particles as well as their secondary and tertiary offspring resulting from collisions with atmospheric particles, as tiny projectiles constantly traversing our bodies. Since the human organism is also constructed of atoms and molecules, collisions occasionally take place between these projectiles and the building blocks of our bodies. Such collisions induce decay and transmutation products as well as fragments, just as did collisions in the atmosphere representing a new family of secondary rays. There's no doubt that the body molecules involved may be damaged in such collisions. On the other hand, the probability of one of these tiny projectiles contacting a body molecule during its passage is but small. The atomic nuclei with their circling electrons of which our body is composed, are separated by such wide spaces that most particles pass through without any contact or disturbance as though through a coarse sieve. In order to visualize this we must remember that the size and interval relationships between the building blocks of our bodies have the same relationship to one another as size and interval relationships between the sun and planets in our solar system. 
thousands of such particles pass through us every minute and we can compute the probabilities of hits over any given period. While our bodies are slowly destroyed in this manner, the process is opposed by what we may call the natural rejuvenation factor of living substance. Experiments with radioactive isotopes as tracers show that, in a cycle of a few years, all the atoms constituting our organism are replaced by new ones. That means that there's not a single atom in us today which was there a few years ago. This not only renews the building blocks of cells which have died in any fashion, but also continuously eliminates the detritus caused by the bombardment of cosmic radiation particles. We can envisage a relatively simple image of the dangers of cosmic radiation in open space if we set up a frequency of occurrence comparison for primary particles plus the secondary and subsequent collision products as occurring in various altitude layers of our atmosphere. For some time, and the figure has been confirmed by measurements in Lunetta, we have known that every square foot of the upper atmosphere receives per minute some 21,500 primary protons and 79 heavy nuclei. These figures give us a measure of the density of cosmic rays in empty space which you and your Mars vessels will traverse. At 60,000 feet, the primary particles have been reduced to 6,400 by collisions with the atoms of the atmosphere. But the collisions have the effect of producing at this height a supplementary stream of radiation consisting of 17,000 secondary protons, 15,000 neutrons and 12,000 mesons. Additionally, every square foot at this altitude is penetrated by 48,000 electrons and positrons, produced by the collisions, per minute. At about 14,000 feet, an altitude exceeded by but a few of our mountains, the number of primary particles is reduced to a very small, not accurately known figure. But there are still some 300 secondary protons, an equal number of neutrons, and about 2,500 mesons. At sea level, these figures are down to 20, 20 and 1,100, respectively. What may we deduce from these figures? The first thing is that the comparison shows indubitably that the total density of radiation at 60,000 feet altitude is much higher than in empty space, the number of particles at 60,000 feet is about 86 times as great as at sea level, while in empty space it is only about 19 times as great. If we choose to consider secondary particles of cosmic radiation to be as dangerous as the faster primary particles, which may not necessarily be quite correct, it is obviously far more dangerous to fly in the atmosphere at 60,000 feet than to remain in empty space for an equal period. In neither case, however, do we need to be much concerned about our health. The natural regenerative processes of our organism are competent to remove the detritus of the cosmic ray bombardment and to provide new atoms as they work their continuous miracle of cell rejuvenation. The problem of the effects of the bombardment upon our posterity is a different and perhaps a more serious matter. In the rapid succession of generations, in the continual disappearance and regeneration of our cellular structure there is a something which is as unalterable as the rock of ages, 